John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London Chapter 1 It all came to me one election day. It was on a warm California afternoon, and I had ridden down into the Valley of the Moon from the ranch to the little village to vote yes and no to a host of proposed amendments to the Constitution of the State of California. Because of the warmth of the day, I had had several drinks before casting my ballot, and diverse drinks after casting it. Then I had ridden up through the vine-clad hills and rolling pastures of the ranch, and arrived at the farmhouse in time for another drink and supper. How did you vote on the suffrage amendment? Charmian asked. I voted for it. She uttered an exclamation of surprise. For, be it known, in my younger days, despite my ardent democracy, I had been opposed to woman suffrage. In my later and more tolerant years, I had been unenthusiastic in my acceptance of it as an inevitable social phenomenon. Now just why did you vote for it? Charmian asked. I answered. I answered at length. I answered indignantly. The more I answered, the more indignant I became. No, I was not drunk. The horse I had ridden was well named the Outlaw. I'd like to see any drunken man ride her. And yet, how shall I say, I was lighted up. I was feeling good. I was pleasantly jingled. When the women get the ballot, they will vote for prohibition, I said. It is the wives and sisters and mothers, and they only, who will drive the nails into the coffin of John Barleycorn. But I thought you were a friend to John Barleycorn, Charmian interpolated. I am, I was, I am not, I never am. I am never less his friend than when he is with me and when I seem most his friend. He is the king of liars, he is the frankest truth-sayer, he is the august companion with whom one walks with the gods. He is also in league with the noseless one. His way leads to truth naked and to death. He gives clear vision and muddy dreams. He is the enemy of life and the teacher of wisdom beyond life's wisdom. He is a red-handed killer, and he slays youth. And Charmian looked at me, and I knew she wondered, where I had got it. I continued to talk. As I say, I was lighted up. In my brain, every thought was at home. Every thought in its little cell crouched, ready dressed at the door, like prisoners at midnight waiting a jailbreak. And every thought was a vision, bright imaged, sharp cut, unmistakable. My brain was illuminated by the clear white light of alcohol. John Barleycorn was on a truth-telling rampage, giving away the choicest secrets on himself, and I was his spokesman. There moved the multitudes of memories of my past life, all orderly arranged, like soldiers in some vast review. It was mine to pick and choose. I was a lord of thought, the master of my vocabulary and of the totality of my experience, unerringly capable of selecting my data and building my exposition. For so John Barleycorn tricks and lures, setting the maggots of intelligence gnawing, whispering his fatal intuitions of truth, 
flinging purple passages into the monotony of one's days. I outlined my life to Charmian, and expounded the make-up of my constitution. I was no hereditary alcoholic. I had been born with no organic chemical predisposition towards alcohol. In this matter, I was normal in my generation. Alcohol was an acquired taste. It had been painfully acquired. Alcohol had been a dreadfully repugnant thing, more nauseous than any physic. Even now, I did not like the taste of it. I drank it only for its kick. And from the age of five to that of twenty-five, I had not learned to care for its kick. Twenty years of unwilling apprenticeship had been required to make my system rebelliously tolerant of alcohol, to make me, in the heart and deeps of me, desirous of alcohol. I sketched my first contacts with alcohol, told of my first intoxications and revulsions, and pointed out always the one thing that in the end had won me over namely the accessibility of alcohol. Not only had it always been accessible, but every interest of my developing life had drawn me to it. A newsboy on the streets, a sailor, a miner, a wanderer in far lands, always where men came together to exchange ideas, to laugh and boast and dare, to relax, to forget the dull toil of tiresome nights and days, always they came together over alcohol. The saloon was the place of congregation. Men gathered to it as primitive men gathered about the fire of the squatting place or the fire at the mouth of the cave. I reminded Charmian of the canoe houses from which she had been barred in the South Pacific, where the kinky-haired cannibals escaped from their womenkind and feasted and drank by themselves, the sacred precincts taboo to women under pain of death. As a youth, by way of the saloon I had escaped from the narrowness of women's influence into the wide free world of men. All ways led to the saloon. The thousand roads of romance and adventure drew together in the saloon, and thence led out and on over the world. The point is, I concluded my sermon, that it is the accessibility of alcohol that has given me my taste for alcohol. I did not care for it. I used to laugh at it. Yet here I am at the last, possessed with the drinker's desire. It took twenty years to implant that desire, and for ten years more that desire has grown and the effect of satisfying that desire is anything but good. Temperamentally, I am wholesome-hearted and merry, yet when I walk with John Barleycorn, I suffer all the damnation of intellectual pessimism. But, I hasten to add, I always hasten to add, John Barleycorn must have his due. He does tell the truth. That is the curse of it. The so-called truths of life are not true. They are the vital lies by which life lives, and John Barleycorn gives them the lie. Which does not make them towards life, Charmian said. Very true, I answered, and that is the perfectest hell of it. 
John Barleycorn makes toward death. That is why I voted for the amendment today. I read back in my life and saw how the accessibility of alcohol had given me the taste for it. You see, comparatively few alcoholics are born in a generation. And by alcoholic, I mean a man whose chemistry craves alcohol and drives him resistlessly to it. The great majority of habitual drinkers are born not only without desire for alcohol, but with actual repugnance toward it. Not the first, nor the twentieth, nor the hundredth drink succeeded in giving them the liking. But they learned, just as men learn to smoke, though it is far easier to learn to smoke than to learn to drink. They learned because alcohol was so accessible. The women knew the game. They pay for it. The wives and sisters and mothers. And when they come to vote, they will vote for prohibition. And the best of it is that there will be no hardship worked on the coming generation. Not having access to alcohol not being predisposed toward alcohol, it will never miss alcohol. It will mean life more abundant for the manhood of the young boys born and growing up, eh, and life more abundant for the young girls born and growing up to share the lives of the young men. Why not write all this up for the sake of the young men and women coming? charmian asked why not write it so as to help the wives and sisters and mothers to the way they should vote the memoirs of an alcoholic i sneered or rather john barleycorn sneered for he sat with me there at table in my pleasant philanthropic jingle and it is a trick of john barleycorn to turn the smile to a sneer without an instant's warning. No, said Charmian, ignoring John Barleycorn's roughness, as so many women have learned to do. You have shown yourself no alcoholic, no dipsomaniac, but merely an habitual drinker, one who has made John Barleycorn's acquaintance through long years of rubbing shoulders with him. Write it up and call it Alcoholic Memoirs. Chapter 2 And, ere I begin, I must ask the reader to walk with me in all sympathy. And since sympathy is merely understanding, begin by understanding me and whom and what I write about. In the first place, I am a seasoned drinker. I have no constitutional predisposition for alcohol. I am not stupid. I am not a swine. I know the drinking game from A to Z and I have used my judgment in drinking. I never have to be put to bed, nor do I stagger. In short, I am a normal average man, and I drink in the normal average way as drinking goes. And this is the very point. I am writing of the effects of alcohol on the normal average man. I have no word to say for or about the microscopically unimportant excessivist, the dipsomaniac. There are, broadly speaking, two types of drinkers. There is the man whom we all know, stupid, unimaginative, whose brain is bitten numbly by numb maggots, who walks generously with widespread, tentative legs, falls frequently in the gutter, 
and who sees, in the extremity of his ecstasy, blue mice and pink elephants. He is the type that gives rise to the jokes in the funny papers. The other type of drinker has imagination, vision. Even when most pleasantly jingled, he walks straight and naturally, never falls or staggers, and knows just where he is and what he is doing. It is not his body, but his brain that is drunken. He may bubble with wit, or expand with good fellowship, or he may see intellectual specters and phantoms that are cosmic and logical, and that take the forms of syllogisms. It is when in this condition that he strips away the husks of life's healthiest illusions and gravely considers the iron collar of necessity welded about the neck of his soul. This is the hour of John Barleycorn's subtlest power. It is easy for any man to roll in the gutter, but it is a terrible ordeal for a man to stand upright on his two legs, unswaying, and decide that in all the universe he finds for himself but one freedom, namely the anticipating of the day of his death. With this man, this is the hour of the white logic, of which more anon. When he knows that he may know only the laws of things, the meaning of things never, this is his danger hour. His feet are taking hold of the pathway that leads down into the grave. All is clear to him. All these baffling head-reachers after immortality are but the panics of souls frightened by the fear of death, and cursed with the thrice-cursed gift of imagination. They have not the instinct for death, they lack the will to die when the time to die is at hand. They trick themselves into believing they will outwit the game and win to a future, leaving the other animals to the darkness of the grave or the annihilating heats of the crematory. But he, this man in the hour of his white logic, knows that they trick and outwit themselves. The one event happeneth to all alike. There is no new thing under the sun, not even that yearned-for bauble of feeble souls, immortality. But he knows, he knows, standing upright on his two legs unswaying. He is compounded of meat and wine and sparkle, of sun mote and world dust a frail mechanism made to run for a span, to be tinkered at by doctors of divinity and doctors of physic, and to be flung into the scrap heap at the end. Of course all this is soul sickness, life sickness. It is the penalty the imaginative man must pay for his friendship with John Barleycorn. The penalty paid by the stupid man is simpler, easier. He drinks himself into sottish unconsciousness. He sleeps a drugged sleep, and if he dream, his dreams are dim and inarticulate. But to the imaginative man, John Barleycorn sends the pitiless spectral syllogisms of the white logic. He looks upon life and all its affairs with the jaundiced eye of a pessimistic German philosopher. He sees through all illusions. He transvalues all values. Good is bad. 
Truth is a cheat, and life is a joke. From his calm, mad heights, with the certitude of a god, he beholds all life as evil. Wife, children, friends, in the clear white light of his logic, they are exposed as frauds and shams. He sees through them, and all that he sees is their frailty, their meagerness, their sordidness, their pitifulness. No longer do they fool him. They are miserable little egotisms like all the other little humans fluttering their mayfly-like dance of an hour. They are without freedom. They are puppets of chance. So is he. He realizes that. But there is one difference. He sees. He knows. And he knows his one freedom. He may anticipate the day of his death. All of which is not good for a man who is made to live and love and be loved. Yet suicide, quick or slow, a sudden spill or a gradual oozing away through the years, is the price John Barleycorn exacts. No friend of his ever escapes making the just due payment. Chapter 3 I was five years old, the first time I got drunk. It was on a hot day, and my father was plowing in the field. I was sent from the house half a mile away to carry to him a pail of beer. And be sure you don't spill it, was the parting injunction. It was, as I remember it, a lard pail, very wide across the top and without a cover. As I toddled along, the beer slopped over the rim upon my legs. And as I toddled, I pondered. Beer was a very precious thing. Come to think of it, must be wonderfully good. Else, why was I never permitted to drink of it in the house? Other things kept from me by the grown-ups I had found good. Then this, too, was good. Trust the grown-ups. They knew. And anyway, the pail was too full. I was slopping it against my legs and spilling it on the ground. Why waste it? And no one would know whether I had drunk or spilled it. I was so small that in order to negotiate the pail, I sat down and gathered it into my lap. First, I sipped the foam. I was disappointed. The preciousness evaded me. Evidently, it did not reside in the foam. Besides, the taste was not good. Then I remembered seeing the grown-ups blow the foam away before they drank. I buried my face in the foam and lapped the solid liquid beneath. It wasn't good at all, but still I drank. The grown-ups knew what they were about. Considering my diminutiveness, the size of the pail in my lap, and my drinking out of it with my breath held, and my face buried to the ears in foam, it was rather difficult to estimate how much I drank. Also, I was gulping it down like medicine, in nauseous haste to get the ordeal over. I shuddered when I started on, and decided that the good taste would come afterwards. I tried several times more in the course of that long half-mile. Then, astounded by the quantity of beer that was lacking, and remembering having seen stale beer made to foam afresh, I took a stick and stirred what was left till it foamed to the brim. 
and my father never noticed. He emptied the pail with the wide thirst of the sweating plowman, returned it to me, and started up the plow. I endeavored to walk behind the horses. I remember tottering and falling against their heels in front of the shining share, and that my father hauled back on the lines so violently that the horses nearly sat down on me. He told me afterward that it was by only a matter of inches that I escaped disemboweling. Vaguely, too, I remember, my father carried me in his arms to the trees on the edge of the field while all the world reeled and swung about me, and I was aware of deadly nausea mingled with an appalling conviction of sin. I slept the afternoon away under the trees, and when my father roused me at sundown, it was a very sick little boy that got up and dragged wearily homeward. I was exhausted, oppressed by the weight of my limbs, and in my stomach was a harp-like vibrating that extended to my throat and brain. My condition was like that of one who had gone through a battle with poison. In truth, I had been poisoned. In the weeks and months that followed, I had no more interest in beer than in the kitchen stove after it had burned me. The grown-ups were right. Beer was not for children. The grown-ups didn't mind it, but neither did they mind taking pills and castor oil. As for me, I could manage to get along quite well without beer. Yes, and to the day of my death, I could have managed to get along quite well without it. But circumstances decreed otherwise. At every turn in the world in which I lived, John Barleycorn beckoned. There was no escaping him. All paths led to him. And it took twenty years of contact, of exchanging greetings and passing on with my tongue and my cheek, to develop in me a sneaking liking for the rascal. End of chapter three. Chapter Four My next bout with John Barleycorn occurred when I was seven. This time my imagination was at fault, and I was frightened into the encounter. Still farming, my family had moved to a ranch on the bleak, sad coast of San Mateo County, south of San Francisco. It was a wild, primitive countryside in those days, and often I heard my mother pride herself that we were old American stock and not immigrant Irish and Italians like our neighbors. In all our section there was only one other old American family. One Sunday morning found me how or why I cannot now remember, at the Morrissey Ranch. A number of young people had gathered there from the nearer ranches. Besides, the oldsters had been there drinking since early dawn, and some of them since the night before. The Morrisseys were a huge breed, and there were many strapping great sons and uncles, heavy-booted, big-fisted, rough-voiced. Suddenly there were screams from the girls and cries of, Fight! There was a rush. Men hurled themselves out of the kitchen. Two giants, flush-faced, with graying hair, were locked in each other's arms. One was Black Matt, 
who everybody said had killed two men in his time. The women screamed softly, crossed themselves, or prayed brokenly, hiding their eyes and peeping through their fingers. But not I. It is a fair presumption that I was the most interested spectator. Maybe I would see that wonderful thing, a man killed. Anyway, I would see a man fight. Great was my disappointment. Black Matt and Tom Morrissey merely held on to each other and lifted their clumsy booted feet in what seemed a grotesque elephantine dance. They were too drunk to fight. Then the peacemakers got hold of them and led them back to cement the new friendship in the kitchen. Soon they were all talking at once, rumbling and roaring as big-chested open-air men will, when whiskey has whipped their taciturnity. And I, a little shaver of seven, my heart in my mouth, my trembling body, strung tense as a deer's on the verge of flight, peered wonderingly in at the open door and learned more of the strangeness of men. And I marveled at Black Matt and Tom Morrissey sprawled over the table, arms about each other's necks, weeping lovingly. The kitchen drinking continued, and the girls outside grew timorous. They knew the drink game, and all were certain that something terrible was going to happen. They protested that they did not wish to be there when it happened, and someone suggested going to a big Italian rancho four miles away, where they could get up a dance. Immediately they paired off, lad and lassie, and started down the sandy road. And each lad walked with his sweetheart. Trust a child of seven to listen and to know the love affairs of his countryside. And behold, I too was a lad with a lassie. A little Irish girl of my own age had been paired off with me. We were the only children in this spontaneous affair. Perhaps the oldest couple might have been twenty. There were chits of girls, quite grown up, of fourteen and sixteen, walking with their fellows. But we were uniquely young, this little Irish girl and I, and we walked hand in hand, and sometimes under the tutelage of our elders with my arm around her waist. Only that wasn't comfortable, and I was very proud on that bright Sunday morning going down the long bleak road among the sand hills, I too had my girl and was a little man. The Italian rancho was a bachelor establishment. Our visit was hailed with delight. The red wine was poured in tumblers for all, and the long dining room was partly cleared for dancing. And the young fellows drank and danced with the girls to the strains of an accordion. To me, that music was divine. I had never heard anything so glorious. The young Italian who furnished it would even get up and dance, his arms round his girl, playing the accordion behind her back, all of which was very wonderful for me who did not dance, but who sat at a table and gazed wide-eyed at the amazingness of life. I was only a little lad, and there was so much of life for me to learn. As the time passed, the Irish lads began helping themselves to the wine, and jollity and high spirits reigned. I noted that some of them staggered and fell down in the dances, 
and that one had gone to sleep in a corner. Also, some of the girls were complaining, and wanting to leave, and others of the girls were utteringly complacent, willing for anything to happen. When our Italian host had offered me wine in a general sort of way, I had declined. My beer experience had been enough for me, and I had no inclination to traffic further in the stuff or in anything related to it. Unfortunately, one young Italian, Peter, an impish soul, seeing me sitting solitary, stirred by a whim of the moment, half filled a tumbler with wine and passed it to me. He was sitting across the table from me. I declined. His face grew stern, and he insistently proffered the wine. And then terror descended upon me, a terror which I must explain. My mother had theories. First, she steadfastly maintained that brunettes and all the tribe of dark-eyed humans were deceitful. Needless to say, my mother was a blonde. Next, she was convinced that the dark-eyed Latin races were profoundly murderous. Again and again, drinking in the strangeness and the fearsomeness of the world from her lips, I had heard her state, that if one offended an Italian, no matter how slightly and unintentionally, he was certain to retaliate by stabbing one in the back. That was her particular phrase, stab you in the back. Now, although I had been eager to see Black Matt kill Tom Morrissey that morning, I did not care to furnish to the dancers the spectacle of a knife sticking in my back. I had not yet learned to distinguish between facts and theories. My faith was implicit in my mother's exposition of the Italian character. Besides, I had some glimmering inkling of the sacredness of hospitality. Here was a treacherous, sensitive, murderous Italian offering me hospitality. I had been taught to believe that if I offended him, he would strike at me with a knife precisely as a horse kicked out when one got too close to its heels and worried it. Then, too, this Italian, Peter, had those terrible black eyes I had heard my mother talk about. They were eyes different from the eyes I knew, from the blues and grays and hazels of my own family, from the pale and genial blues of the Irish. Perhaps Peter had had a few drinks. At any rate, his eyes were brilliantly black and sparkling with devilry. They were the mysterious, the unknown, and who was I, a seven-year-old, to analyze them and know their prankishness? In them I visioned sudden death, and I declined the wine half-heartedly. The expression in his eyes changed. They grew stern and imperious, as he shoved the tumbler of wine closer. What could I do? I have faced real death since in my life, but never have I known the fear of death as I knew it then. I put the glass to my lips, and Peter's eyes relented. I knew he would not kill me just then. That was a relief but the wine was not. It was cheap, new wine, bitter and sour, made of the leavings and scrapings of the vineyards and the vats, and it tasted far worse than beer. There is only one way to take medicine, and that is to take it. 
and that's the way I took that wine. I threw my head back and gulped it down. I had to gulp again and hold the poison down, for poison it was to any child's tissues and membranes. Looking back now, I can realize that Peter was astounded. He half filled a second tumbler and shoved it across the table. Frozen with fear, in despair at the fate which had befallen me, I gulped the second glass down like the first. This was too much for Peter. He must share the infant prodigy he had discovered. He called Dominic, a young, moustached Italian, to see the light. This time it was a full tumbler that was given me. One will do anything to live. I gripped myself, mastered the qualms that rose in my throat, and downed the stuff. Dominic had never seen an infant of such heroic caliber. Twice again he refilled that tumbler, each time to the brim, and watched it disappear down my throat. By this time my exploits were attracting attention. Middle-aged Italian laborers, old country peasants who did not talk English and who could not dance with the Irish girls, surrounded me. They were swarthy and wild-looking. They wore belts and red shirts, and I knew they carried knives, and they ringed me round like a pirate chorus, and Peter and Dominic made me show off for them. Had I lacked imagination, had I been stupid, had I been stubbornly mulish in having my own way, I should never have got in this pickle. And the lads and lassies were dancing, and there was no one to save me from my fate. How much I drank, I do not know. My memory of it is an age-long suffering of fear in the midst of a murderous crew, and of an infinite number of glasses of red wine passing across the bare boards of a wine-drenched table and going down my burning throat. Bad as the wine was, a knife in the back was worse, and I must survive at any cost. Looking back with the drinker's knowledge, I know now why I did not collapse stupefied upon the table. As I have said, I was frozen, I was paralyzed with fear. The only movement I made was to convey that never-ending procession of glasses to my lips. I was a poised and motionless respectable for all the quantity of wine. It lay inert in my fear-inert stomach. I was too frightened even for my stomach to turn. So all that Italian crew looked on and marveled at the infant phenomenon that downed wine with the sang-froid of an automaton. It is not in the spirit of braggadocio that I dare to assert they had never seen anything like it. The time came to go. The tipsy antics of the lads had led a majority of the sober-minded lassies to compel a departure. I found myself at the door beside my little maiden. She had not had my experience so she was sober. She was fascinated by the titubations of the lads who strove to walk beside their girls, and began to mimic them. I thought this a great game, and I, too, began to stagger tipsily. But she had no wine to stir up, while my movements quickly set the fumes rising to my head. Even at the start, I was more realistic than she. In several minutes, I was astonishing myself. I saw one lad, after reeling half a dozen steps, 
pause at the side of the road, gravely peer into the ditch, and gravely, and after apparent deep thought, fall into it. To me this was excruciatingly funny. I staggered to the edge of the ditch, fully intending to stop on the edge. I came to myself in the ditch, in process of being hauled out by several anxious-faced girls. I didn't care to play at being drunk any more. There was no more fun in me. My eyes were beginning to swim, and with wide open mouth I panted for air. A girl led me by the hand on either side, but my legs were leaden. The alcohol I had drunk was striking my heart and brain like a club. Had I been a weakling of a child, I am confident that it would have killed me. As it was, I know I was nearer death than any of the scared girls dreamed. I could hear them bickering among themselves as to whose fault it was. Some were weeping for themselves, for me, and for the disgraceful way their lads had behaved. But I was not interested. I was suffocating, and I wanted air. To move was agony. It made me pant harder. Yet those girls persisted in making me walk, and it was four miles home. Four miles! I remember my swimming eyes saw a small bridge across the road an infinite distance away. In fact, it was not a hundred feet distant. When I reached it, I sank down and lay on my back panting. The girls tried to lift me, but I was helpless and suffocating. Their cries of alarm brought Larry, a drunken youth of seventeen, who proceeded to resuscitate me by jumping on my chest. Dimly I remember this, and the squalling of the girls as they struggled with him and dragged him away. And then I knew nothing, though I learned afterward that Larry wound up under the bridge and spent the night there. When I came to, it was dark. I had been carried unconscious for four miles and had been put to bed. I was a sick child, and despite the terrible strain on my heart and tissues, I continually relapsed into the madness of delirium. All the contents of the terrible and horrible in my child's mind spilled out. The most frightful visions were realities to me. I saw murders committed, and I was pursued by murderers. I screamed and raved and fought. My sufferings were prodigious. Emerging from such delirium, I would hear my mother's voice, but the child's brain, he will lose his reason. And sinking back into delirium, I would take the idea with me and be immured in madhouses and be beaten by keepers and surrounded by screeching lunatics. One thing that had strongly impressed my young mind was the talk of my elders about the dens of iniquity in San Francisco's Chinatown. In my delirium, I wandered deep beneath the ground through a thousand of these dens, and behind locked doors of iron I suffered and died a thousand deaths. And when I would come upon my father, seated at a table in these subterranean crypts, gambling with Chinese for great stakes of gold, all my outrage gave vent in the vilest cursing. I would rise in bed, struggling against the detaining hands, and curse my father till the rafters rang. All the inconceivable filth 
a child running at large in a primitive countryside may hear men utter was mine and though i had never dared to utter such thoughts they now poured from me at the top of my lungs as i cursed my father sitting there underground and gambling with long-haired long-nailed chinamen it is a wonder that i did not burst my heart or brain that night a seven-year-old child's arteries and nerve centers are scarcely fitted to endure the terrific paroxysms that convulsed me no one slept in the thin frame farmhouse that night when john barleycorn had his will of me and larry under the bridge had no delirium like mine i am confident that his sleep was stupefied and dreamless and that he awoke next day merely to heaviness and moroseness and that if he lives to-day he does not remember that night so passing was it as an incident but my brain was seared for ever by that experience writing now thirty years afterward every vision is as distinct as sharp cut every pain as vital and terrible as on that night i was sick for days afterwards and i needed none of my mother's injunctions to avoid john barleycorn in the future my mother had been dreadfully shocked she held that i had done wrong very wrong and that i had gone contrary to all her teaching and how was i who was never allowed to talk back who lacked the very words with which to express my psychology how was i to tell my mother that it was her teaching that was directly responsible for my drunkenness had it not been for her theories about dark eyes and italian character i should never have wet my lips with the sour bitter wine and not until man grown did i tell her the true inwardness of that disgraceful affair in those after days of sickness i was confused on some points and very clear on others i felt guilty of sin yet smarted with a sense of injustice it had not been my fault yet i had done wrong but very clear was my resolution never to touch liquor again no mad dog was ever more afraid of water than i was of alcohol yet the point i am making is that this experience terrible as it was could not in the end deter me from forming john barleycorn's cheek by jowl acquaintance all about me even then were the forces moving me toward him in the first place barring my mother ever extreme in her views it seemed to me all the grown-ups looked upon the affair with tolerant eyes it was a joke something funny that had happened there was no shame attached even the lads and lassies giggled and snickered over their part in the affair narrating with gusto how larry had jumped on my chest and slept under the bridge how so-and-so had slept out in the sand hills that night and what had happened to the other lad who fell in the ditch as i say so far as i could see there was no shame anywhere it had been something ticklishly devilishly fine a bright and gorgeous episode in the monotony of life and labor on that bleak fog-girt coast 
the irish ranchers twitted me good-naturedly on my exploit and patted me on the back until i felt that i had done something heroic peter and dominic and the other italians were proud of my drinking prowess the face of morality was not set against drinking besides everybody drank there was not a teetotaler in the community even the teacher of our little country school a graying man of fifty gave us vacations on the occasions when he wrestled with john barleycorn and was thrown thus there was no spiritual deterrence my loathing for alcohol was purely physiologically i didn't like the damn stuff end of chapter four chapter five this physical loathing for alcohol i have never got over but i have conquered it to this day i conquer it every time i take a drink the palate never ceases to rebel, and the palate can be trusted to know what is good for the body. But men do not drink for the effect alcohol produces on the body. What they drink for is the brain effect. And if it must come through the body, so much the worse for the body. And yet, despite my physical loathing for alcohol, the brightest spots in my child life were the saloons. Sitting on the heavy potato wagons, wrapped in fog, feet stinging from inactivity, the horses plodding slowly along the deep road through the sand hills, one bright vision made the way never too long. The bright vision was the saloon at Colma, where my father, or whoever drove, always got out to get a drink and i got out to warm by the great stove and get a soda cracker just one soda cracker but a fabulous luxury saloons were good for something back behind the plodding horses i would take an hour in consuming that one cracker i took the smallest nibbles never losing a crumb and chewed the nibble till it became the thinnest and most delectable of pastes i never voluntarily swallowed this paste i just tasted it and went on tasting it turning it over with my tongue spreading it on the inside of this cheek then on the inside of the other cheek until at the end it eluded me and in tiny drops and oozlets slipped and dribbled down my throat horace fletcher had nothing on me when it came to soda crackers i liked saloons especially i liked the san francisco saloons they had the most delicious dainties for the taking strange breads and crackers cheeses sausages sardines wonderful foods that i never saw on our meagre home table and once i remember a barkeeper mixed me a sweet temperance drink of syrup and soda water my father did not pay for it it was the barkeeper's treat and he became my ideal of a good kind man I dreamed daydreams of him for years. Although I was seven years old at the time, I can see him now with undiminished clearness, though I never laid eyes on him but that one time. The saloon was south of Market Street in San Francisco. It stood on the west side of the street. As you entered, the bar was on the left. On the right, against the wall, was the free lunch counter. It was a long, narrow room, and at the rear, beyond the beer kegs on tap, were small round tables and chairs. 
the barkeeper was blue-eyed and had fair silky hair peeping out from under a black silk skull-cap i remember he wore a brown cardigan jacket and i know precisely the spot in the midst of the array of bottles from which he took the bottle of red-colored syrup he and my father talked long and i sipped my sweet drink and worshipped him and for years afterward i worshipped the memory of him despite my two disastrous experiences here was john barleycorn prevalent and accessible everywhere in the community luring and drawing me here were connotations of the saloon making deep indentations in a child's mind here was a child forming its first judgments of the world finding the saloon a delightful and desirable place stores nor public buildings nor all the dwellings of men ever opened their doors to me and let me warm by their fires or permitted me to eat the food of the gods from narrow shelves against the wall their doors were ever closed to me the saloon's doors were ever open and always and everywhere i found saloons on highway and byway up narrow alleys and on busy thoroughfares bright lighted and cheerful warm in winter and in summer dark and cool yes the saloon was a mighty fine place and it was more than that by the time i was ten years old my family had abandoned ranching and gone to live in the city and here at ten i began on the streets as a newsboy one of the reasons for this was that we needed the money another reason was that i needed the exercise i had found my way to the free public library and was reading myself into nervous prostration on the poor ranches on which i had lived there had been no books in ways truly miraculous i had been lent four books marvelous books and them i had devoured one was the life of garfield the second paul de chaloux's african travels the third a novel by Ouida, with the last forty pages missing and the fourth irving's alhambra this last had been lent me by a schoolteacher i was not a forward child unlike oliver twist i was incapable of asking for more when i returned the alhambra to the teacher i hoped she would lend me another book and because she did not most likely she deemed me unappreciative i cried all the way home on the three-mile tramp from the school to the ranch i waited and yearned for her to lend me another book scores of times i nerved myself almost to the point of asking her but never quite reached the necessary pitch of effrontery and then came the city of oakland and on the shelves of that free library i discovered all the great world beyond the skyline here were thousands of books as good as my four wonder books and some were even better libraries were not concerned with children in those days and i had strange adventures i remember in the catalogue being impressed by the title the adventures of peregrine pickle i filed an application blank and the librarian handed me the collected and entirely unexpurgated works of smollett in one huge volume i read everything but principally history and adventure and all the old travels and voyages i read mornings afternoons and nights i read in bed i read at table i read as i walked to and from school and i read at recess 
while the other boys were playing. I began to get the jerks. To everybody I replied, Go away, you make me nervous. And so, at ten, I was out on the streets, a newsboy. I had no time to read. I was busy getting exercise and learning how to fight, busy learning forwardness and brass and bluff. I had an imagination and a curiosity about all things that made me plastic. Not least among the things I was curious about was the saloon, and I was in and out of many a one. I remember in those days on the east side of Broadway, between 6th and 7th, from corner to corner, there was a solid block of saloons. In the saloons, life was different. Men talked with great voices, laughed great laughs, and there was an atmosphere of greatness. Here was something more than common every day where nothing happened. Here life was always very live, and sometimes even lurid, when blows were struck, and blood was shed, and big policemen came shouldering in. Great moments there for me, my head filled with all the wild and valiant fighting of the gallant adventurers on sea and land. There were no big moments when I trudged along the street throwing my papers in at doors. But in the saloons, even the sots, stupefied, sprawling across the tables or in the sawdust, were objects of mystery and wonder. And more, the saloons were right. The city fathers sanctioned them and licensed them. They were not the terrible places I heard boys deem them who lacked my opportunities to know. Terrible they might be, but then that only meant they were terribly wonderful, and it is the terribly wonderful that a boy desires to know. In the same way pirates and shipwrecks and battles were terrible, and what healthy boy wouldn't give his immortal soul to participate in such affairs? Besides, in saloons I saw reporters, editors, lawyers, judges, whose names and faces I knew. They put the seal of social approval on the saloon. They verified my own feeling of fascination in the saloon. They, too, must have found there that something different, that something beyond, which I sensed and groped after. What it was, I did not know. Yet there it must be, for there men focused like buzzing flies about a honeypot. I had no sorrows, and the world was very bright, so I could not guess that what these men sought was forgetfulness of jaded toil and stale grief. Not that I drank at that time. From ten to fifteen I rarely tasted liquor, but I was intimately in contact with drinkers and drinking places. The only reason I did not drink was because I didn't like the stuff. As the time passed, I worked as boy helper on an ice wagon, set up pins in a bowling alley with a saloon attached, and swept out saloons at Sunday picnic grounds. Big, jovial Josie Harper ran a roadhouse at Telegraph Avenue and 39th Street. Here for a year I delivered an evening paper, until my route was changed to the waterfront and tenderloin of Oakland. The first month when I collected Josie Harper's bill, she poured me a glass of wine. I was ashamed to refuse, so I drank it. But after that I watched the chance when she wasn't around so as to collect from her barkeeper. 
The first day I worked in the bowling alley, the barkeeper, according to custom, called us boys up to have a drink after we had been setting up pins for several hours. The others asked for beer. I said I'd take ginger ale. The boys snickered and I noticed the barkeeper favored me with a strange, searching scrutiny. Nevertheless, he opened a bottle of ginger ale. Afterward, back in the alleys, in the pauses between games, the boys enlightened me. I had offended the barkeeper. A bottle of ginger ale cost the saloon ever so much more than a glass of steam beer and it was up to me, if I wanted to hold my job, to drink beer. Besides, beer was food. I could work better on it. There was no food in ginger ale. After that, when I couldn't sneak out of it, I drank beer and wondered what men found in it that was so good. I was always aware that I was missing something. What I really liked in those days was candy. For five cents, I could buy five cannonballs, big lumps of the most delicious lastingness. I could chew and worry a single one for an hour. Then there was a Mexican who sold big slabs of brown chewing taffy for five cents each. It required a quarter of a day properly to absorb one of them. And many a day I made my entire lunch off one of those slabs. In truth, I found food there, but not in beer. Chapter 6 But the time was rapidly drawing near when I was to begin my second series of bouts with John Barleycorn. When I was fourteen, my head filled with the tales of the old voyagers, my mind with tropical isles and far sea rims, I was sailing a small centerboard skiff around San Francisco Bay and on the Oakland estuary. I wanted to go to sea. I wanted to get away from monotony and the commonplace. I was in the flower of my adolescence, a thrill with romance and adventure, dreaming of wild life in the wild man world. Little I guessed how all the warp and woof of that man world was entangled with alcohol. So one day, as I hoisted sail on my skiff, I met Scotty. He was a husky youngster of seventeen, a runaway apprentice, he told me, from an English ship in Australia. He had just worked his way on another ship to San Francisco, and now he wanted to see about getting a berth on a whaler. Across the estuary, near where the whalers lay, was lying the sloop yacht Idler. The caretaker was a harpooner who intended sailing next voyage on the whale ship Bonanza. Would I take him, Scotty, over in my skiff to call upon the harpooner? Would I? Hadn't I heard the stories and rumors about the idler? The big sloop that had come up from the Sandwich Islands where it had been engaged in smuggling opium. And the harpooner who was caretaker. How often had I seen him and envied him his freedom. He never had to leave the water. He slept aboard the idler each night while I had to go home upon the land to go to bed. The harpooner was only nineteen years old, and I have never had anything but his own word that he was a harpooner, but he had been too shining and glorious a personality for me ever to address as I paddled around the yacht at a wistful distance. 
would I take Scotty, the runaway sailor, to visit the harpooner on the opium smuggler idler? Would I? The harpooner came on deck to answer our hail, and invited us aboard. I played the sailor and the man, fending off the skiff so that it would not mar the yacht's white paint, dropping the skiff astern on a long painter, and making the painter fast with two nonchalant half-hitches. We went below. It was the first sea interior I had ever seen. The clothing on the wall smelled musty, but what of that? Was it not the sea gear of men? Leather jackets lined with corduroy, blue coats of pilot cloth, sou'westers, sea boots, oilskins. And everywhere was in evidence the economy of space, the narrow bunks, the swinging tables, the incredible lockers. There were the tell-tale compass, the sea lamps in their gimbals, the blue-back charts carelessly rolled and tucked away, the signal flags in alphabetical order, and a mariner's dividers jammed into the woodwork to hold a calendar. At last I was living. Here I sat, inside my first ship, a smuggler, accepted as a comrade by a harpooner and a runaway English sailor who said his name was Scotty. The first thing that the harpooner, aged nineteen, and the sailor, aged seventeen, did to show that they were men was to behave like men. The harpooner suggested the eminent desirableness of a drink, and Scotty searched his pockets for dimes and nickels. Then the harpooner carried away a pink flask to be filled in some blind pig, for there were no licensed saloons in that locality. We drank the cheap rot gut out of tumblers. Was I any the less strong, any the less valiant than the harpooner and the sailor? They were men. They proved it by the way they drank. Drink was the badge of manhood. So I drank with them, drink by drink, raw and straight, though the damned stuff couldn't compare with a stick of chewing taffy or a delectable cannonball. I shuddered and swallowed my gorge with every drink, though I manfully hid all such symptoms. Divers times we filled the flask that afternoon. All I had was twenty cents, but I put it up like a man, though with secret regret at the enormous store of candy it could have bought. The liquor mounted in the heads of all of us, and the talk of Scotty and the harpooner was upon running the easting down, gales off the horn and pamperos off the plat, lower topsail breezes, southerly busters, north pacific gales, and of smashed whaleboats in the arctic ice. You can't swim in that ice water, said the harpooner confidentially to me. You double up in a minute and go down. When a whale smashes your boat, the thing to do is to get your belly across an oar so that when the cold doubles you, you'll float. Sure, I said, with a grateful nod and an air of certitude that I, too, would hunt whales and be in smashed boats in the Arctic Ocean. And truly, I registered his advice as singularly valuable information and filed it away in my brain where it persists to this day. 
but I couldn't talk at first. Heavens! I was only fourteen, and had never been on the ocean in my life. I could only listen to the two sea-dogs and show my manhood by drinking with them, fairly and squarely, drink and drink. The liquor worked its will with me. The talk of Scotty and the harpooner poured through the pent space of the idler's cabin and through my brain with great gusts of wide free wind and in imagination i lived my years to come and rocked over the wild mad glorious world on multitudinous adventures we unbent our inhibitions and taciturnities vanished we were as if we had known each other for years and years and we pledged ourselves to years of future voyagings together. The harpooner told of misadventures and secret shames. Scotty wept over his poor old mother in Edinburgh, a lady, he insisted, gently born, who was in reduced circumstances, who had pinched herself to pay the lump sum to the shipowners for his apprenticeship, whose sacrificing dream had been to see him a merchantman officer and a gentleman, and who was heartbroken because he had deserted his ship in Australia and joined another as a common sailor before the mast. And Scotty proved it. He drew her last sad letter from his pocket and wept over it as he read it aloud. The harpooner and I wept with him and swore that all three of us would ship on the whale ship Bonanza, win a big payday and still together make a pilgrimage to Edinburgh and lay our store of money in the dear lady's lap. And, as John Barleycorn heated his way into my brain, thawing my reticence, melting my modesty, talking through me and with me and as me, my adopted twin brother and alter ego, I, too, raised my voice to show myself a man and an adventurer, and bragged in detail and at length of how I had crossed San Francisco Bay in my open skiff in a roaring sou'wester, even when the schooner sailors doubted my exploit. Further, I or Jorn Barleycorn, for it was the same thing, told Scotty that he might be a deep-sea sailor and know the last rope on the great deep-sea ships, but that when it came to small-boat sailing, I could beat him hands down and sail circles around him. The best of it was that my assertion and brag were true. With reticence and modesty present, I could never have dared tell Scotty my small boat estimate of him. But it is ever the way of John Barleycorn to loosen the tongue and babble the secret thought. Scotty, or John Barleycorn, or the pair, was very naturally offended by my remarks. Nor was I loath. I could whip any runaway sailor seventeen years old. Scotty and I flared and raged like young cockerels, until the harpooner poured another round of drinks to enable us to forgive and make up, which we did, arms around each other's necks, protesting vows of eternal friendship, 
just like Black Matt and Tom Morrissey, I remembered, in the ranch kitchen in San Mateo. And remembering, I knew that I was at last a man, despite my meager fourteen years, a man as big and manly as those two strapping giants who had quarreled and made up on that memorable Sunday morning of long ago. By this time, the singing stage was reached, and I joined Scotty and the harpooner in snatches of sea songs and shanties. It was here in the cabin of the idler that I first heard Blow the Man Down, Flying Cloud, and Whiskey Johnny Whiskey. Oh, it was brave. I was beginning to grasp the meaning of life. Here was no commonplace, no Oakland estuary, no weary round of throwing newspapers at front doors, delivering ice, and setting up ninepins. All the world was mine, all its paths were under my feet, and John Barleycorn, tricking my fancy, enabled me to anticipate the life of adventure for which I yearned. We were not ordinary. We were three tipsy young gods, incredibly wise, gloriously genial, and without limit to our powers. Ah, and I say it now after the years, could John Barleycorn keep one at such a height, I should never draw a sober breath again. But this is not a world of free freights. One pays according to an iron schedule. For every strength, the balanced weakness. For every high, a corresponding low. For every fictitious godlike moment, an equivalent time in reptilian slime. For every feat of telescoping long days and weeks of life into mad, magnificent instance, one must pay with shortened life and oft times with savage usury added. Intenseness and duration are as ancient enemies as fire and water. They are mutually destructive. They cannot coexist. And John Barleycorn, mighty necromancer though he be, is as much a slave to organic chemistry as we mortals are. We pay for every nerve marathon we run. Nor can John Barleycorn intercede and fend off the just payment. He can lead us to the heights, but he cannot keep us there, else would we all be devotees. And there is no devotee but pays for the mad dances John Barleycorn pipes. Yet the foregoing is all in after wisdom spoken. It was no part of the knowledge of the lad, fourteen years old, who sat in the idler's cabin between the harpooner and the sailor, the air rich in his nostrils with the musty smell of men's sea gear, roaring in chorus, Yankee ship come down de river, pull, my bully boys, pull. We grew maudlin, and all talked and shouted at once. I had a splendid constitution, a stomach that would digest scrap iron, and I was still running my marathon in full vigor when Scotty began to fail and fade. His talk grew incoherent. He groped for words and could not find them while the ones he found his lips were unable to form. 
his poisoned consciousness was leaving him the brightness went out of his eyes and he looked as stupid as were his efforts to talk his face and body sagged as his consciousness sagged a man cannot sit upright save by an act of will scotty's reeling brain could not control his muscles and his correlations were breaking down he strove to take another drink and feebly dropped the tumbler on the floor then to my amazement weeping bitterly he rolled into a bunk on his back and immediately snored off to sleep the harpooner and i drank on grinning in a superior way to each other over scotty's plight the last flask was opened and we drank it between us to the accompaniment of scotty's stertorous breathing then the harpooner faded away into his bunk and i was left alone unthrown on the field of battle i was very proud and john barleycorn was proud with me i could carry my drink i was a man i had drunk two men drink for drink into unconsciousness and i was still on my two feet upright making my way on deck to get air into my scorching lungs it was in this bout on the idler that i discovered what a good stomach and a strong head i had for drink a bit of knowledge that was to be a source of pride in succeeding years and that ultimately i was to come to consider a great affliction the fortunate man is the one who cannot take more than a couple of drinks without becoming intoxicated the unfortunate white is the one who can take many glasses without betraying a sign who must take numerous glasses in order to get the kick the sun was setting when i came on the idler's deck there were plenty of bunks below i did not need to go home but i wanted to demonstrate to myself how much i was a man there lay my skiff astern the last of a strong ebb was running out in channel in the teeth of an ocean breeze of forty miles an hour i could see the stiff white caps and the suck and run of the current was plainly visible in the face and trough of each one i set sail cast off took my place at the tiller the sheet in my hand and headed across channel the skiff heeled over and plunged into it madly the spray began to fly i was at the pinnacle of exultation i sang blow the man down as i sailed i was no boy of fourteen living the mediocre ways of the sleepy town called oakland i was a man a god and the very elements rendered me allegiance as i bidded them to my will the tide was out a full hundred yards of soft mud intervened between the boat wharf and the water i pulled up my centerboard ran full tilt into the mud took in sail and standing in the stern as i had often done at low tide i began to shove the skiff with an oar it was then that my correlations began to break down i lost my balance and pitched head foremost into the ooze then and for the first time as i floundered to my feet covered with slime the blood running down my arms from a scrape against a barnacled stake 
I knew that I was drunk. But what of it? Across the channel, two strong sailor men lay unconscious in their bunks where I had drunk them. I was a man. I was still in my legs if they were knee-deep in mud. I disdained to get back into the skiff. I waded through the mud, shoving the skiff before me and yammering the chant of my manhood to the world. I paid for it. I was sick for a couple of days, meanly sick, and my arms were painfully poisoned from the barnacle scratches. For a week I could not use them, and it was a torture to put on and take off my clothes. I swore, never again. The game wasn't worth it. The price was too stiff. I had no moral qualms. My revulsion was purely physical. No exalted moments were worth such hours of misery and wretchedness. When I got back to my skiff, I shunned the idler. I would cross the opposite side of the channel to go around her. Scotty had disappeared. The harpooner was still about, but him I avoided. Once, when he landed on the boat wharf, I hid in a shed so as to escape seeing him. I was afraid he would propose some more drinking, maybe have a flask full of whiskey in his pocket. And yet, and here enters the necromancy of John Barleycorn, that afternoon's drunk on the idler had been a purple passage flung into the monotony of my days. It was memorable. My mind dwelt on it continually. I went over the details, over and over again. Among other things, I had got into the cogs and springs of men's actions. I had seen Scotty weep about his own worthlessness and the sad case of his Edinburgh mother, who was a lady. The harpooner had told me terribly wonderful things of himself. I had caught a myriad enticing and inflammatory hints of a world beyond my world, and for which I was certainly as fitted as the two lads who had drunk with me. I had got behind men's souls. I had got behind my own soul and found unguessed potencies and greatnesses. Yes, that day stood out above all my other days. To this day it so stands out. The memory of it is branded in my brain. But the price exacted was too high. I refused to play and pay and return to my cannonballs and taffy slabs. The point is that all the chemistry of my healthy, normal body drove me away from alcohol. The stuff didn't agree with me. It was abominable. But despite this, circumstance was to continue to drive me toward John Barleycorn to drive me again and again until, after long years, the time should come when I would look upon John Barleycorn in every haunt of men, look him up and hail him gladly as benefactor and friend, and detest and hate him all the time. Yes, he is a strange friend, John Barleycorn. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 
I was barely turned fifteen and working long hours in a cannery. Month in and month out, the shortest day I ever worked was ten hours. When to ten hours of actual work at a machine is added the noon hour, the walking to work and walking home from work, the getting up in the morning, dressing and eating, the eating at night, undressing and going to bed, there remains no more than the nine hours out of the twenty-four required by a healthy youngster for sleep. Out of those nine hours, after I was in bed and ere my eyes drowsed shut, I managed to steal a little time for reading. But many a night I did not knock off work until midnight. On occasion, I worked eighteen and twenty hours on a stretch. Once I worked at my machine for thirty-six consecutive hours. And there were weeks on end when I never knocked off work earlier than eleven o'clock, got home and in bed at half after midnight, and was called at half past five to dress, eat, walk to work, and be at my machine at seven o'clock whistle blow. No moments here to be stolen for my beloved books. And what had John Barleycorn to do with such strenuous, stoic toil of a lad just turned fifteen? He had everything to do with it. Let me show you. I asked myself, if this were the meaning of life, to be a work beast? I knew of no horse in the city of Oakland that worked the hours I worked. If this were living, I was entirely unenamored of it. I remembered my skiff lying idle and accumulating barnacles at the boat wharf. I remembered the wind that blew every day on the bay, the sunrises and sunsets I never saw, the bite of the salt air in my nostrils, the bite of the salt water on my flesh when I plunged overside. I remembered all the beauty and the wonder and the sense delights of the world denied me, there was only one way to escape my deadening toil. I must get out and away on the water. I must earn my bread on the water. And the way of the water led inevitably to John Barleycorn. I did not know this, and when I did learn it, I was courageous enough not to retreat back to my bestial life at the machine. I wanted to be where the winds of adventure blew, and the winds of adventure blew the oyster pirate sloops up and down San Francisco Bay, from raided oyster beds and fights at night on shoal and flat to markets in the morning against city wharves where peddlers and saloon keepers came down to buy. Every raid on an oyster bed was a felony. The penalty was state imprisonment, the stripes and the lockstep. And what of that? The men in stripes worked a shorter day than I at my machine and there was vastly more romance in being an oyster pirate or a convict than in being a machine slave. And behind it all, behind all of me with youth a bubble, whispered romance adventure. So I interviewed my mammy Jenny, my old nurse at whose black breast I had suckled. She was more prosperous than my folks. She was nursing sick people at a good weekly wage. Would she lend her white child the money? Would she? 
what she had was mine. Then I sought out French Frank, the oyster pirate, who wanted to sell, I had heard, his sloop, the Razzle Dazzle. I found him lying at anchor on the Alameda side of the estuary near the Webster Street Bridge, with visitors aboard whom he was entertaining with afternoon wine. He came on deck to talk business. He was willing to sell. But it was Sunday. Besides, he had guests. On the morrow he would make out the bill of sale, and I could enter into possession. And in the meantime I must come below and meet his friends. There were two sisters, Mamie and Tess, a Mrs. Hadley who chaperoned them, Whiskey Bob, a youthful oyster pirate of sixteen, and Spider Healy, a black whiskered wharf rat of twenty. Mamie, who was Spider's niece, was called the Queen of the Oyster Pirates, and on occasion presided at their revels. French Frank was in love with her, though I did not know it at the time, and she steadfastly refused to marry him. French Frank poured a tumbler of red wine from a big demijohn to drink to our transaction. I remembered the red wine of the Italian rancho and shuddered inwardly. Whiskey and beer were not quite so repulsive. But the queen of the oyster pirates was looking at me, a part emptied glass in her own hand. I had my pride. If I was only fifteen, at least I could not show myself any less a man than she. Besides, there were her sister, and Mrs. Hadley, and the young oyster pirate, and the whiskered wharf rat, all with glasses in their hands. Was I a milk-and-water sop? No, a thousand times no, and a thousand glasses no. I downed the tumberful like a man. French Frank was elated by the sale, which I had bound with a twenty-dollar gold piece. He poured more wine. I had learned my strong head and stomach and I was certain I could drink with them in a temperate way and not poison myself for a week to come. I could stand as much as they, and besides, they had already been drinking for some time. We got to singing. Spider sang The Boston Burglar and Black Lulu. The Queen sang... Then I wished I were a little bird. And her sister Tess sang, Oh, treat my daughter kindly. The fun grew fast and furious. I found myself able to miss drinks without being noticed or called to account. Also, standing in the companionway, head and shoulders out and glass in hand, I could fling the wine overboard. I reasoned something like this. It is a queerness of these people that they like this vile-tasting wine. Well, let them. I cannot quarrel with their tastes. My manhood, according to their queer notions, must compel me to appear to like this wine. Very well, I shall so appear, but I shall drink no more than is unavoidable. And the queen began to make love to me, the latest recruit to the oyster pirate fleet, and no mere hand, but a master and owner. She went upon deck to take the air, and took me with her. 
She knew, of course, but I never dreamed how French Frank was raging down below. Then Tess joined us, sitting on the cabin, and Spider and Bob, and at the last Mrs. Hadley and French Frank. And we sat there, glasses in hand, and sang, while the big demijohn went around, and I was the only strictly sober one. And I enjoyed it as no one of them was able to enjoy it. Here, in this atmosphere of bohemianism, I could not but contrast the scene with my scene of the day before, sitting at my machine in the stifling, shut-in air, repeating, endlessly repeating, at top speed, my series of mechanical motions. And here I sat now, glass in hand, in warm, glowing camaraderie, with the oyster pirates, adventurers who refused to be slaves to petty routine, who flouted restrictions and the law, who carried their lives and their liberty in their hands. And it was through John Barleycorn that I came to join this glorious company of free souls, unashamed and unafraid. And the afternoon sea breeze blew its tang into my lungs and curled the waves in mid-channel. Before it came the scow schooners, wing and wing, blowing their horns for the drawbridges to open. Red stack tugs tow by, rocking the razzle-dazzle in the waves of their wake. A sugar bark towed from the boneyard to sea. The sun wash was on the crisping water, and life was big. And Spider sang, Oh, it's Lulu, black Lulu, my darling. Oh, it's where have you been so long? Been laying in jail, a-waitin' for bail, till my bully comes rollin' along. There it was, the smack and slap of the spirit of revolt, of adventure, of romance, of the things forbidden and done defiantly and grandly. And I knew that on the morrow I would not go back to my machine at the cannery. Tomorrow I would be an oyster pirate, as free a freebooter as the century and the waters of San Francisco Bay would permit. Spider had already agreed to sail with me as my crew of one, and also as cook while I did the deck work. We would outfit our grub and water in the morning, hoist the big mainsail, which was a bigger piece of canvas than any I had ever sailed under, and beat our way out the estuary on the first of the sea breeze and the last of the ebb. Then we would slack sheets, and on the first of the flood, run down the bay to the Asparagus Islands, where we would anchor miles offshore. And at last my dream would be realized, I would sleep upon the water. And next morning I would wake upon the water, and thereafter all my days and nights would be on the water. And the queen asked me to row her ashore in my skiff. When at sunset, French Frank prepared to take his guests ashore. Nor did I catch the significance of his abrupt change of plan when he turned the task of rowing his skiff over to Whiskey Bob, himself remaining on board the sloop. Nor did I understand Spider's grinning side remark to me, Gee, there's nothing slow about you. How could it possibly enter my boy's head that a grizzled man of fifty, 
should be jealous of me. Chapter 8 We met by appointment early Monday morning to complete the deal in Johnny Heinhold's Last Chance, a saloon, of course, for the transactions of men. I paid the money over, received the bill of sale, and French Frank treated. This struck me as an evident custom and a logical one. The seller who receives the money to wet a piece of it in the establishment where the trade was consummated. But, to my surprise, French Frank treated the house. He and I drank, which seemed just. But why should Johnny Heinhold, who owned the saloon and waited behind the bar, be invited to drink? I figured it immediately that he made a profit on the very drink he drank. I could, in a way, considering that they were friends and shipmates, understand Spider and Whiskey Bob being asked to drink, but why should the longshoremen, Bill Kelly and Soup Kennedy, be asked? Then there was Pat, the Queen's brother, making a total of eight of us. It was early morning, and all ordered whiskey. What could I do here in this company of big men all drinking whiskey? Whiskey, I said, with the careless air of one who had said it a thousand times. And such whiskey, I tossed it down. Arg! I can taste it yet. And I was appalled at the price French Frank had paid. Eighty cents! Eighty cents! It was an outrage to my thrifty soul. Eighty cents! The equivalent of eight long hours of my toil at the machine, gone down our throats, and gone like that, in a twinkling, leaving only a bad taste in the mouth. There was no discussion that French Frank was a waster. I was anxious to be gone, out into the sunshine, out over the water to my glorious boat. But all hands lingered. Even Spider, my crew, lingered. No hint broke through my obtuseness of why they lingered. I have often thought since of how they must have regarded me, the newcomer being welcomed into their company, standing at bar with them, and not standing for a single round of drinks. French Frank, who, unknown to me, had swallowed his chagrin since the day before, now that the money for the razzle-dazzle was in his pocket, began to behave curiously toward me. I sensed the change in his attitude, saw the forbidding glitter in his eyes, and wondered. The more I saw of men, the queerer they became. Johnny Heinhold leaned across the bar and whispered in my ear, He's got it in for you. Watch out. I nodded comprehension of his statement and acquiescent in it as a man should nod who knows all about men. But secretly I was perplexed. Heavens, how was I who had worked hard and read books of adventure, and who was only fifteen years old, who had not dreamed of giving the queen of the oyster pirates a second thought, and who did not know that French Frank was madly and latinly in love with her, how was I to guess that I had done him shame? And how was I to guess that the story of how the queen had thrown him down on his own boat, the moment I hove in sight, 
was already the gleeful gossip of the waterfront. And by the same token, how was I to guess that her brother Pat's offishness with me was anything else than temperamental gloominess of spirit? Whiskey Bob got me aside a moment. Keep your eyes open, he muttered. Take my tip. French Frank's ugly. I'm going up river with him to get a schooner for oystering. When he gets down on the beds, watch out. He says he'll run you down. After dark, any time he's around, change your anchorage and douse your riding like. Savvy? Oh, certainly. I savvy. I nodded my head and as one man to another thanked him for his tip and drifted back to the group at the bar. No, I did not treat. I never dreamed that I was expected to treat. I left with spider, and my ears burn now as I try to surmise the things they must have said about me. I asked Spider, in an off-hand way, what was eating French Frank. He's crazy jealous of you, was the answer. Do you think so, I said, and dismissed the matter as not worth thinking about. But I leave it to anyone, the swell of my fifteen years old manhood, at learning that French Frank, the adventurer of fifty, the sailor of all the seas of all the world, was jealous of me, and jealous over a girl most romantically named the Queen of the Oyster Pirates. I had read of such things in books, and regarded them as personal probabilities of a distant maturity. Oh, I felt a rare young devil as we hoisted the mainsail that morning, broke out anchor, and filled away close-hauled on the three-mile beat to windward out into the bay. Such was my escape from the killing machine toil and my introduction to the oyster pirates. True, the introduction had begun with drink, and the life promised to continue with drink. But was I to stay away from it for such a reason? Wherever life ran free and great, there men drank. Romance and adventure seemed always to go down the street, locked arm in arm with John Barleycorn. To know the two, I must know the third or else I must go back to my free library books and read of the deeds of other men and do no deeds of my own save slave for ten cents an hour at a machine in a cannery. No, I was not to be deterred from this brave life on the water by the fact that the water-dwellers had queer and expensive desires for beer and wine and whiskey. What if their notions of happiness included the strange one of seeing me drink? When they persisted in buying the stuff and thrusting it upon me, why, I would drink it. It was the price I would pay for their comradeship. And I didn't have to get drunk. I had not got drunk the Sunday afternoon I arranged to buy the razzle-dazzle, despite the fact that not one of the rest was sober. Well, I could go on into the future that way, drinking the stuff when it gave them pleasure that I should drink it, but carefully avoiding over-drinking. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Gradual as was my development as a heavy drinker among the oyster pirates, 
the real heavy drinking came suddenly and was the result not of desire for alcohol but of an intellectual conviction the more i saw of the life the more i was enamoured of it i can never forget my thrills the first night i took part in a concerted raid when we assembled on board the annie rough men big and unafraid and weazened wharf rats some of them ex-convicts all of them enemies of the law and meriting jail in sea boots and sea gear talking in gruff low voices and big george with revolvers strapped about his waist to show that he meant business oh i know looking back that the whole thing was sordid and silly but i was not looking back in those days when i was rubbing shoulders with john barleycorn and beginning to accept him the life was brave and wild and i was living the adventure i had read so much about nelson young scratch they called him to distinguish him from old scratch his father sailed in the sloop reindeer partners with one clam clam was a daredevil but nelson was a reckless maniac he was twenty years old with the body of a hercules when he was shot in benicia a couple of years later the coroner said he was the greatest shouldered man he had ever seen laid on a slab nelson could not read or write he had been dragged up by his father on san francisco bay and boats were second nature with him his strength was prodigious and his reputation along the waterfront for violence was anything but savory. He had berserker rages and did mad, terrible things. I made his acquaintance the first cruise of the Razzle Dazzle and saw him sail the reindeer in a blow and dredge oysters all around the rest of us as we lay at two anchors troubled with fear of going ashore he was some man this nelson and when passing by the last chance saloon he spoke to me i felt very proud but try to imagine my pride when he promptly asked me in to have a drink i stood at the bar and drank a glass of beer with him and talked manfully of oysters and boats and of the mystery of who had put the load of buckshot through the annie's mainsail we talked and lingered at the bar it seemed to me strange that we lingered we had had our beer but who was i to lead the way outside when great nelson chose to lean against the bar after a few minutes to my surprise he asked me to have another drink which i did and still we talked and nelson evinced no intention of leaving the bar bear with me while i explain the way of my reasoning and of my innocence first of all i was very proud to be in the company of nelson who was the most heroic figure among the oyster pirates and bay adventurers unfortunately for my stomach and mucous membranes nelson had a strange quirk of nature that made him find happiness in treating me to a beer i had no moral disinclination for beer and just because i didn't like the taste of it and the weight of it was no reason i should forgo the honor of his company it was his whim to drink beer and to have me drink beer with him very well 
I would put up with the passing discomfort. So we continued to talk at the bar and to drink beer ordered and paid for by Nelson. I think now, when I look back upon it, that Nelson was curious. He wanted to find out just what kind of a gink I was. He wanted to see how many times I'd let him treat without offering to treat in return. After I had drunk half a dozen glasses, my policy of temperateness in mind, I decided that I had had enough for that time. So I mentioned that I was going aboard the Razzle Dazzle, then lying at the city wharf a hundred yards away. I said goodbye to Nelson and went on down the wharf. But, john barleycorn to the extent of six glasses went with me my brain tingled and was very much alive i was uplifted by my sense of manhood i truly true oyster pirate was going aboard my own boat after hobnobbing in the last chance with nelson the greatest oyster pirate of us all. Strong in my brain was the vision of us leaning against the bar and drinking beer. And curious it was, I decided, this whim of nature that made men happy in spending good money for beer for a fellow like me who didn't want it. As I pondered this, I recollected that several times other men, in couples, had entered the last chance, and first one, then the other, had treated to drinks. I remembered, on the drunk on the idler, how Scotty and the harpooner and myself had raked and scraped dimes and nickels with which to buy the whiskey. Then came my boy code, when on a day a fellow gave another a cannonball or a chunk of taffy, on some other day he would expect to receive back a cannonball or a chunk of taffy. That was why Nelson had lingered at the bar. Having bought a drink, he had waited for me to buy one. I had let him buy six drinks and I never once offered to treat. And he was the great Nelson. I could feel myself blushing with shame. I sat down on the stringer piece of the wharf and buried my face in my hands. And the heat of my shame burned up my neck and into my cheeks and forehead. I have blushed many times in my life, but never have I experienced so terrible a blush as that one. And sitting there on the stringer piece in my shame, I did a great deal of thinking and transvaluing of values. I had been born poor. Poor I had lived. I had gone hungry on occasion. I had never had toys nor playthings like other children. My first memories of life were pinched by poverty. The pinch of poverty had been chronic. I was eight years old when I wore my first little undershirt actually sold in a store across the counter. And then it had been only one little undershirt. When it was soiled, I had to return to the awful homemade things until it was washed. I had been so proud of it that I insisted on wearing it without any outer garment. For the first time I mutinied against my mother, mutinied myself into hysteria until she let me wear the store undershirt so all the world could see. Only a man who has undergone famine can properly value food. Only sailors and desert dwellers know the meaning of fresh water. And only a child with a child's imagination can come to know the meaning of things it has long been denied. 
I early discovered that the only things I could have were those I got for myself. My meager childhood developed meagerness. The first thing I had been able to get for myself had been cigarette pictures, cigarette posters, and cigarette albums. I had not had the spending of the money I earned, so I traded extra newspapers for these treasures. I traded duplicates with the other boys, and circulating, as I did, all about town, I had greater opportunities for trading and acquiring. It was not long before I had complete every series issued by every cigarette manufacturer, such as the Great Race Horses, Parisian Beauties, Women of All Nations, Flags of All Nations, Noted Actors, Champion Prize Fighters, etc., and each series I had three different ways, in the card from the cigarette package, in the poster, and in the album. Then I began to accumulate duplicate sets, duplicate albums. I traded for other things that boys valued and which they usually bought with money given them by their parents. Naturally, they did not have the keen sense of values that I had who was never given money to buy anything. I traded for postage stamps, for minerals, for curios, for bird's eggs, for marbles. I had a more magnificent collection of agates than I have ever seen any boy possess and the nucleus of the collection was a handful worth of at least three dollars, which I had kept as security for twenty cents I loaned to a messenger boy who was sent to reform school before he could redeem them. I'd trade anything and everything for anything else, and turn it over in a dozen more trades until it was transmuted into something that was worth something. I was famous as a trader. I was notorious as a miser. I could even make a junk man weep when I had dealings with him. Other boys called me in to sell for them their collection of bottles, rags, old iron, grain, and gunny sacks, and five-gallon oil cans, I and give me a commission for doing it. And this was the thrifty, close-fisted boy, accustomed to slave at a machine for ten cents an hour, who sat on the stringer piece and considered the matter of beer at five cents a glass and gone in a moment with nothing to show for it. I was now with men I admired. I was proud to be with them. Had all my pinching and saving brought me equivalent of one of the many thrills which had been mine since I came among the oyster pirates. Then what was worth while, money or thrills? These men had no horror of squandering a nickel or many nickels. They were magnificently careless of money, calling up eight men to drink whiskey at ten cents a glass, as French Frank had shown. Why, Nelson had just spent sixty cents on beer for the two of us. Which was it to be? I was aware that I was making a grave decision. I was deciding between money and men, between niggardliness and romance. Either I must throw overboard all my old values of money and look upon it as something to be flung about wastefully, or I must throw overboard my comradeship with these men whose peculiar quirks made them like strong drink. I retraced my steps up the wharf to the last chance, 
where Nelson still stood outside. Come on and have a beer, I invited. Again we stood at the bar and drank and talked, but this time it was I who paid ten cents. A whole hour of my labor at a machine for a drink of something I didn't want and which tasted rotten. But it wasn't difficult. I had achieved a concept. Money no longer counted. It was comradeship that counted. Have another, I asked. And we had another, and I paid for it. Nelson, with the wisdom of the skilled drinker, said to the barkeeper, Make mine a small one, Johnny. Johnny nodded and gave him a glass that contained only a third as much as the glasses we had been drinking. Yet the charge was the same, five cents. By this time I was getting nicely jingled, so such extravagance didn't hurt me much. Besides, I was learning. There was more in this buying of drinks than mere quantity. I got my finger on it. There was a stage when the beer didn't count at all, but just the spirit of comradeship of drinking together. And ha! Another thing. I, too, could call for small beers and minimize by two-thirds the detestable freightage with which comradeship burdened one. I had to go aboard to get some money, I remarked casually as we drank, in the hope Nelson would take it as an explanation of why I had let him treat six consecutive times. Oh, well, you didn't have to do that, he answered. Johnny'll trust a fellow like you, won't you, Johnny? Sure, Johnny agreed with a smile. How much you got down against me? Nelson queried. Johnny pulled out the book he kept behind the bar, found Nelson's page, and added up the account of several dollars. At once I became possessed with a desire to have a page in that book. Almost it seemed the final badge of manhood. After a couple more drinks, for which I insisted on paying, Nelson decided to go. We parted true comradely, and I wandered down the wharf to the razzle-dazzle. Spider was just building the fire for supper. Where'd you get it? He grinned up at me through the open companion. Oh, I've been with Nelson. I said carelessly, trying to hide my pride. Then an idea came to me. Here was another one of them. Now that I had achieved my concept, I might as well practice it thoroughly. Come on, I said, up to Johnny's and have a drink. Going up the wharf, we met Clam coming down. Clam was Nelson's partner and he was a fine, brave, handsome, moustached man of thirty. Everything, in short, that his nickname did not connote. Come on, I said, and have a drink. He came. As we turned into the last chance, there was Pat, the Queen's brother, coming out. What's your hurry? I greeted him. We're having a drink. Come on along. I've just had one, he demurred. What of it? We're having one now, I retorted. And Pat consented to join us. And I melted my way into his good graces with a couple of glasses of beer. Oh, I was learning things that afternoon about John Barleycorn. There was more in him than the bad taste when you swallowed him. Here, at the absurd cost of ten cents, 
a gloomy grouchy individual who threatened to become an enemy was made into a good friend he became even genial his looks were kindly and our voices mellowed together as we talked waterfront and oyster bed gossip small beer for me johnny i said when the others had ordered schooners yes and i said it like the accustomed drinker carelessly casually as a sort of spontaneous thought that had just occurred to me looking back i am confident that the only one there who guessed i was a tyro at bar drinking was johnny heinhold where'd he get it i overheard spider confidentially ask johnny oh he's been sousin here with nelson all afternoon was johnny's answer i never let on that i'd heard but proud i even the barkeeper was giving me a recommendation as a man he's been sousin here with nelson all afternoon magic words the accolade delivered by a barkeeper with a beer glass i remembered that french frank had treated johnny the day i bought the razzle-dazzle the glasses were filled and we were ready to drink have something yourself johnny i said with an air of having intended to say it all the time but of having been a trifle remiss because of the interesting conversation i had been holding with clam and pat johnny looked at me with quick sharpness divining i am positive the strides i was making in my education and poured himself whiskey from his private bottle this hit me for a moment on my thrifty side he had taken a ten-cent drink when the rest of us were drinking five-cent drinks but the hurt was only for a moment i dismissed it as ignoble remembering my concept and did not give myself away you better put me down in the book for this i said when we had finished the drink and i had the satisfaction of seeing a fresh page devoted to my name and a charge penciled for a round of drinks amounting to thirty cents and i glimpsed as through a golden haze a future wherein that page would be much charged and crossed off and charged again i treated a second time around and then to my amazement johnny redeemed himself in that matter of the ten-cent drink he treated us around from behind the bar and i decided that he had arithmetically evened things up handsomely let's go around to the st louis house spider suggested when we got outside pat who had been shoveling coal all day had gone home and clam had gone upon the reindeer to cook supper so around spider and i went to the st louis house my first visit a huge barroom where perhaps fifty men mostly longshoremen were congregated and there i met soup kennedy for the second time and bill kelly and smith of the annie drifted in he of the belt buckled revolvers and nelson showed up and i met others including the vigi brothers who ran the place and the chiefest of all joe goose with the wicked eyes the twisted nose and the flowered vest who played the harmonica like a roistering angel and who went on the most atrocious tears that even the oakland waterfront could conceive of and admire as i bought drinks 
others treated as well the thought flickered across my mind that mammy jenny wasn't going to be repaid much on her loan out of that week's earnings of the razzle dazzle but what of it i thought or rather john barleycorn thought it for me you're a man and you're getting acquainted with men mammy jenny doesn't need the money as promptly as all that she isn't starving you know that she's got other money in the bank let her wait and pay her back gradually and thus it was i learned another trait of john barleycorn he inhibits morality wrong conduct that is impossible for one to do sober is done quite easily when one is not sober in fact it is the only thing one can do for john barleycorn's inhibition rises like a wall between one's immediate desires and long-learned morality i dismissed my thought of debt to mammy jenny and proceeded to get acquainted at the trifling expense of some trifling money and a jingle that was growing unpleasant who took me on board and put me to bed that night i do not know but i imagine it must have been spider End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 And so I won my manhood spurs. My status on the waterfront and with the oyster pirates became immediately excellent. I was looked upon as a good fellow as well as no coward. And somehow, from the day I achieved that concept sitting on the stringer piece of the Oakland City Wharf, I have never cared much for money. No one has ever considered me a miser since, while my carelessness of money is a source of anxiety and worry to some that know me. So completely did I break with my parsimonious past that I sent word home to my mother to call in the boys of the neighborhood and give to them all my collections i never even cared to learn what boys got what collections i was a man now and i made a clean sweep of everything that bound me to my boyhood my reputation grew when the story went around the waterfront of how french frank had tried to run me down with his schooner and of how i had stood on the deck of the razzle dazzle a cocked double barrel shotgun in my hands steering with my feet and holding her to her course and compelled him to put up his wheel and keep away the waterfront decided that there was something in me despite my youth and i continued to show what was in me there were the times i brought the razzle dazzle in with a bigger load of oysters than any other two-man craft there was the time when we raided far down in lower bay and mine was the only craft back at daylight to the anchorage off asparagus island there was the thursday night we raced for market and i brought the razzle dazzle in without a rudder first of the fleet and skimmed the cream of the friday morning trade and there was the time i brought her in from upper bay under a jib when scotty burned my mainsail yes it was scotty of the idler adventure irish had followed spider on board the razzle dazzle and scotty turning up had taken irish's place but the things i did on the water only partly counted what completed everything and won for me the title of prince of the oyster beds was that i was a good fellow ashore with my money buying drinks like a man 
I little dreamed that the time would come when the Oakland waterfront, which had shocked me at first, would be shocked and annoyed by the devilry of the things I did. But always the life was tied up with drinking. The saloons are poor men's clubs. Saloons are congregating places. We engaged to meet one another in saloons. We celebrated our good fortune or wept our grief in saloons. We got acquainted in saloons. Can I ever forget the afternoon I met Old Scratch, Nelson's father? It was in the last chance. Johnny Heinhold introduced us. That old scratch was Nelson's father was noteworthy enough. But there was more to it than that. He was owner and master of the scow schooner Annie Mine, and some day I might ship as a sailor with him. Still more, he was romance. He was a blue-eyed, yellow-haired, raw-boned Viking big-bodied and strong-muscled despite his age. And he had sailed the seas in ships of all nations in the old savage sailing days. I had heard many weird tales about him and worshipped him from a distance. It took the saloon to bring us together. Even so, our acquaintance might have been no more than a hand-grip and a word, he was a laconic old fellow, had it not been for the drinking. Have a drink, I said with promptitude, after the pause which I had learned good form in drinking dictates. Of course, while we drank our beer, which I had paid for, it was incumbent on him to listen to me and to talk to me. And Johnny, like a true host, made the tactful remarks that enabled us to find mutual topics of conversation. And of course, having drunk my beer, Captain Nelson must now buy beer in turn. This led to more talking and Johnny drifted out of the conversation to wait on other customers. The more beer Captain Nelson and I drank, the better we got acquainted. In me he found an appreciative listener, who by virtue of book reading knew much about the sea life he had lived. So he drifted back to his wild young days, and spun many a rare yarn for me, while we downed beer, treat by treat, although a blessed summer afternoon. And it was only John Barleycorn that made possible that long afternoon with the old sea dog. It was Johnny Heinhold who secretly warned me across the bar that I was getting pickled and advised me to take small beers. But as soon as Captain Nelson drank large beers, my pride forbade anything else than large beers. And not until the skipper ordered his first small beer did I order one for myself. Oh, when we came to a lingering fond farewell, I was drunk. But I had the satisfaction of seeing old Scratch as drunk as I. My youthful modesty scarcely let me dare believe that the hardened old buccaneer was even more drunk. And afterwards, from Spider and Pat and clam and johnny heinhold and others came the tips that old scratch liked me and had nothing but good words for the fine lad i was which was the more remarkable because he was known as a savage cantankerous old cuss who never liked anybody his very nickname scratch arose from a berserker trick of his 
in fighting of tearing off his opponent's face and that i had won his friendship all thanks were due to john barleycorn i have given the incident merely as an example of the multitudinous lures and draws and services by which john barleycorn wins his followers end of chapter ten chapter eleven and still there arose in me no desire for alcohol no chemical demand in years and years of heavy drinking drinking did not beget the desire drinking was the way of life i led the way of the men with whom i lived while away on my cruises on the bay i took no drink along and while out on the bay the thought of the desirableness of a drink never crossed my mind it was not until i tied the razzle-dazzle up to the wharf and got ashore in the congregating places of men where drink flowed that the buying of drinks for other men and the accepting of drinks from other men devolved upon me as a social duty and a manhood right then too there were the times lying at the city wharf or across the estuary on the sand pit when the queen and her sister and her brother pat and mrs hadley came aboard it was my boat i was host and i could only dispense hospitality in the terms of their understanding of it so i would rush spider or irish or scotty or whoever was my crew with the can for beer and the demijohn for red wine and again lying at the wharf disposing of my oysters there were dusky twilights when big policemen and plain clothes men stole on board and because we lived in the shadow of the police we opened oysters and fed them to them with squirts of pepper sauce and rushed the growler or got stronger stuff in bottles drink as i would i couldn't come to like john barleycorn i valued him extremely well for his associations but not for the taste of him all the time i was striving to be a man amongst men and all the time i nursed secret and shameful desires for candy but i would have died before i'd let anybody guess it i used to indulge in lonely debauches on nights when i knew my crew was going to sleep ashore i would go up to the free library exchange my books buy a quarter's worth of all sorts of candy that chewed and lasted sneak aboard the razzle-dazzle lock myself in the cabin go to bed and lie there long hours of bliss reading and chewing candy and those were the only times i felt that i got my real money's worth dollars and dollars across the bar couldn't buy the satisfaction that twenty-five cents did in a candy store as my drinking grew heavier i began to note more and more that it was in the drinking bouts the purple passages occurred drunks were always memorable at such times things happened men like joe goose dated existence from drunk to drunk the longshoremen all looked forward to their saturday night drunk we of the oyster boats waited until we had disposed of our cargoes before we got really started though a scattering of drinks 
and a meeting of a chance friend sometimes precipitated an accidental drunk. In ways, the accidental drunks were the best. Stranger and more exciting things happened at such times, as, for instance, the Sunday when Nelson and French Frank and Captain Spink stole the stolen salmon boat from Whiskey Bob and Nicky the Greek. Changes had taken place in the personnel of the oyster boats. Nelson had got into a fight with Bill Kelly on the Annie and was carrying a bullet hole through his left hand. Also, having quarreled with Clam and broken partnership, Nelson had sailed the reindeer, his arm in a sling, with a crew of two deep-water sailors, and he had sailed so madly as to frighten them ashore. Such was the tale of his recklessness they spread that no one on the waterfront would go out with Nelson. So the reindeer, crewless, lay across the estuary at the sand spit. Beside her lay the razzle-dazzle, with a burned mainsail and Scotty and me on board. Whiskey Bob had fallen out with French Frank and gone on a raid upriver with Nicky the Greek. The result of this raid was a brand new Columbia River salmon boat, stolen from an Italian fisherman. We oyster pirates were all visited by the searching Italian, and we were convinced, from what we knew of their movements, that Whiskey Bob and Nicky the Greek were the guilty parties. But where was the salmon boat? Hundreds of Greek and Italian fishermen upriver and down the bay had searched every slough and tool patch for it. When the owner despairingly offered a reward of fifty dollars, our interest increased and the mystery deepened. One Sunday morning, old Captain Spink paid me a visit. The conversation was confidential. He had just been fishing in his skiff at the old Alameda ferry slip. As the tide went down, he had noticed a rope tied to a pile under water and leading downward. In vain, he had tried to heave up what was fast on the other end. Farther along to another pile was a similar rope leading downward and unheavable. Without doubt, it was the missing salmon boat. If we restored it to its rightful owner, there was fifty dollars in it for us. But I had queer ethical notions about honor amongst thieves and declined to have anything to do with the affair. But French Frank had quarreled with Whiskey Bob, and Nelson was also an enemy. Poor Whiskey Bob! Without viciousness, good-natured, generous, born weak, raised poorly, with an irresistible chemical demand for alcohol, still prosecuting his vocation of bay pirate, his body was picked up not long afterward beside a dock where it had sunk full of gunshot wounds. Within an hour after I had rejected Captain Spink's proposal, I saw him sail down the estuary on board the reindeer with Nelson. Also, French Frank went by on his schooner. It was not long ere they sailed back up the estuary, curiously side by side. As they headed in for the sand spit, the submerged salmon boat could be seen, gunnels awash, and held up from sinking by ropes fast to the schooner and the sloop. The tide was half out, and they sailed squarely in on the sand, grounding in a row with the salmon boat in the middle. 
Immediately Hans, one of French Frank's sailors, was into a skiff and pulling rapidly for the north slope. The big demijohn in the stern sheets told his errand. They couldn't wait a moment to celebrate the fifty dollars they had so easily earned. It is the way of the devotees of John Barleycorn. When good fortune comes, they drink. When they have no fortune, they drink to the hope of good fortune. If fortune be ill, they drink to forget it. If they meet a friend, they drink. If they quarrel with a friend and lose him, they drink. If their love-making be crowned with success, they are so happy they needs must drink. If they be jilted, they drink for the contrary reason. And if they haven't anything to do at all, why, they take a drink secure in the knowledge that when they have taken a sufficient number of drinks the maggots will start crawling in their brains and they will have their hands full with things to do when they are sober they want to drink and when they have drunk they want to drink more of course as fellow comrades, Scotty and I were called in for the drinking. We helped to make a hole in that fifty dollars not yet received. The afternoon, from just an ordinary common summer Sunday afternoon, became a generous purple afternoon. We all talked and sang and ranted and bragged, and ever French Frank and Nelson sent more drinks around. We lay in full sight of the Oakland waterfront, and the noise of our revels attracted friends. Skiff after skiff crossed the estuary and hauled up on the sand spit, while Hans' work was cut out for him, ever to row back and forth for more supplies of booze. Then whiskey bob and nicky the greek arrived sober indignant outraged in that their fellow pirates had raised their plant french frank aided by john barleycorn orated hypocritically about virtue and honesty and despite his fifty years got whiskey bob out on the sand and proceeded to lick him when Nicky the Greek jumped in with a short-handed shovel to Whiskey Bob's assistant, short work was made of him by Hans. And, of course, when the bleeding remnants of Bob and Nicky were sent packing in their skiff, the event must needs be celebrated in further carousal. By this time, our visitors being numerous, we were a large crowd compounded of many nationalities and diverse temperaments, all aroused by John Barleycorn, all restraints cast off. Old quarrels revived, ancient hates flared up. Fight was in the air. And whenever a longshoreman remembered something against a scow schooner sailor, or vice versa, or an oyster pirate remembered, or was remembered, a fist shot out and another fight was on, and every fight was made up in more rounds of drinks, wherein the combatants, aided and abetted by the rest of us, embraced each other and pledged undying friendship. And of all times, Soup Kennedy selected this time to come and retrieve an old shirt of his, left aboard the reindeer from the trip he sailed with Clam. He had espoused Clam's side of the quarrel with Nelson. Also, he had been drinking in the St. Louis house, 
so that it was John Barleycorn who led him to the sand pit in quest of his old shirt. Few words started the fray. He locked with Nelson in the cockpit of the reindeer, and in the mix-up barely escaped being brained by an iron bar wielded by irate French Frank. Irate because a two-handed man had attacked a one-handed man. If the reindeer still floats, the dent of the iron bar remains in the hardwood rail of her cockpit. But Nelson pulled his bandaged hand, bullet perforated, out of its sling, and held by us, wept and roared his berserker belief that he could lick Soup Kennedy one-handed. And we let them loose on the sand. Once, when it looked as if Nelson were getting the worst of it, French Frank and John Barleycorn sprang unfairly into the fight. Scotty protested and reached for French Frank, who whirled upon him and fell on top of him in a pummeling clinch after a sprawl of twenty feet across the sand. In the course of separating these two, half a dozen fights started amongst the rest of us. These fights were finished one way or the other, or we separated them with drinks, while all the time Nelson and Soup Kennedy fought on. Occasionally we returned to them and gave advice, such as, when they lay exhausted in the sand, unable to strike a blow, throw sand in his eyes and they threw sand in each other's eyes, recuperated, and fought on to successive exhaustions. And now, of all this that is squalid and ridiculous and bestial, try to think what it meant to me, a youth not yet sixteen, burning with the spirit of adventure, fancy filled with tales of buccaneers and sea rovers sacks of cities and conflicts of armed men and imagination maddened by the stuff i had drunk it was life raw and naked wild and free the only life of that sort which my birth in time and space permitted me to attain and more than that, it carried a promise. It was the beginning. From the sand spit, the way led out through the golden gate to the vastness of adventure of all the world, where battles would be fought, not for old shirts and over-stolen salmon boats, but for high purposes and romantic ends. And because I told Scotty what I thought of his letting an old man like French Frank get away with him, we too brawled and added to the festivity of the sandpit. And Scotty threw up his job as crew and departed in the night with a pair of blankets belonging to me. During the night, while the other oyster pirates lay stupefied in their bunks, the schooner and the reindeer floated on the high water and swung about to their anchors. The salmon boat, still filled with rocks and water, rested on the bottom. In the morning, early, I heard wild cries from the reindeer, and tumbled out in the chill gray to see a spectacle that made the waterfront laugh for days. The beautiful salmon boat lay on the hard sand, squashed flat as a pancake, while on it were perched French Frank schooner and the reindeer. Unfortunately, two of the reindeer's planks had been crushed in by the stout oak stem of the salmon boat. 
the rising tide had flowed through the hole and just awakened nelson by getting into his bunk with him i lent a hand and we pumped the reindeer out and repaired the damage then nelson cooked breakfast and while we ate we considered the situation he was broke so was i the fifty dollars reward would never be paid for that pitiful mess of splinters on the sand beneath us he had a wounded hand and no crew i had a burned mainsail and no crew what do you say you and me nelson queried i'll go you was my answer and thus i became partners with young scratch nelson the wildest maddest of them all we borrowed the money for an outfit of grub from johnny heinhold filled our water barrels and sailed away that day for the oyster beds end of chapter chapter twelve nor have i ever regretted those months of mad devilry i put in with nelson he could sail even if he did frighten every man that sailed with him to steer to miss destruction by an inch or an instant was his joy to do what everybody else did not dare attempt to do was his pride never to reef down was his mania and in all the time i spent with him blow high or low the reindeer was never reefed nor was she ever dry we strained her open and sailed her open and sailed her open continually and we abandoned the oakland waterfront and went wider afield for our adventures and all this glorious passage in my life was made possible for me by john barleycorn and this is my complaint against john barleycorn here i was thirsting for the wild life of adventure and the only way for me to win to it was through john barleycorn's meditation it was the way of the men who lived the life did i wish to live the life i must live it the way they did it was by virtue of drinking that i gained that partnership and comradeship with nelson had i drunk only the beer he paid for or had i declined to drink at all i should never have been selected by him as a partner he wanted a partner who would meet with him on the social side as well as the work side of life i abandoned myself to the life and developed the misconception that the secret of john barleycorn lay in going on mad drunks rising through the successive stages that only an iron constitution could endure to final stupefaction and swinish unconsciousness i do not like the taste so i drank for the sole purpose of getting drunk of getting hopelessly helplessly drunk and i who had saved and scraped traded like a shylock and made junkmen weep i who had stood aghast when french frank at a single stroke spent eighty cents for whiskey for eight men i turned myself loose with a more lavish disregard for money than any of them i remember going ashore one night with nelson in my pocket were one hundred and eighty dollars it was my intention first to buy some clothes after that some drinks i needed the clothes all i possessed were on me and they were as follows a pair of sea boots that providentially leaked the water out as fast as it ran in 
a pair of fifty-cent overalls, a forty-cent cotton shirt, and a sou'wester. I had no hat, so I had to wear the sou'wester, and it will be noted that I have listed neither underclothes nor socks. I didn't own any. To reach the stores where clothes could be bought, we had to pass a dozen saloons. So I bought me the drinks first. I never got to the clothing stores. In the morning, broke, poisoned but contented, I came back on board and we set sail. I possessed only the clothes I had gone ashore in, and not a cent remained of the one hundred and eighty dollars. It might well be deemed impossible, by those who have never tried it, that in twelve hours a lad can spend all of one hundred and eighty dollars for drinks. I know otherwise. And I had no regrets. I was proud. I had shown them I could spend with the rest of them. Amongst strong men I had proved myself strong. I had clinched again, as I had often clinched, my right to the title of prince. Also, my attitude may be considered, in part, as a reaction from my childhood's meagerness and my childhood's excessive toil. Possibly my inchoate thought was, better to remain amongst booze-fighters, a prince, than to toil twelve hours a day at a machine for ten cents an hour. There are no purple passages in machine toil. But if the spending of one hundred and eighty dollars in twelve hours isn't a purple passage, then I'd like to know what is. Oh, I skip much of the details of my trafficking with John Barleycorn during this period, and shall only mention events that will throw light on John Barleycorn's ways. There were three things that enabled me to pursue this heavy drinking. First, a magnificent constitution far better than the average. Second, the healthy open-air life on the water and third, the fact that I drank irregularly. While out on the water, we never carried any drink along. The world was opening up to me. Already I knew several hundred miles of the waterways of it, and of the towns and cities and fishing hamlets on the shores. Came the whisper to range farther. I had not found it yet. There was more behind. But even this much of the world was too wide for Nelson. He wearied for his beloved Oakland waterfront, and when he elected to return to it, we separated in all friendliness. I now made the old town of Benicia on the Carquinez Straits my headquarters. In a cluster of fishermen's arks, moored in the tools on the waterfront, dwelt a congenial crowd of drinkers and vagabonds, and I joined them. I had longer spells ashore, between fooling with salmon fishing and making raids up and down bay and rivers as a deputy fish patrolman, and I drank more and learned more about drinking. I held my own with anyone, drink for drink, and often drank more than my share to show the strength of my manhood. When, on a morning, my unconscious carcass was disentangled from the nets on the drying frames, whither I had stupidly, blindly crawled the night before, and when the waterfront talked it over with many a giggle and laugh and another drink, I was proud indeed. It was an exploit. And when I never drew a sober breath on one stretch for three solid weeks, 
I was certain I had reached the top. Surely, in that direction, one could go no farther. It was time for me to move on. For always, drunk or sober, at the back of my consciousness, something whispered that this carousing and bay adventuring was not all of life. This whisper was my good fortune. I happened to be so made that I could hear it calling, always calling, out and away over the world. It was not canniness on my part, it was curiosity, desire to know, an unrest and a seeking for things wonderful that I seemed somehow to have glimpsed or guessed. What was this life for, I demanded, if this were all? No, there was something more, away and beyond. And in relation to my much later development as a drinker, this whisper, this promise of the things at the back of life, must be noted, for it was destined to play a dire part in my more recent wrestlings with John Barleycorn. But what gave immediacy to my decision to move on was a trick John Barleycorn played me, a monstrous, incredible trick that showed abysses of intoxication hitherto undreamed. At one o'clock in the morning, after a prodigious drunk, I was tottering aboard a sloop at the end of the wharf, intending to go to sleep. The tides sweep through Carquinez Straits as in a mill race, and the full ebb was on when I stumbled overboard. There was nobody on the wharf, nobody on the sloop. I was borne away by the current. I was not startled. I thought the misadventure delightful. I was a good swimmer, and in my inflamed condition, the contact of the water with my skin soothed me like cool linen. And then John Barleycorn played me his maniacal trick. Some maundering fancy of going out with the tide suddenly obsessed me. I had never been morbid. Thoughts of suicide had never entered my head. And now that they entered, I thought it fine, a splendid culminating, a perfect rounding off of my short but exciting career. I who had never known girl's love, nor woman's love, nor the love of children, who had never played in the wide joy-fields of art, nor climbed the star-cool heights of philosophy, nor seen with my eyes more than a pinpoint surface of the gorgeous world, I decided that this was all that I had seen all, lived all, been all, that was worth while, and that now was the time to cease. This was the trick of John Barleycorn, laying me by the heels of my imagination, and in a drug dream, dragging me to death. Oh, he was convincing. I had really experienced all of life, and it didn't amount to much. The swinish drunkenness in which I had lived for months, this was accompanied by the sense of degradation and the old feeling of conviction of sin, was the last and the best, and I could see for myself what it was worth. There were all the broken-down old bums and loafers I had bought drinks for. That was what remained of life. 
Did I want to become like them? A thousand times no. And I wept tears of sweet sadness over my glorious youth going out with the tide. And who has not seen the weeping drunk, the melancholic drunk? They are to be found in all the barrooms. If they can find no other listener telling their sorrows to the barkeeper who is paid to listen. The water was delicious. It was a man's way to die. John Barleycorn changed the tune he played in my drink-maddened brain. Away with tears and regret. It was a hero's death, and by the hero's own hand and will. So I struck up my death chant, and was singing it lustily, when the gurgle and splash of the current riffles in my ears reminded me of my more immediate situation. Below the town of Benicia, where the Solano Wharf projects, the straits widen out into what bayfarers call the bite of Turner's shipyard. I was in the shore tide that swept under the Solano Wharf and up into the bite. I knew of old the power of the suck which developed when the tide swung around the end of Dead Man's Island and drove straight for the wharf. I didn't want to go through those piles. It wouldn't be nice, and I might lose an hour in the bite on my way out with the tide. I undressed in the water and struck out with a strong, single overhand stroke, crossing the current at right angles. Nor did I cease until, by the wharf lights, I knew I was safe to sweep by the end. Then I turned over and rested. The stroke had been a telling one, and I was a little time in recovering my breath. I was elated, for I had succeeded in avoiding the suck. I started to raise my death chant again, a purely extemporized farrago of a drug-crazed youth. Don't sing yet, whispered John Barleycorn. The Solano runs all night. There are railroad men on the wharf. They will hear you and come out in a boat and rescue you, and you don't want to be rescued. I certainly didn't. What? Be robbed of my hero's death? Never. And I lay on my back in the starlight, watching the familiar wharf lights go by, red and green and white, and bidding sad sentimental farewell to them, each and all. When I was well clear in mid-channel, I sang again. Sometimes I swam a few strokes, but in the main I contented myself with floating and dreaming long drunken dreams. Before daylight, the chill of the water and the passage of the hours had sobered me sufficiently to make me wonder what portion of the straits I was in and also to wonder if the turn of the tide wouldn't catch me and take me back ere I had drifted out into San Pablo Bay. Next, I discovered that I was very weary and very cold, and quite sober, and that I didn't in the least want to be drowned. I could make out the Selby smelter on the Contra Costa shore and the Mare Island lighthouse. I started to swim for the Solano shore, but was too weak and chilled, and made so little headway, and at the cost of such painful effort, that I gave it up and consented myself with floating, now and then giving a stroke to keep my balance in the tide rips which were increasing the commotion on the surface of the water. 
and new fear. I was sober now, and I didn't want to die. I discovered scores of reasons for living, and the more reasons I discovered, the more liable it seemed that I was going to drown anyway. Daylight, after I had been four hours in the water, found me in a parlous condition in the tide rips off Mare Island where the swift ebbs from Vallejo Straits and Carquinas Straits were fighting with each other, and where, at that particular moment, they were fighting the flood tide setting up against them from San Pablo Bay. A stiff breeze had sprung up, and the crisp little waves were persistently lapping into my mouth, and I was beginning to swallow salt water. With my swimmer's knowledge, I knew the end was near. And then the boat came. A Greek fisherman running in for Vallejo. And again I had been saved from John Barleycorn by my constitution and physical vigor. And in passing, let me note that this maniacal trick John Barleycorn played me is nothing uncommon. An absolute statistic of the percentage of suicides due to John Barleycorn would be appalling. In my case, healthy, normal, young, full of the joy of life, the suggestion to kill myself was unusual, but it must be taken into account that it came on the heels of a long carouse, when my nerves and brain were fearfully poisoned, and that the dramatic, romantic side of my imagination drink maddened to lunacy was delighted with the suggestion and yet the older more morbid drinkers more jaded with life and more disillusioned who kill themselves do so usually after a long debauch when their nerves and brains are thoroughly poison soaked End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 So I left Benicia, where John Barleycorn had nearly got me, and ranged wider afield in pursuit of the whisper from the back of life to come and find. And wherever I ranged, the way lay along alcohol-drenched roads. Men still congregated in saloons. They were the poor man's clubs, and they were the only clubs to which I had access. I could get acquainted in saloons. I could go into a saloon and talk with any man. In the strange towns and cities I wandered through, the only place for me to go was the saloon. I was no longer a stranger in any town the moment I had entered a saloon. And right here let me break in with experiences no later than last year. I harnessed four horses to a light trap, took Charmian along, and drove for three months and a half over the wildest mountain parts of California and Oregon. Each morning I did my regular day's work of writing fiction. That completed, I drove on through the middle of the day and the afternoon to the next stop. But the irregularity of occurrence of stopping places, coupled with widely varying road conditions, made it necessary to plan the day before each day's drive and my work. I must know when I was to start driving in order to start writing in time to finish my day's output. Thus, on occasion, when the drive was to be long, I would be up and at my writing by five in the morning. 
on easier driving days i might not start writing till nine o'clock but how to plan as soon as i arrived in a town and put the horses up on the way from the stable to the hotel i dropped into the saloons first thing a drink oh i wanted the drink but also it must not be forgotten that because of wanting to know things it was in this very way i had learned to want a drink well the first thing a drink have something yourself to the barkeeper and then as we drink my opening query about roads and stopping places on ahead let me see the barkeeper will say there's the road across tarwater divide that used to be good i was over it three years ago but it was blocked this spring say i'll tell you what i'll ask jerry and the barkeeper turns and addresses some man sitting at a table or leaning against the bar further along and who may be jerry or tom or bill say jerry how about the tarwater road you was down to wilkins last week and while bill or jerry or tom is beginning to unlimber his thinking and speaking apparatus i suggested that he join us in the drink then discussions arise about the advisability of this road or that what the best stopping places may be what running time i may expect to make where the best trout streams are and so forth in which other men join and which are punctuated with more drinks two or three more saloons and i accumulate a warm jingle and come pretty close to knowing everybody in town all about the town and a fair deal about the surrounding country i know the lawyers editors businessmen local politicians and the visiting ranchers hunters and miners so that by evening when charmian and i stroll down the main street and back she is astounded by the number of new acquaintances in that totally strange town and thus is demonstrated a service john barleycorn renders a service by which he increases his power over men and all over the world wherever i have gone during all the years it has been the same it may be a cabaret in the latin quarter a cafe in some obscure italian village a boozing ken in sailor town and it may be up at the club over scotch and soda but always it will be where john barleycorn makes fellowship that i get immediately in touch and meet and know and in the good days coming when john barleycorn will have been banished out of existence along with the other barbarisms some other institution that the saloon will have to obtain some other congregating place of men where strange men and stranger men may get in touch and meet and know but to return to my narrative when i turned my back on benicia my way led through saloons i had developed no moral theories against drinking and i disliked as much as ever the taste of the stuff but i had grown respectfully suspicious of john barleycorn i could not forget that trick he had played on me on me who did not want to die so i continued to drink and to keep a sharp eye on john barleycorn resolved to resist all future suggestions of self-destruction in strange towns i made immediate acquaintances in the saloons when i hoboed and had the price of a bed a saloon was the only place that would receive me and give me a chair by the fire i could go into a saloon and wash up brush my clothes and comb my hair 
and saloons were always so damnably convenient. They were everywhere in my western country. I couldn't go into the dwellings of strangers that way. Their doors were not open to me. No seats were there for me by their fires. Also, churches and preachers I had never known. And from what I didn't know, I was not attracted toward them. Besides, there was no glamour about them, no haze of romance, no promise of adventure. They were the sort with whom things never happened. They lived and remained always in the one place, creatures of order and system, narrow, limited, restrained. They were without greatness, without imagination, without camaraderie. It was the good fellows, easy and genial, daring, and on occasion mad, that I wanted to know. The fellows, generous-hearted and handed, and not rabbit-hearted. And here is another complaint I bring against John Barleycorn. It is these good fellows that he gets, the fellows with the fire and the go in them, who have bigness and warmness and the best of the human weaknesses. And John Barleycorn puts out the fire and soddens the agility and when he does not more immediately kill them or make maniacs of them, he coarsens and grossens them, twists and malforms them out of the original goodness and fineness of their natures. Oh, and I speak out of later knowledge. Heaven defend me from the most of the average run of male humans who are not good fellows the ones cold of heart and cold of head, who don't smoke, drink, or swear, or do much of anything else that is brave and resentful and stinging, because in their feeble fibers there has never been the stir and prod of life to well over its boundaries and be devilish and daring. One doesn't meet these in saloons, nor rallying to lost causes, nor flaming on the adventure paths, nor loving as God's own mad lovers. They are too busy keeping their feet dry, conserving their heartbeats, and making unlovely life successes of their spirit mediocrity. And so I draw the indictment home to John Barleycorn. It is just those, the good fellows, the worthwhile, the fellows with the weakness of too much strength, too much spirit, too much fire and flame of fine devilishness that he solicits and ruins. Of course, he ruins weaklings. But with them, the worst we breed, I am not here concerned. My concern is that it is so much of the best we breed whom John Barleycorn destroys. And the reason why these best are destroyed is because John Barleycorn stands in every highway and byway, accessible, law-protected, saluted by the policemen on the beat, speaking to them, leading them by the hand to the places where the good fellows and daring ones foregather and drink deep. With John Barleycorn out of the way, these daring ones would still be born, and they would do things instead of perishing. Always I encountered the camaraderie of drink. I might be walking down the track to the water tank to lie in wait for a passing freight train when I would chance upon a bunch of alky stiffs. An alky stiff is a tramp who drinks druggist's alcohol. Immediately, with greeting and salutation, I am taken into the fellowship. The alcohol, shrewdly blended with water, is handed to me and soon I am caught up in the revelry. 
with maggots crawling in my brain and john barleycorn whispering to me that life is big and that we are all brave and fine free spirits sprawling like careless gods upon the turf and telling the two-by-four cut-and-dried conventional world to go hang End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Back in Oakland from my wanderings, I returned to the waterfront and renewed my comradeship with Nelson, who was now on shore all the time and living more madly than before. I, too, spent my time on shore with him, only occasionally going for cruises of several days on the bay to help out on short-handed scow schooners. The result was that I was no longer reinvigorated by periods of open-air abstinence and healthy toil. I drank every day, and whenever opportunity offered I drank to excess for I still labored under the misconception that the secret of John Barleycorn lay in drinking to bestiality and unconsciousness. I became pretty thoroughly alcohol-soaked during this period. I practically lived in saloons, became a bar-room loafer and worse. And right here was John Barleycorn getting me in a more insidious, though no less deadly way than when he nearly sent me out with the tide. I had a few months still to run before I was seventeen. I scorned the thought of a steady job at anything. I felt myself a pretty tough individual in a group of pretty tough men and I drank because these men drank, and because I had to make good with them. I had never had a real boyhood, and in this, my precocious manhood, I was very hard and woefully wise. Though I had never known girls' love even, I had crawled through such depths that I was convinced absolutely that I knew the last word about love and life. And it wasn't a pretty knowledge. Without being pessimistic, I was quite satisfied that life was a rather cheap and ordinary affair. You see, John Barleycorn was blunting me. The old strings and prods of the spirit were no longer sharp curiosity was leaving me. What did it matter what lay on the other side of the world? Men and women, without doubt, very much like the men and women I knew, marrying and giving in marriage, and all the petty run of petty human concerns, and drinks too. But the other side of the world was a long way to go for a drink. I had but to step to the corner and get all I wanted at Joe Vigie's. Johnny Heinhold still ran the last chance, and there were saloons on all the corners and between the corners. The whispers from the back of life were growing dim as my mind and body soddened. The old unrest was drowsy. I might as well rot and die here in Oakland as anywhere else, and I should have so rotted and died, and not in very long order either, at the pace John Barleycorn was leading me, had the matter depended wholly on him. I was learning what it was to have no appetite. I was learning what it was to get up shaky in the morning, with a stomach that quivered, with fingers touched with palsy, and to know the drinker's need for a stiff glass of whiskey neat in order to brace up. Oh, John Barleycorn is a wizard dopester, brain and body, scorched and jangled and poisoned, 
return to be tuned up by the very poison that caused the damage. There is no end to John Barleycorn's tricks. He had tried to inveigle me into killing myself. At this period he was doing his best to kill me at a fairly rapid pace. But, not satisfied with that, he tried another dodge. He very nearly got me, too, and right there I learned a lesson about him. Become a wiser, a more skillful drinker. I learned there were limits to my gorgeous constitution, and that there were no limits to John Barleycorn. I learned that in a short hour or two he could master my strong head, my broad shoulders and deep chest, put me on my back, and with a devil's grip on my throat proceed to choke the life out of me. Nelson and I were sitting in the overland house. It was early in the evening, and the only reason we were there was because we were broke and it was election time. You see, in election time, local politicians, aspirants for office, have a way of making the rounds of the saloons to get votes. One is sitting at a table, in a dry condition, wondering who is going to turn up and buy him a drink or if his credit is good at some other saloon, and if it's worth while to walk that far to find out, when suddenly the saloon doors swing wide and enters a bevy of well-dressed men, themselves usually wide and exhaling an atmosphere of prosperity and fellowship. They have smiles and greeting for everybody, for you, without the price of a glass of beer in your pocket, for the timid hobo who lurks in the corner and who certainly hasn't a vote, but who may establish a lodging house registration. And do you know, when these politicians swing wide the doors and come in, with their broad shoulders, their deep chests, and their generous stomachs which cannot help making them optimists and masters of life, why, you perk right up. It's going to be a warm evening after all, and you know you'll get a souse started at the very least. And, who knows, the gods may be kind, other drinks may come, and the night culminate in glorious greatness. And the next thing you know, you are lined up at the bar, pouring drinks down your throat and learning the gentlemen's names and the offices which they hope to fill. It was during this period, when the politicians went their saloon rounds, that I was getting bitter bits of education and having illusions punctured. I, who had poured and thrilled over the rail splitter and from canal boy to president. Yes, I was learning how noble politics and politicians are. Well, on this night, broke, thirsty, but with the drinker's faith in the unexpected drink, Nelson and I sat in the overland house waiting for something to turn up, especially politicians. And there entered Joe Goose. He, of the unquenchable thirst, the wicked eyes, the crooked nose, the flowered vest. Come on, fellows, free booze, all you want of it. I didn't want you to miss it. Where, we wanted to know. Come on, I'll tell you as we go along. We haven't a minute to lose. And as we hurried uptown, Joe Goose explained, It's the Hancock Fire Brigade. All you have to do is wear a red shirt and a helmet and carry a torch. They're going down on the special train to Hayward's to parade. I think the place was Hayward's. It may have been San Leandro or Niles. 
and to save me i can't remember whether the hancock fire brigade was a republican or a democratic organization but anyway the politicians who ran it were short of torchbearers and anybody who would parade could get drunk if he wanted to the town'll be wide open joe goose went on booze it'll run like water the politicians have bought the stocks of the saloons there'll be no charge all you got to do is walk right up and call for it we'll raise hell at the hall on eighth street near broadway we got into the firemen's shirts and helmets were equipped with torches and growling because we weren't given at least one drink before we started were herded aboard the train oh these politicians had handled our kind before at haywood's there were no drinks either parade first and earn your booze was the order of the night we paraded then the saloons were opened extra barkeepers had been engaged and the drinkers jammed six deep before every drink drenched and unwiped bar there was no time to wipe the bar nor wash glasses nor do anything save fill glasses the oakland waterfront can be real thirsty on occasion this method of jamming and struggling in front of the bar was too slow for us the drink was ours the politicians had bought it for us we'd paraded and earned it hadn't we so we made a flank attack around the end of the bar shoved the protesting barkeepers aside and helped ourselves to bottles outside we knocked the necks of the bottles off against the concrete curbs and drank now joe goose and nelson had learned discretion with straight whiskey drunk in quantity i hadn't i still labored under the misconception that one was to drink all he could get especially when it didn't cost anything we shared our bottles with others and drank a good portion ourselves while i drank most of all and i didn't like the stuff i drank it as i had drunk beer at five and wine at seven i mastered my qualms and downed it like so much medicine and when we wanted more bottles we went into other saloons where the free drink was flowing and helped ourselves i haven't the slightest idea of how much i drank whether it was two quarts or five i do know that i began the orgy with half pint draughts and with no water afterward to wash the taste away or to dilute the whiskey now the politicians were too wise to leave the town filled with drunks from the waterfront of oakland when train time came there was a round-up of the saloons already i was feeling the impact of the whiskey nelson and i were hustled out of a saloon and found ourselves in the very last rank of a disorderly parade i struggled along heroically my correlations breaking down my legs tottering under me my head swimming my heart pounding my lungs panting for air my helplessness was coming on so rapidly that my reeling brain told me i would go down and out and never reach the train if i remained at the rear of the procession i left the ranks and ran down a pathway beside the road under broad spreading trees nelson pursued me laughing certain things stand out as in memories of nightmare i remember those trees especially and my desperate running along under them and how every time i fell roars of laughter went up from the other drunks they thought i was merely antic drunk they did not dream that john barleycorn had me by the throat in a death clutch but i knew it 
and I remember the fleeting bitterness that was mine as I realized that I was in a struggle with death, and that these others did not know. It was as if I were drowning before a crowd of spectators who thought I was cutting up tricks for their entertainment. And running there under the trees, I fell and lost consciousness. What happened afterward, with one glimmering exception, I had to be told. Nelson, with his enormous strength, picked me up and dragged me on and aboard the train. When he had got me into a seat, I fought and panted so terribly for air that even with his obtuseness he knew I was in a bad way. And right there, at any moment I know now, I might have died. I often think it is the nearest to death I have ever been. I have only Nelson's description of my behavior to go by. I was scorching up, burning alive internally in an agony of fire and suffocation, and I wanted air. I madly wanted air. My efforts to raise a window were vain, for all the windows in the car were screwed down. Nelson had seen drink-crazed men and thought I wanted to throw myself out. He tried to restrain me, but I fought on. I seized some man's torch and smashed the glass. Now, there were pro-Nelson and anti-Nelson factions on the Oakland waterfront, and men of both factions, with more drink in them than was good, filled the car. My smashing of the window was the signal for the antis. One of them reached for me and dropped me and started the fight, of all of which I have no knowledge save what was told me afterwards and a sore jaw next day from the blow that put me out. The man who struck me went down across my body. Nelson followed him, and they say there were a few unbroken windows in the wreckage of the car that followed as the free-for-all fight had its course. This being not cold and motionless was perhaps the best thing that could have happened to me. My violent struggles had only accelerated my already dangerously accelerated heart and increased the need for oxygen in my suffocating lungs. After the fight was over and I came to, I did not come to myself. I was no more myself than a drowning man is who continues to struggle after he has lost consciousness. I have no memory of my actions, but I cried, Air! Air! so insistently that it dawned on Nelson that I did not contemplate self-destruction. So he cleared the jagged glass from the window ledge and let me stick my head and shoulders out. He realized partially the seriousness of my condition and held me by the waist to prevent me from crawling further out. And for the rest of the run into Oakland, I kept my head and shoulders out, fighting like a maniac whenever he tried to draw me inside. And here my one glimmering streak of true consciousness came. My sole recollection from the time I fell under the trees until I awoke the following evening is of my head out of the window, facing the wind caused by the train, cinders striking and burning and blinding me while I breathed with will. All my will was concentrated on breathing on breathing the air in the hugest lungful gulps I could, pumping the greatest amount of air into my lungs in the shortest possible time. It was that or death, and I was a swimmer and diver, and I knew it. And in the most intolerable agony of prolonged suffocation, 
During those moments I was conscious, I faced the wind and the cinders and breathed for life. All the rest is blank. I came to the following evening in a waterfront lodging house. I was alone. No doctor had been called in. And I might well have died there for Nelson and the others, deeming me merely sleeping off my drunk, had let me lie there in a comatose condition for seventeen hours. Many a man, as every doctor knows, has died of the sudden impact of a quart or more of whiskey. Usually one reads of them so dying, strong drinkers on account of a wager. But I didn't know then. And so I learned, and by no virtue nor prowess, but simply through good fortune and constitution. Again, my constitution had triumphed over John Barleycorn. I had escaped from another death pit, dragged myself through another morass, and perilously acquired the discretion that would enable me to drink wisely for many another year to come. Heavens, that was twenty years ago, and I am still very much and wisely alive, and I have seen much done much, lived much, in that intervening score of years, and I shudder when I think how close a shave I ran, how near I was to missing that splendid fifth of a century that has been mine. And, oh, it wasn't John Barleycorn's fault that he didn't get me that night of the Hancock Fire Brigade. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 It was during the early winter of 1892 that I resolved to go to sea. My Hancock Fire Brigade experience was very little responsible for this. I still drank and frequented saloons, practically lived in saloons. Whiskey was dangerous, in my opinion, but not wrong. Whiskey was dangerous like other dangerous things in the natural world. Men died of whiskey, but then, too, fishermen were capsized and drowned. Hobos fell under trains and were cut to pieces. To cope with winds and waves, railroad trains and bar rooms, one must use judgment. To get drunk after the manner of men was all right, but one must do it with discretion. No more quarts of whiskey for me. What really decided me to go to sea was that I had caught my first vision of the death road which John Barleycorn maintains for his devotees. It was not a clear vision, however, and there were two phases of it somewhat jumbled at the time. It struck me, from watching those with whom I associated, that the life we were living was more destructive than that lived by the average man. John Barleycorn, by inhibiting morality, incited to crime. Everywhere I saw men doing, drunk, what they would never dream of doing, sober and this wasn't the worst of it. It was the penalty that must be paid. Crime was destructive. Saloon mates I drank with, who were good fellows and harmless, sober, did most violent and lunatic things when they were drunk. And then the police gathered them in, and they vanished from our ken. Sometimes I visited them behind the bars and said good-bye ere they journeyed across the bay to put on the felon's stripes. And time and again I heard the one explanation. 
If I hadn't been drunk, I wouldn't a done it. And sometimes, under the spell of John Barleycorn, the most frightful things were done, things that shocked even my case-hardened soul. The other phrase of the death road was that of the habitual drunkards, who had a way of turning up their toes without apparent provocation. When they took sick, even with trifling afflictions that any ordinary man could pull through, they just pegged out. Sometimes they were found unattended and dead in their beds. On occasion their bodies were dragged out of the water. And sometimes it was just plain accident, as when Bill Kelly, unloading cargo while drunk, had a finger jerked off, which under the circumstances might just as easily have been his head. So I considered my situation and knew that I was getting into a bad way of living. It made toward death too quickly to suit my youth and vitality. And there was only one way out of this hazardous manner of living, and that was to get out. The sealing fleet was wintering in San Francisco Bay, and in the saloons I met skippers, mates, hunters, boat steerers, and boat pullers. I met the seal hunter, Pete Holt, and agreed to be his boat puller and to sign on any schooner he signed on. And I had to have half a dozen drinks with Pete Holt there and then to seal our agreement. And at once awoke all my old unrest that John Barleycorn had put to sleep. I found myself actually bored with the saloon life of the Oakland waterfront and wondered what I had ever found fascinating in it. Also, with this death road concept in my brain, I began to grow afraid that something would happen to me before sailing day, which was set for some time in January. I lived more circumspectly, drank more deeply, and went home more frequently. When drinking grew too wild, I got out. When Nelson was in his maniacal cups, I managed to get separated from him. On the 12th of January, 1893, I was 17, and the 20th of January, I signed before the shipping commissioner the articles of the Sophie Sutherland a three-topmast sealing schooner bound on a voyage to the coast of Japan. And, of course, we had to drink on it. Joe Vigi cashed my advance note, and Pete Holt treated, and I treated, and Joe Vigi treated, and other hunters treated. Well, it was the way of men, and who was I, just turned seventeen, that I should decline the way of life of these fine, chesty, man-grown men? End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 There was nothing to drink on the Sophie Sutherland, and we had fifty-one days of glorious sailing, taking the southern passage in the northeast trades to Bonin Islands. This isolated group, belonging to Japan, had been selected as the rendezvous of the Canadian and American sealing fleets. Here they filled their water barrels and made repairs before starting on the hundred days harrying of the seal herd along the northern coast of Japan to Bering Sea. Those fifty-one days of fine sailing and intense sobriety had put me in splendid fettle. The alcohol had been worked out of my system and from the moment the voyage began I had not known the desire for a drink. 
I doubt if I even thought once about a drink. Often, of course, the talk in the forecastle turned to drink, and the men told of their more exciting or humorous drunks, remembering such passages more keenly, with greater delight than all the other passages of their adventurous lives. In the forecastle, the oldest man, fat and fifty, was Lewis. He was a broken skipper. John Barleycorn had thrown him, and he was winding up his career where he had begun it, in the forecastle. His case made quite an impression on me. John Barleycorn did other things besides kill a man. He hadn't killed Lewis. He had done much worse. He had robbed him of power and place and comfort crucified his pride, and condemned him to the hardship of the common sailor that would last as long as his healthy breath lasted, which promised to be for a long time. We completed our run across the Pacific, lifted the volcanic peaks, jungle-clad, of the Bonin Islands, sailed in among the reefs to the landlocked harbor, and let our ankle rumble down where lay a score or more of sea gypsies like ourselves. The scents of strange vegetation blew off the tropic land. Aborigines in queer outrigger canoes and Japanese in queerer sampans paddled about the bay and came aboard. It was my first foreign land. I had won to the other side of the world, and I would see all I had read in the books come true. I was wild to get ashore. Victor and Axel, a Swede and a Norwegian, and I planned to keep together. And so well did we that for the rest of the cruise we were known as the Three Sports. Victor pointed out a pathway that disappeared up a wild canyon, emerged on a steep bare lava slope, and thereafter appeared and disappeared ever climbing among the palms and flowers. We would go over that path, he said, and we agreed, and we would see beautiful scenery and strange native villages and find, heaven alone knew, what adventure at the end. And Axel was keen to go fishing. The three of us agreed to that, too. We would get a sampan and a couple of Japanese fishermen who knew the fishing grounds, and we would have great sport. As for me, I was keen for anything. And then, our plans made, we rowed ashore over the banks of living coral and pulled our boat up the white beach of coral sand. We walked across the fringe of beach under the coconut palms and into the little town and found several hundred riotous seamen from all the world drinking prodigiously, singing prodigiously, dancing prodigiously, and all on the main street to the scandal of a helpless handful of Japanese police. Victor and Axel said that we'd have a drink before we started on our long walk. Could I decline to drink with these two chesty shipmates? Drinking together, glass in hand, put the seal on comradeship. It was the way of life. Our teetotaler, owner captain, was laughed at and sneered at by all of us because of his teetotalism. I didn't in the least want a drink, but I did want to be a good fellow and a good comrade. 
nor did Lewis's case deter me as I poured the biting, scorching stuff down my throat. John Barleycorn had thrown Lewis to a nasty fall, but I was young. My blood ran full and red. I had a constitution of iron. And, well, youth ever grins scornfully at the wreckage of age. Queer, fierce, alcoholic stuff it was that we drank. There was no telling where or how it had been manufactured. Some native concoction, most likely. But it was hot as fire, pale as water, and quick as death with its kick. It had been filled into empty square-faced bottles which had once contained Holland gin and which still bore the fitting legend, Anchor Brand. It certainly anchored us. We never got out of the town. We never went fishing in the sampan. And though we were there ten days, we never trod that wild path along the lava cliffs and among the flowers. We met old acquaintances from other schooners, fellows we had met in the saloons of San Francisco before we sailed, and each meeting meant a drink, and there was much to talk about, and more drinks, and songs to be sung, and pranks and antics to be performed until the maggots of imagination began to crawl. And it all seemed great and wonderful to me, these lusty, hard-bitten sea-rovers, of whom I made one, gathered in with sail on a coral strand. Old lines about knights at table in the great banquet halls, and of those above the salt and below the salt, and of Vikings feasting fresh from sea and ripe for battle, came to me. And I knew that the old times were not dead, and that we belonged to that self-same ancient breed. By mid-afternoon Victor went mad with drink, and wanted to fight everybody and everything. I have since seen lunatics in the violent wards of asylums that seemed to behave in no wise different from Victor's way, save that perhaps he was more violent. Axel and I interfered as peacemakers, were roughed and jostled in the mix-ups, and finally, with infinite precaution and intoxicated cunning, succeeded in inveigling our chum down to the boat and in rowing him aboard our schooner. But no sooner did Victor's feet touch the deck than he began to clean up the ship. He had the strength of several men, and he ran amuck with it. I remember especially one man whom he got into the chain boxes but failed to damage through inability to hit him. The man dodged and ducked, and Victor broke all the knuckles of both his fists against the huge links of the anchor chain. By the time we dragged him out of that, his madness had shifted to the belief that he was a great swimmer, and the next moment he was overboard and demonstrating his ability by floundering like a sick porpoise and swallowing much sea water. We rescued him, and by the time we got him below, undressed and into his bunk, we were wrecks ourselves. But Axel and I wanted to see more of shore, and away we went, leaving Victor snoring. It was curious, the judgment passed on Victor by his shipmates, drinkers themselves. They shook their heads disapprovingly and muttered, a man like that oughtn't to drink. Now Victor was the smartest sailor and best-tempered shipmate in the forecastle. 
He was an all-around splendid type of seaman. His mates recognized his worth and respected him and liked him. Yet John Barleycorn metamorphosed him into a violent lunatic. And that was the very point these drinkers made. They knew that drink, and drink with a sailor is always excessive, made them mad, but only mildly mad. Violent madness was objectionable because it spoiled the fun of others and often culminated in tragedy. From their standpoint, mild madness was all right, but from the standpoint of the whole human race, is not all madness objectionable? And is there a greater maker of madness of all sorts than John Barleycorn? But to return. Ashore, snugly ensconced in a Japanese house of entertainment, Axel and I compared bruises, and over a comfortable drink, talked of the afternoon's happenings. We liked the quietness of that drink and took another. A shipmate dropped in, several shipmates dropped in, and we had more quiet drinks. Finally, just as we had engaged a Japanese orchestra, and as the first strains of the Samasens and Takos were rising, through the paper walls came a wild howl from the street. We recognized it. Still howling, disdaining doorway, with bloodshot eyes and wildly waving muscular arms, Victor burst upon us through the fragile walls. The old amuck rage was on him, and he wanted blood, anybody's blood. The orchestra fled, so did we. We went through doorways, and we went through paper walls, anything to get away. And after the place was half-wrecked, and we had agreed to pay the damage, leaving Victor partly subdued and showing symptoms of lapsing into a comatose state, Axel and I wandered away in quest of a quieter drinking place. The main street was a madness. Hundreds of sailors rollicked up and down. Because the chief of police with his small force was helpless, the governor of the colony had issued orders to the captains to have all their men on board by sunset. What? to be treated in such a fashion as the news spread among the schooners they were emptied everybody came ashore men who had had no intention of coming ashore climbed into the boats the unfortunate governor's ukaz had precipitated a general debauch for all hands it was hours after sunset and the men wanted to see anybody try to put them on board. They went around inviting the authorities to try to put them on board. In front of the governor's house they were gathered thickest, bawling sea songs, circulating square faces, and dancing uproarious Virginia reels and old country dances. The police, including the reserves, stood in little forlorn groups, waiting for the command the governor was too wise to issue. And I thought this Saturnalia was great. It was like the old days of the Spanish Main come back. It was license. It was adventure. And I was part of it a chesty sea rover along with all these other chesty sea rovers among the paper houses of japan the governor never issued the order to clear the streets and axel and i wandered on from drink to drink 
after a time in some of the antics getting hazy myself i lost him i drifted along making new acquaintances downing more drinks getting hazier and hazier i remember somewhere sitting in a circle with japanese fishermen kanaka boat steerers from our own vessels and a young danish sailor fresh from cowboying in the argentine and with a penchant for native customs and ceremonials and with due and proper and most intricate japanese ceremonial we of the circle drank sake pale mild and lukewarm from tiny porcelain bowls and later i remember the runaway apprentices boys of eighteen and twenty of middle-class english families who had jumped their ships and apprenticeships in various ports of the world and drifted into the forecastles of the sealing schooners they were healthy smooth-skinned clear-eyed and they were young youths like me learning the way of their feet in the world of men and they were men no mild sacky for them but square faces illicitly refilled with corrosive fire that flamed through their veins and burst into conflagrations in their heads i remember a melting song they sang the refrain of which was tis but a little golden ring i give it to thee with pride wear it for your mother's sake when you are on the tide they wept over it as they sang it the graceless young scamps who had all broken their mother's prides and i sang with them and wept with them and luxuriated in the pathos and the tragedy of it and struggled to make glimmering inebriated generalizations on life and romance and one last picture i have standing out very clear and bright in the midst of vagueness before and blackness afterwards we the apprentices and i are swaying and clinging to one another under the stars we are singing a rollicking sea song all save one who sits on the ground and weeps and we are marking the rhythm with waving square faces from up and down the street come far choruses of sea voices similarly singing and life is great and beautiful and romantic and magnificently mad and next after the blackness i open my eyes in the early dawn to see a japanese woman solicitously anxious bending over me she is the port pilot's wife and i am lying in her doorway i am chilled and shivering sick with the after sickness of debauch and i feel lightly clad these rascals of runaway apprentices they have acquired the habit of running away they have run away with my possessions my watch is gone my few dollars are gone my coat is gone so is my belt and yes my shoes and the foregoing is a sample of the ten days i spent in the bonin islands victor got over his lunacy rejoined axel and me and after that we caroused somewhat more discreetly and we never climbed that lava path among the flowers 
The town and the square faces were all we knew. One who has been burned by fire must preach about the fire. I might have seen and healthily enjoyed a whole lot more of the Bonin Islands if I had done what I ought to have done. But, as I see it, it is not a matter of what one ought to do or ought not to do, it is what one does do. That is the everlasting, irrefragible fact. I did just what I did. I did what all those men did in the Bonin Islands. I did what millions of men over the world were doing at that particular point in time. I did it because the way led to it, because I was only a human boy, a creature of my environment, and neither an anemic nor a god. I was just human, and I was taking the path in the world that men took. Men whom I admired, if you please, full-blooded men, lusty, breedy, chesty men, free spirits, and anything but niggards in the way they foamed life away. And the way was open. It was like an uncovered well in a yard where children play. It is small use to tell the brave little boys toddling their way along with knowledge of life that they mustn't play near the uncovered well. They will play near it. Any parent knows that. And we know that a certain percentage of them, the livest and most daring, will fall into the well. The thing to do, we all know it, is to cover up the well. The case is the same with John Barleycorn. All the no-saying and no-preaching in the world will fail to keep men and youths growing into manhood away from John Barleycorn when John Barleycorn is everywhere accessible. And where John Barleycorn is everywhere, the connotation of manliness and daring and great-spiritedness. The only rational thing for the twentieth-century folk to do is to cover up the well. To make the twentieth century in truth the twentieth century, and to relate to the nineteenth century and all the preceding centuries the things of those centuries, the witch-burnings, the intolerances, the fetishes, and not least among such barbarisms, John Barleycorn. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 North we raced from the Bonin Islands to pick up the seal herd, and north we hunted it for a hundred days into frosty mitten weather and into and through vast fogs which hid the sun from us for a week at a time. It was wild and heavy work without a drink or thought of drink. Then we sailed south to Yokohama with a big catch of skins in our salt and a heavy payday coming. I was eager to be ashore and see Japan, but the first day was devoted to ship's work, and not until evening did we sailors land. And here, by the very system of things, by the way life was organized and men transacted affairs, John Barleycorn reached out and tucked my arm in his. The captain had given money for us to the hunters, and the hunters were waiting in a certain Japanese public house for us to come and get it. We rode to the place in rickshaws. Our own crowd had taken possession of it drink was flowing everybody had money and everybody was treating 
After the hundred days of hard toil and absolute abstinence, in the pink of physical condition, bulging with health, overspilling with spirits that had long been pent by discipline and circumstance, of course we would have a drink or two. And after that, we would see the town. It was the old story. There were so many drinks to be drunk, and as the warm magic poured through our veins and mellowed our voices and affections, we knew it was no time to make invidious distinctions, to drink with this shipmate and to decline to drink with that shipmate. We were all shipmates who had been through stress and storm together, who had pulled and hauled on the same sheets and tackles, relieved one another's wheels, laid out side by side on the same jib-boom when she was plunging into it, and looked to see who was missing when she cleared and lifted. So we drank with all, and all treated, and our voices rose, and we remembered a myriad kindly acts of comradeship, and forgot our fights and wordy squabbles, and knew one another for the best fellows in the world. Well, the night was young when we arrived in that public house, and for all of that first night, that public house was what I saw of Japan, a drinking place which was very like a drinking place at home, or anywhere else over the world. We lay in Yokohama Harbor for two weeks, and about all we saw of Japan was its drinking places where sailors congregated. Occasionally, some one of us varied the monotony with a more exciting drunk. In such fashion, I managed a real exploit by swimming off to the schooner one dark midnight and going soundly to sleep while the water police searched the harbor for my body and brought my clothes out for identification. Perhaps it was for things like that, I imagined, that men got drunk. In our little round of living, what I had done was a noteworthy event. All the harbor talked about it. I enjoyed several days of fame among the Japanese boatmen and ashore in the pubs. It was a red-letter event. It was an event to be remembered and narrated with pride. I remember it today, twenty years afterward, with a secret glow of pride. It was a purple passage, just as Victor's wrecking of the tea house in the Bone-In Islands and my being looted by the runaway apprentices were purple passages. The point is that the charm of John Barleycorn was still a mystery to me. I was so organically a non-alcoholic that alcohol itself made no appeal. The chemical reactions it produced in me were not satisfying because I possessed no need for such chemical satisfaction. I drank because the men I was with drank and because my nature was such that I could not permit myself to be less of a man than other men at their favorite pastime, and I still had a sweet tooth, and on privy occasions when there was no man to see, bought candy and blissfully devoured it. We hove up anchor to a jolly shanty, and sailed out of Yokohama Harbor for San Francisco. We took the northern passage, and with the stout west wind at our back, made the run across the Pacific in thirty-seven days of brave sailing. We still had a big payday coming to us, and for thirty-seven days, Without a drink to addle our mental processes, we incessantly planned the spending of our money. 
the first statement of each man ever an ancient one in homeward bound forecastles was no boarding house sharks in mine next in parentheses was regret at having spent so much money in yokohama and after that each man proceeded to paint his favorite phantom victor for instance said that immediately he landed in san francisco he would pass right through the waterfront and the barbary coast and put an advertisement in the papers his advertisement would be for board and room in some simple working-class family then said victor i shall go to some dancing school for a week or two just to meet and get acquainted with the girls and fellows then i'll get the run of the different dancing crowds and be invited to their homes and to parties and all that and with the money i've got i can last out till next january when i'll go sealing again no he wasn't going to drink he knew the way of it particularly his way of it wine in wit out and his money would be gone in no time he had his choice based on bitter experience between three days debauch amongst the sharps and harpies of the barbary coast and a whole winter of wholesome enjoyment and sociability and there wasn't any doubt of the way he was going to choose said axel gunderson who didn't care for dancing and social functions i've got a good payday now i can go home it's fifteen years since i've seen my mother and all the family when i pay off i shall send my money home to wait for me then i'll pick a good ship bound for europe and arrive there with another payday put them together and i'll have more money than ever in my life before i'll be a prince at home you haven't any idea how cheap everything is in norway i can make presents to everybody and spend my money like what would seem to them a millionaire and live a whole year there before i'd have to go back to sea the very thing i'm going to do declared red john it's three years since i've received a line from home and ten years since i was there things are just as cheap in sweden axel as in norway and my folks are real country folk and farmers i'll send my payday home and ship on the same ship with you for around the horn we'll pick a good one and as axel gunderson and red john painted the pastoral delights and festive customs of their respective countries each fell in love with the other's home place and they solemnly pledged to make the journey together and to spend together six months in the one swedish home and six months in the other's norwegian home and for the rest of the voyage they could hardly be pried apart so infatuated did they become with discussing their plans long john was not a homebody but he was tired of the forecastle no boarding-house sharks in his he too would get a room in a quiet family and he would go to a navigation school and study to be a captain and so it went each man swore that for once he would be sensible and not squander his money no boarding-house sharks no sailor town no drink was the slogan of our forecastle the men became stingy never was there such economy they refused to buy anything more from the slop chest old rags had to last and they sewed patch upon patch turning out what are called homeward bound patches of the most amazing proportions they saved on matches even 
waiting till two or three were ready to light their pipes from the same match. As we sailed up the San Francisco waterfront, the moment the port doctors passed us, the boarding-house runners were alongside in Whitehall boats. They swarmed on board, each drumming for his own boarding-house, and each with a bottle of free whiskey inside his shirt. But we waved them grandly and blasphemously away. We wanted none of their boarding-houses and none of their whiskey. We were sober, thrifty sailor-men with better use for our money. Came the paying off before the shipping commissioner. We emerged upon the sidewalk, each with a pocketful of money. And we looked at each other. We had been seven months together, and our paths were separating. One last farewell rite of comradeship remained. Oh, it was the way, the custom. Come on, boys, said our sailing master. There stood the inevitable adjacent saloon. There were a dozen saloons all around. And when we had followed the sailing master into the one of his choice, the sharks were thick on the sidewalk outside. Some of them even ventured inside, but we would have nothing to do with them. Then we stood at the long bar, the sailing master, the mate, the six hunters, the six boat steerers, and the five boat pullers. There were only five of the last, for one of our number had been dropped overboard with a sack of coal at his feet between two snow squalls in a driving gale off Cape Jeremo. There were nineteen of us, and it was to be our last drink together. With seven months of men's work in the world, blow high, blow low, behind us, we were looking on each other for the last time. We knew it, for sailors' ways go wide. And the nineteen of us drank the sailing master's treat. Then the mate looked at us with eloquent eyes and called another round. We liked the mate just as well as the sailing master, and we liked them both. Could we drink with one and not the other? And Pete Holt, my own hunter, lost next year in the Mary Thomas with all hands, called around. The time passed. The drinks continued to come on the bar. Our voices rose and the maggots began to crawl. There were six hunters, and each insisted in the sacred name of comradeship that all hands drink with him just once. There were six boat steerers and five boat pullers, and the same logic held with them. There was money in all our pockets, and our money was as good as any man's, and our hearts were as free and generous. Nineteen rounds of drinks. What more would John Barleycorn ask in order to have his will with men? They were ripe to forget their clearly cherished plans. They rolled out of the saloon and into the arms of the sharks and harpies. They didn't last long. From two days to a week, saw the end of their money, and saw them being carted by the boarding-house masters on board outward-bound ships. Victor was a fine body of a man, and through a lucky friendship managed to get into the life-saving service. He never saw the dancing school, nor placed his advertisement for a room in a working-class family. Nor did Long John win to navigation school. By the end of the week he was a transient lumper on a river steamboat. 
Red John and Axel did not send their paydays home to the old country. Instead, and along with the rest, they were scattered on board sailing ships bound for the four quarters of the globe, where they had been placed by the boarding house masters, and where they were working out advance money which they had neither seen nor spent. What saved me was that I had a home and people to go to. I crossed the bay to Oakland, and among other things, took a look at the death road. Nelson was gone, shot to death while drunk and resisting the officers. His partner in that affair was lying in prison. Whiskey Bob was gone. Old Cole, Old Smooge, and Bob Smith were gone. Another Smith, he of the belted guns and the Annie, was drowned. French Frank, they said, was lurking up river, afraid to come down because of something he had done. Others were wearing the stripes in San Quentin or Folsom. Big Alec, the king of the Greeks, whom I had known well in the old Benicia days, and with whom I had drunk whole nights through, had killed two men and fled to foreign parts. Fitzsimmons, with whom I had sailed on the fish patrol, had been stabbed in the lung through the back, and had died a lingering death complicated with tuberculosis. And so it went, a very lively and well-patronized road. And from what I knew of all of them, John Barleycorn was responsible, with the sole exception of Smith of the Annie. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 My infatuation for the Oakland waterfront was quite dead. I didn't like the looks of it, nor the life. I didn't care for the drinking, nor the vagrancy of it, and I wandered back to the Oakland Free Library and read the books with great understanding. Then, too, my mother said I had sown my wild oats, and it was time I settled down to a regular job. Also, the family needed the money. So I got a job at the jute mills, a ten-hour day at ten cents an hour. Despite my increase in strength and general efficiency, I was receiving no more than when I worked in the cannery several years before. But then there was a promise of a rise to a dollar and a quarter a day after a few months. And here, so far as John Barleycorn is concerned, began a period of innocence. I did not know what it was to take a drink from month end to month end. Not yet eighteen years old, healthy and with labor hardened but unhurt muscles, like any young animal I needed diversion, excitement, something beyond the books and the mechanical toil. I strayed into young men's Christian associations. The life there was healthful and athletic, but too juvenile. For me, it was too late. I was not boy nor youth, despite my paucity of years. I had bucked big with men. I knew mysterious and violent things. I was from the other side of life so far as concerned the young men I encountered in the YMCA. I spoke another language, possessed a sadder and more terrible wisdom. When I come to think it over, I realize now that I have never had a boyhood. At any rate, the YMCA young men were too juvenile for me, too unsophisticated. This I would not have minded could they have met me and helped me mentally. But I had got more out of the books than they. Their meager physical experiences 
plus their meagre intellectual experiences, made a negative sum so vast that it overbalanced their wholesome morality and healthful sports. In short, I couldn't play with the pupils of a lower grade. All the clean, splendid young life that was theirs was denied me, thanks to my earlier tutelage under John Barleycorn. I knew too much too young. And yet, in the good time coming, when alcohol is eliminated from the needs and the institutions of men, it will be the YMCA and similar unthinkably better and wiser and more virile congregating places that will receive the men who now go to saloons to find themselves and one another. In the meantime, we live today, here and now, and we discuss today, here and now. I was working ten hours a day in the jute mills. It was humdrum machine toil. I wanted life. I wanted to realize myself in other ways than at a machine for ten cents an hour. And yet I had had my fill of saloons. I wanted something new. I was growing up. I was developing unguessed and troubling potencies and proclivities. And at this very stage, fortunately, I met Louis Shattuck, and we became chums. Louis Shattuck, without one vicious trait, was a real innocently devilish young fellow who was quite convinced that he was a sophisticated town boy and i wasn't a town boy at all lewis was handsome and graceful and filled with love for the girls with him it was an exciting and all-absorbing pursuit i didn't know anything about girls i had been too busy being a man this was an entirely new phase of existence which had escaped me. And when I saw Lewis say good-bye to me, raise his hat to a girl of his acquaintance, and walk on with her side by side down the sidewalk, I was made excited and envious. I, too, wanted to play this game. Well, there's only one thing to do, said Lewis and that is, you must get a girl. Which is more difficult than it sounds. Let me show you at the expense of a slight going aside. Lewis did not know girls in their home life. He had the entree to no girl's home. And of course I, a stranger to this new world, was similarly circumstanced. But first, Lewis and I were unable to go to dancing schools or to public dances, which were very good places for getting acquainted. We didn't have the money. He was a blacksmith's apprentice and was earning but slightly more than I. We both lived at home and paid our way. When we had done this and bought our cigarettes and the inevitable clothes and shoes, there remained to each of us for personal spending a sum that varied between seventy cents and a dollar for the week. We whacked this up, shared it, and sometimes loaned all of what was left of it when one of us needed it for some more gorgeous girl adventure, such as car fare out to Blair's Park and back, twenty cents, bang, just like that, and ice cream for two, thirty cents, or tamales in a tamale parlor, which came cheaper and which for two cost only twenty cents. I did not mind this money meagerness. The disdain I had learned for money from the oyster pirates had never left me. I didn't care overweeningly for it for personal gratification. And in my philosophy, I completed the circle. 
finding myself as equable with the lack of a ten-cent piece as I was with the squandering of scores of dollars in calling all men and hangers-on up to the bar to drink with me. But how to get a girl? There was no girl's home to which Lewis could take me and where I might be introduced to girls. I knew none, and Lewis's several girls he wanted for himself. And anyway, in the very human nature of boys' and girls' ways, he couldn't turn any of them over to me. He did persuade them to bring girlfriends for me, but I found them weak sisters, pale and ineffectual alongside the choice specimens he had. You'll have to do like I did, he said finally. I got there by getting them. You'll have to get one the same way. And he initiated me. It must be remembered that Lewis and I were hard situated. We really had to struggle to pay our board and maintain a decent appearance. We met each other in the evening after the day's work on the street corner or in a little candy store on a side street, our sole frequenting place. Here we bought our cigarettes and, occasionally, a nickel's worth of red hots. Oh, yes, Lewis and I unblushingly ate candy, all we could get. Neither of us drank, neither of us ever went into a saloon. But the girl. In quite primitive fashion, as Lewis advised me, I was to select her and make myself acquainted with her. We strolled the streets in the early evenings. The girls, like us, strolled in pairs. And strolling girls will look at strolling boys who look. And to this day, in any town, city, or village in which I, in my middle age, find myself, I look on with the eye trained of old experience and watch the sweet innocent game played by the strolling boys and girls who just must stroll when the spring and summer evenings call. The trouble was that in this Arcadian phase of my history, I, who had come through case-hardened from the other side of life, was timid and bashful. Again and again Lewis nerved me up. But I didn't know girls. They were strange and wonderful to me after my precious man's life. I failed of the bold front and the necessary forwardness when the crucial moment came. Then Lewis would show me how. A certain eloquent glance of eye a smile, a daring, a lifted hat, a spoken word, hesitancies, giggles, coy nervousness, and, behold, Lewis acquainted and nodding me up to be introduced. But when we paired off to stroll along, boy and girl together, I noted that Lewis invariably picked the good looker and left me the little lame sister. I improved, of course, after experiences too numerous to enter upon, so that there were diverse girls to whom I could lift my hat and who would walk beside me in the early evenings. But girls' love did not immediately come to me. I was excited, interested, and I pursued the quest. And the thought of drink never entered my mind. Some of Lewis's and my adventures have since given me serious pause when casting sociological generalizations. But it was all good and innocently youthful, and I learned one generalization, biological rather than sociological, namely, that the Colonel's Lady and Judy O'Grady are sisters under their skins. 
and before long I learned girls' love, all the dear fond deliciousness of it, all the glory and the wonder. I shall call her Haiti. She was between fifteen and sixteen. Her little skirt reached her shoe tops. We sat side by side in a Salvation Army meeting. She was not a convert, nor was her aunt who sat on the other side of her, and who, visiting from the country when at that time the Salvation Army was not, had dropped in to the meeting for half an hour out of curiosity. And Lewis sat beside me and observed, I do believe he did no more than observe, because Haiti was not his style of girl. We did not speak, but in that great half hour we glanced shyly at each other and shyly avoided or as shyly returned and met each other's glances more than several times. She had a slender oval face. Her brown eyes were beautiful. Her nose was a dream, as was her sweet-lipped, petulant-hinting mouth. She wore a tam shanter and I thought her brown hair the prettiest shade of brown I had ever seen. And from that single experience of half an hour, I have ever since been convinced of the reality of love at first sight. All too soon the aunt and Haiti departed. This is permissible at any stage of a Salvation Army meeting. I was no longer interested in the meeting, and after an appropriate interval of a couple of minutes or less, started to leave with Lewis. As we passed out, at the back of the hall, a woman recognized me with her eyes, arose, and followed me. I shall not describe her. She was of my own kind and friendship of the old time on the waterfront. When Nelson was shot, he had died in her arms, and she knew me as his one comrade. And she must tell me how Nelson had died, and I did want to know. So I went with her across the width of life, from dawning boy's love for a brown-haired girl in a tam shanter back to the old sad savagery I had known. And when I had heard the tale, I hurried away to find Lewis, fearing that I had lost my first love with the first glimpse of her. But Lewis was dependable. Her name was Haiti. He knew where she lived. Each day she passed the blacksmith's shop where he worked, going to and from the Lafayette School. Further, he had seen her on occasion with Ruth, another schoolgirl, and still further, Nita, who sold us red hots at the candy store, was a friend of Ruth. The thing to do was to go around to the candy store and see if we could get Nita to give a note to Ruth to give to Haiti. If this could be arranged, all I had to do was write the note. And it so happened. And in stolen half hours of meeting, I came to know all the sweet madness of boys' love and girls' love. So far as it goes, it is not the biggest love in the world, but I do dare to assert that it is the sweetest. Oh, as I look back on it, never did girl have more innocent boy lover than I who had been so wicked wise and violent beyond my years. I didn't know the first thing about girls. I who had been hailed prince of the oyster pirates, who could go anywhere in the world as a man amongst men, who could sail boats, lay aloft in black and storm, or go into the toughest hangouts in Sailor Town and play my part in any rough house that started or call all hands to the bar, 
I didn't know the first thing I might say or do with this slender little chit of a girl woman whose scant skirt just reached her shoe tops and who was as abysmally ignorant of life as I was, or thought I was, profoundly wise. I remembered we sat on a bench in the starlight. There was fully a foot of space between us. We slightly faced each other, our near elbows on the back of the bench, and once or twice our elbows just touched. And all the time, deliriously happy, talking in the gentlest and most delicate terms that might not offend her sensitive ears, I was cudgeling my brains in an effort to divine what I was expected to do. What did girls expect of boys, sitting on a bench and tentatively striving to find out what love was? What did she expect me to do? Was I expected to kiss her? Did she expect me to try? And if she did expect me, and I didn't, what would she think of me? Ah, she was wiser than I. I know it now, the little innocent girl woman in her shoe-top skirt. She had known boys all her life. She encouraged me in the ways a girl may. Her gloves were off and in one hand, and I remember, lightly and daringly, in mock reproof for something I had said, how she tapped my lips with a tiny flirt of those gloves. I was like to swoon with delight. It was the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to me. And I remember yet the faint scent that clung to those gloves and that I breathed in the moment they touched my lips. Then came the agony of apprehension and doubt. Should I imprison in my hand that little hand with the dangling scented gloves which had just tapped my lips? Should I dare to kiss her there and then, or slip my arm around her waist, or dared I even sit closer. Well, I didn't dare. I did nothing. I merely continued to sit there and love with all my soul. And when we parted that evening, I had not kissed her. I do remember the first time I kissed her, on another evening at parting, a mighty moment, when I took all my heart of courage and dared. We never succeeded in managing more than a dozen stolen meetings, and we kissed perhaps a dozen times, as boys and girls kiss, briefly and innocently and wonderingly. We never went anywhere, not even to a matinee. We once shared together five cents worth of red hots. But I have always fondly believed that she loved me. I know I loved her. And I dreamed daydreams of her for a year or more. And the memory of her is very dear. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 When I was with people who did not drink, I never thought of drinking. Lewis did not drink. Neither he nor I could afford it, but more significant than that, we had no desire to drink. We were healthy, normal, non-alcoholic. Had we been alcoholic, we would have drunk whether or not we could have afforded it. Each night after the day's work, washed up, clothes changed, and supper eaten, we met on the street corner or in the little candy store. But the warm fall weather passed, and on bitter nights of frost or damp nights of drizzle, the street corner was not a comfortable meeting place 
and the candy store was unheated. Nita, or whoever waited on the counter, between waitings lurked in a back living room that was heated. We were not admitted to this room, and in the store it was as cold as out of doors. Lewis and I debated the situation. There was only one solution. The saloon, the congregating place of men, the place where men hobnobbed with John Barleycorn. Well do I remember the damp and drafty evening, shivering without overcoats because we could not afford them, that Lewis and I started out to select our saloon. Saloons are always warm and comfortable. Now Lewis and I did not go into this saloon because we wanted a drink, yet we knew that saloons were not charitable institutions. A man could not make a lounging place of a saloon without occasionally buying something over the bar. Our dimes and nickels were few. We could ill spare any of them when they were so potent in paying car fare for oneself and a girl. We never paid car fare when by ourselves, being content to walk. So in this saloon we desired to make the most of our expenditure. We called for a deck of cards and sat down at a table and played euchre for an hour, in which time Lewis treated once, and I treated once, to beer, the cheapest drink, ten cents for two. Prodigal! How we grudged it! We studied the men who came into the place. They seemed all middle-aged and elderly workmen, most of them German, who flocked by themselves in old acquaintance groups, and with whom we could have only the slightest contacts. We voted against that saloon, and went out cast down with the knowledge that we had lost an evening and wanted twenty cents for beer that we didn't want. We made several more tries on succeeding nights, and at last found our way into the National, a saloon on Tenth and Franklin. Here was a more congenial crowd. Here Lewis met a fellow or two he knew, and here I met fellows I had gone to school with when a little lad in knee pants. We talked of old days and of what had become of this fellow and what that fellow was doing now, and of course we talked it over drinks. They treated and we drank. Then, according to the code of drinking, we had to treat. It hurt for it meant forty to fifty cents a clatter. We felt quite enlivened when the short evening was over, but at the same time we were bankrupt. Our week spending money was gone. We decided that that was the saloon for us, and we agreed to be more circumspect thereafter in our drink buying. Also, we had to economize for the rest of the week. We didn't even have car fare. We were compelled to break an engagement with two girls from West Oakland with whom we were attempting to be in love. They were to meet us uptown the next evening, and we hadn't the car fare necessary to take them home. Like many others financially embarrassed, we had to disappear for a time from the gay world, at least until Saturday night payday. So Lewis and I rendezvoused in a livery stable, and with coats buttoned and chattering teeth, played euchre and casino until the time of our exile was over. Then we returned to the National Saloon and spent no more than we could decently avoid spending for the comfort and warmth. Sometimes we had mishaps, 
as when one got stuck twice in succession in a five-handed game of Sancho Pedro for the drinks. Such a disaster meant anywhere between 25 to 80 cents, just according to how many of the players ordered 10-cent drinks. But we could temporarily escape the evil effects of such disaster by virtue of an account we ran behind the bar. Of course, this only set back the day of reckoning and seduced us into spending more than we could have spent on a cash basis. When I left Oakland suddenly for the adventure path the following spring, I well remember I owed that saloon keeper one dollar and seventy cents. Long after, when I returned, he was gone. I still owe him that dollar and seventy cents, and if he should chance to read these lines, I want him to know that I'll pay on demand. The foregoing incident of the National Saloon I have given in order again to show the lure, or draw, or compulsion toward John Barleycorn in society as at present organized with saloons on all the corners. Lewis and I were two healthy youths. We didn't want to drink. We couldn't afford to drink. And yet we were driven by the circumstance of cold and rainy weather to seek refuge in a saloon where we had to spend part of our pitiful dole for drink. It will be urged by some critics that we might have gone to the YMCA, to night school, and to the social circles and homes of young people. The only reply is that we didn't. That is the irrefragible fact. We didn't. And today, at this moment, there are hundreds of thousands of boys like Lewis and me doing just what Lewis and I did with John Barleycorn, warm and comfortable, beckoning and welcoming, tucking their arms in his and beginning to teach them his mellow ways. Chapter 20 The jute mills failed of its agreement to increase my pay to a dollar and a quarter a day, and I, a free-born American boy whose direct ancestors had fought in all the wars from the old pre-revolutionary Indian wars down, exercised my sovereign right of free contract by quitting the job. I was still resolved to settle down, and I looked about me. One thing was clear. Unskilled labor didn't pay. I must learn a trade, and I decided on electricity. The need for electricians was constantly growing. But how to become an electrician? I hadn't the money to go to a technical school or university. Besides, I didn't think much of schools. I was a practical man in a practical world. Also, I still believed in the old myths which were the heritage of the American boy when I was a boy. A canal boy could become a president. Any boy who took employment with any firm could, by thrift, energy, and sobriety, learn the business and rise from position to position until he was taken in as a junior partner. After that, the senior partnership was only a matter of time. Very often, so ran the myth, the boy, by reason of his steadiness and application, married his employer's daughter. By this time, I had been encouraged to such faith in myself in the matter of girls that I was quite certain I would marry my employer's daughter. There wasn't a doubt of it. All the little boys in the myths did it as soon as they were old enough. 
so I bade farewell forever to the adventure path, and went out to the power plant of one of our Oakland Street railways. I saw the superintendent himself in a private office so fine that it almost stunned me. But I talked straight up. I told him I wanted to become a practical electrician, that I was unafraid of work, that I was used to hard work, and that all he had to do was look at me to see I was fit and strong. I told him that I wanted to begin right at the bottom and work up, that I wanted to devote my life to this one occupation and this one employment. The superintendent beamed as he listened. He told me that I was the right stuff for success, and that he believed in encouraging American youth that wanted to rise. Why, employers were always on the lookout for young fellows like me, and alas, they found them all too rarely. My ambition was fine and worthy, and he would see to it that I got my chance. And as I listened with swelling heart, I wondered if it was his daughter I was to marry. Before you can go out on the road and learn the more complicated and higher details of the profession, he said, you will, of course, have to work in the car house with the men who install and repair the motors. By this time, I was sure that it was his daughter, and I was wondering how much stock he might own in the company. But, he said, as you yourself so plainly see, you couldn't expect to begin as a helper to the carhouse electricians. That will come when you have worked up to it. You will really begin at the bottom. In the car house, your first employment will be sweeping up, washing the windows, keeping things clean. And after you have shown yourself satisfactory at that, then you may become a helper to the car house electricians. I didn't see how sweeping and scrubbing a building was any preparation for the trade of electrician, but I did know that in the books all the boys started with the most menial tasks, and by making good ultimately won to the ownership of the whole concern. When shall I come to work? I asked, eager to launch on this dazzling career. But, said the superintendent, as you and I have already agreed, you must begin at the bottom. Not immediately can you in any capacity enter the car house. Before that you must pass through the engine room as an oiler. My heart went down slightly, and for the moment, as I saw the road lengthen between his daughter and me, then it rose again. I would be a better electrician with knowledge of steam engines. As an oiler in the great engine room, I was confident that few things concerning steam would escape me. Heavens! My career shone more dazzling than ever. When shall I come to work? I asked gratefully. But, said the superintendent, you could not expect to enter immediately into the engine room. There must be preparation for that. And through the fire room, of course. Come, you see the matter clearly, I know and you will see that even the mere handling of coal it is a scientific matter and not to be sneered at. Do you know that we weigh every pound of coal we burn? Thus we learn the value of the coal we buy. We know to a T the last penny of cost of every item of production, 
and we learn which firemen are the most wasteful, which firemen, out of stupidity or carelessness, get the least out of the coal they fire. The superintendent beamed again. You see how very important the little matter of coal is, and by as much as you learn of this little matter, you will become that much better a workman, more valuable to us, more valuable to yourself. Now, are you prepared to begin? Any time, I said valiantly, the sooner the better. Very well, he answered. You will come tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. I was taken out and shown my duties. Also, I was told the terms of my employment. A ten-hour day, every day in the month, including Sundays and holidays, with one day off each month, with a salary of thirty dollars a month. It wasn't exciting. Years before at the cannery, I had earned a dollar a day for a ten-hour day. I consoled myself with the thought that the reason my earning capacity had not increased with my years and strength was because I had remained an unskilled laborer. But it was different now. I was beginning to work for skill, for a trade, for career and fortune, and the superintendent's daughter. And I was beginning in the right way, right at the beginning. That was the thing. I was passing coal to the fireman, who shoveled it into the furnaces, where its energy was transformed into steam which, in the engine room, was transformed into the electricity with which the electricians worked. This passing coal was purely the very beginning, unless the superintendent should take it into his head to send me to work in the mines from which the coal came in order to get a completer understanding of the genesis of electricity for street railways. Work! I, who had worked with men, found that I didn't know the first thing about real work. A ten-hour day! I had to pass coal for the day and night shifts, and despite working through the noon hour, I never finished my task before eight at night. I was working a twelve or thirteen hour day, and I wasn't being paid overtime as in the cannery. I might as well give the secret away right here. I was doing the work of two men. Before me, one mature, able-bodied laborer had done the day shift, and another equally mature, able-bodied laborer had done the night shift. They had received forty dollars a month each. The superintendent, bent on an economical administration, had persuaded me to do the work of both men for thirty dollars a month. I thought he was making an electrician of me. In truth and fact, he was saving fifty dollars a month operating expenses to the company. But I didn't know I was displacing two men. Nobody told me. On the contrary, the superintendent warned everybody not to tell me. How valiantly I went at it that first day. I worked at top speed, filling the iron wheelbarrow with coal, running it on the scales and weighing the load, then trundling it into the fire room and dumping it on the plates before the fires. Work! I did more than the two men whom I had displaced. They had merely wheeled in the coal and dumped it on the plates. But while I did this for the day coal, the night coal I had to pile against the wall of the fire room. 
Now the fire room was small. It had been planned for a night coal passer. So I had to pile the night coal higher and higher, buttressing up the heap with stout planks. Toward the top of the heap, I had to handle the coal a second time, tossing it up with a shovel. I dripped with sweat, but I never ceased from my stride, though I could feel exhaustion coming on. By ten o'clock in the morning, so much of my body's energy had I consumed, I felt hungry and snatched a thick double slice of bread and butter from my dinner pail. This I devoured, standing, grimed with coal dust, my knees trembling under me. By eleven o'clock, in this fashion, I had consumed my whole lunch. But what of it? I realized that it would enable me to continue working through the noon hour. And I worked all the afternoon. Darkness came on, and I worked under the electric lights. The day fireman went off, and the night fireman came on. I plugged away. At half past eight, famished, tottering, I washed up, changed my clothes, and dragged my weary body to the car. It was three miles to where I lived, and I had received a pass with the stipulation that I could sit down as long as there were no paying passengers in need of a seat. As I sank into a corner outside seat, I prayed that no passenger might require my seat. But the car filled up, and halfway in a woman came on board, and there was no seat for her. I started to get up, and to my astonishment found that I could not. With the chill wind blowing on me, my spent body had stiffened into the seat. It took me the rest of the run-in to unkink my complaining joints and muscles and get into a standing position on the lower ramp. And when the car stopped at my corner, I nearly fell to the ground when I stepped off. I hobbled two blocks to the house and limped into the kitchen. While my mother started to cook, I plunged into bread and butter. But before my appetite was appeased, or the steak fried, I was sound asleep. In vain my mother strove to shake me awake enough to eat the meat. Failing in this, with the assistance of my father, she managed to get me to my room, where I collapsed dead asleep on the bed. They undressed me and covered me up. In the morning came the agony of being awakened. I was terribly sore, and worst of all, my wrists were swelling. But I made up for my lost supper, eating an enormous breakfast, and when I hobbled to catch my car, I carried a lunch twice as big as the one the day before. Work! Let any youth just turned eighteen try to out-shovel two man-grown coal shovelers. Work! Long before midday, I had eaten the last scrap of my huge lunch. But I was resolved to show them what a husky young fellow determined to rise could do. The worst of it was that my wrists were swelling and going back on me. There are few who do not know the pain of walking on a sprained ankle. Then imagine the pain of shoveling coal and trundling a loaded wheelbarrow with two sprained wrists. Work! More than once I sank down on the coal where no one could see me and cried with rage and mortification, and exhaustion, and despair. That second day was my hardest, and all that enabled me to survive it and get in the last of the night coal at the end of thirteen hours was the day fireman, 
who bound both my wrists with broad leather straps. So tightly were they buckled that they were like slightly flexible plaster casts. They took the stresses and pressures which hitherto had been borne by my wrists, and they were so tight that there was no room for the inflammation to rise in the sprains. And in this fashion I continued to learn to be an electrician. Night after night I limped home, fell asleep before I could eat my supper, and was helped into bed and undressed. Morning after morning, always with hunger lunches in my dinner pail, I limped out of the house on my way to work. I no longer read my library books. I made no dates with the girls. I was a proper work beast. I worked and ate and slept while my mind slept all the time. The whole thing was a nightmare. I worked every day, including Sunday, and I looked far ahead to my one day off at the end of a month, resolved to lie abed all that day and just sleep and rest up. The strangest part of this experience was that I never took a drink nor thought of taking a drink. Yet I knew that men under hard pressure almost invariably drank. I had seen them do it, and in the past had often done it myself. But so sheerly non-alcoholic was I that it never entered my mind that a drink might be good for me. I instanced this to show how entirely lacking from my makeup was any predisposition toward alcohol. And the point of this instance is that later on, after more years had passed, contact with John Barleycorn at last did induce in me the alcoholic desire. I had often noticed the day fireman staring at me in a curious way. At last one day he spoke. He began by swearing me to secrecy. He had been warned by the superintendent not to tell me, and in telling me he was risking his job. He told me of the day coal passer and the night coal passer, and of the wages they had received. I was doing for thirty dollars a month what they had received eighty dollars for doing. He would have told me sooner, the fireman said, had he not been so certain that I would break down under the work and quit. As it was, I was killing myself, and all to no good purpose. I was merely cheapening the price of labor, he argued, and keeping two men out of a job. Being an American boy, and a proud American boy, I did not immediately quit. This was foolish of me, I know, but I resolved to continue the work long enough to prove to the superintendent that I could do it without breaking down. Then I would quit, and he would realize what a fine young fellow he had lost. All of which I faithfully and foolishly did. I worked on until the time came when I got in the last of the night coal by six o'clock. Then I quit the job of learning electricity by doing more than two men's work for a boy's wages, went home, and proceeded to sleep the clock round. Fortunately, I had not stayed by the job long enough to injure myself. Though I was compelled to wear straps on my wrists for a year afterward. But the effect of this work orgy in which I had indulged was to sicken me with work. I just wouldn't work. The thought of work was repulsive. I didn't care if I never settled down. Learning a trade could go hang. It was a whole lot better to roister and frolic over the world in the way I had previously done. 
So I headed out on the adventure path again, starting to tramp east by beating my way on the railroads. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 But behold! As soon as I went out on the adventure path, I met John Barleycorn again. I moved through a world of strangers, and the act of drinking together made one acquainted with men and opened the way to adventures. It might be in a saloon with jingled townsmen, or with a genial railroad man well lighted up and armed with pocket flasks, or with a bunch of alky stiffs in a hangout. Yes, and it might be in a prohibition state, such as Iowa was in 1894, when I wandered up the main street of Des Moines and was variously invited by strangers into various blind pigs. I remember drinking in barber shops, plumbing establishments, and furniture stores. Always it was John Barleycorn. Even a tramp in those halcyon days could get most frequently drunk. I remember inside the prison at Buffalo how some of us got magnificently jingled and how, on the streets of Buffalo after our release, another jingle was financed with pennies begged on the main drag. I had no call for alcohol, but when I was with those who drank, I drank with them. I insisted on traveling or loafing with the livest, keenest men, and it was just these live, keen ones that did most of the drinking. They were the more comradely men, the more venturous, the more individual. Perhaps it was too much temperament that made them turn from the commonplace and humdrum to find relief in lying and fantastic sureties of John Barleycorn. Be that as it may, the men I liked best, desired most to be with, were invariably to be found in John Barleycorn's company. In the course of my tramping over the United States, I achieved a new concept. As a tramp, I was behind the scenes of society, ay, and down in the cellar. I could watch the machinery work. I saw the wheels of the social machine go around, and I learned that the dignity of manual labor wasn't what I had been told it was by the teachers, preachers, and politicians. The men without trades were helpless cattle. If one learned a trade, he was compelled to belong to a union in order to work at his trade. And his union was compelled to bully and slug the employer's unions in order to hold up wages or hold down hours. The employer's unions likewise bullied and slugged. I couldn't see any dignity at all. And when a workman got old or had an accident, he was thrown into the scrap heap like any worn-out machine. I saw too many of this sort who were making anything but dignified ends of life. So my new concept was that manual labor was undignified and that it didn't pay. No trade for me was my decision and no superintendent's daughters. And no criminality, I also decided. That would be almost as disastrous as to be a laborer. Brains paid, not brawn, and I resolved never again to offer my muscles for sale in the brawn market. Brain and brain only would I sell. 
I returned to California with the firm intention of developing my brain. This meant school education. I had gone through the grammar school long ago, so I entered the Oakland High School. To pay my way, I worked as a janitor. My sister helped me, too. And I was not above mowing anybody's lawn or taking up and beating carpets when I had half a day to spare. I was working to get away from work, and I buckled down to it with a grim realization of the paradox. Boy and girl love was left behind and along with it, Haiti and Louis Shattuck, and the early evening strolls. I hadn't the time. I joined the Henry Clay Debating Society. I was received into the homes of some of the members where I met nice girls whose skirts reached the ground. I dallied with little home clubs wherein we discussed poetry and art and the nuances of grammar. I joined the Socialist Local, where we studied and orated political economy, philosophy, and politics. I kept half a dozen membership cards working in the free library and did an immense amount of collateral reading. And, for a year and a half on end, I never took a drink, nor thought of taking a drink. I hadn't the time, and I certainly did not have the inclination. Between my janitor work, my studies, and innocent amusements such as chess, I hadn't a moment to spare. I was discovering a new world, and such was the passion of my exploration that the old world of John Barleycorn held no inducements for me. Come to think of it, I did enter a saloon. I went to see Johnny Heinhold in The Last Chance, and I went to borrow money. And right here is another phase of John Barleycorn. Saloon keepers are notoriously good fellows. On an average, they perform vastly greater generosities than do businessmen. When I simply had to have ten dollars, desperate, with no place to turn, I went to see Johnny Heinhold. Several years had passed since I had been in his place or spent a cent across his bar. And when I went to borrow the ten dollars, I didn't buy a drink either. And Johnny Heinhold let me have the ten dollars without security or interest. More than once, in the brief days of my struggle for an education, I went to see Johnny Heinhold to borrow money. When I entered the university, I borrowed forty dollars from him, without interest, without security, without buying a drink. And yet, and here is the point, the custom and the code, in the days of my prosperity, after the lapse of years, I have gone out of my way by many a long block to spend across Johnny Heinhold's bar deferred interest on the various loans. Not that Johnny Heinhold asked me to do it, or expected me to do it. I did it, as I have said, in obedience to the code I have learned along with all the other things connected with John Barleycorn. In distress, when a man has no other place to turn, when he hasn't the slightest bit of security which a savage-hearted pawnbroker would consider, he can go to some saloon keeper he knows. Gratitude is inherently human. When the man so helped has money again, depend upon it that a portion will be spent across the bar of the saloon keeper who befriended him. 
why i recollect the early days of my writing career when the small sums of money i earned from the magazines came with tragic irregularity while at the same time i was staggering along with a growing family a wife children a mother a nephew and my mammy jenny and her old husband fallen on evil days there were two places at which i could borrow money a barber shop and a saloon the barber charged me five per cent per month in advance that is to say when i borrowed one hundred dollars he handed me ninety-five the other five dollars he retained as advance interest for the first month and on the second month i paid him five dollars more and continued to do so each month until i made a ten strike with the editors and lifted the loan the other place to which i came in trouble was the saloon the saloon keeper i had known by sight for a couple of years i had never spent my money in his saloon and even when i borrowed from him i didn't spend any money yet never did he refuse me any sum i asked of him unfortunately before i became prosperous he moved away to another city and to this day i regret that he is gone it is the code i have learned the right thing to do and the right thing i do right now did i know where he is would be to drop in on occasion and spend a few dollars across his bar for old sake's sake and gratitude this is not to exalt saloon keepers i have written it to exalt the power of john barleycorn and to illustrate one more of the myriad ways by which a man is brought in contact with john barleycorn until in the end he finds he cannot get along without him but to return to the run of my narrative away from the adventure path up to my ears in study every moment occupied i lived oblivious to john barleycorn's existence nobody about me drank if any had drunk and had they offered it to me i surely would have drunk as it was when i had spare moments i spent them playing chess or going with nice girls who were themselves students or in riding a bicycle whenever i was fortunate enough to have it out of the pawnbroker's possession what i am insisting upon all the time is this in me was not the slightest trace of alcoholic desire and this despite the long and severe apprenticeship i had served under john barleycorn i had come back from the other side of life to be delighted with this arcadian simplicity of student youths and student maidens also i had found my way into the realm of the mind and i was intellectually intoxicated alas as i was to learn at a later period intellectual intoxication too has its katzenjammer chapter twenty two three years was the time required to go through the high school i grew impatient also my schooling was becoming financially impossible at such rate i could not last out and i did greatly want to go to the state university when i had done a year of high school i decided to attempt a short cut 
I borrowed the money and paid to enter the senior class of a cramming joint of academy. I was scheduled to graduate right into the university at the end of four months, thus saving two years. And how I did cram. I had two years' new work to do in a third of a year. For five weeks I crammed, until simultaneous quadratic equations and chemical formulas fairly oozed from my ears. And then the master of the academy took me aside. He was very sorry, but he was compelled to give me back my tuition fee and to ask me to leave the school. It wasn't a matter of scholarship. I stood well in my classes and did he graduate me into the university, he was confident that in that institution I would continue to stand well. The trouble was that tongues were gossiping about my case. What? In four months accomplished two years' work. It would be a scandal and the universities were becoming severer in their treatment of accredited prep schools. He couldn't afford such a scandal, therefore I must gracefully depart. I did, and I paid back the borrowed money and gritted my teeth and started to cram by myself. There were three months yet before the university entrance examinations. Without laboratories, without coaching, sitting in my bedroom, I proceeded to compress that two years' work into three months and to keep reviewed on the previous year's work. Nineteen hours a day I studied. For three months I kept this pace, only breaking it on several occasions. My body grew weary. My mind grew weary, but I stayed with it. My eyes grew weary and began to twitch, but they did not break down. Perhaps, toward the last, I got a bit dotty. I know that at that time I was confident I had discovered the formula for squaring the circle but I resolutely deferred the working of it out until after the examinations. Then I would show them. Came the several days of the examinations, during which time I scarcely closed my eyes in sleep, devoting every moment to cramming and reviewing. And when I turned in my last examination paper, I was in full possession of a splendid case of brain fag. I didn't want to see a book. I didn't want to think or to lay eyes on anybody who was liable to think. There was but one prescription for such a condition, and I gave it to myself, the adventure path. I didn't wait to learn the result of my examinations. I stowed a roll of blankets and some cold food into a borrowed Whitehall boat and set sail. Out of the Oakland estuary I drifted on the last of the early morning ebb, caught the first of the flood up bay and raced along with a spanking breeze. San Pablo Bay was smoking, and the Carquinez Straits off the Selby smelter were smoking too, as I picked up ahead and left astern the old landmarks I had first learned with Nelson in the unreefed reindeer. Benicia showed before me. I opened the bight of Turner's shipyard, rounded the Solano wharf, and surged along abreast of the patch of tools and the clustering fishermen's arks where in the old days I had lived and drunk deep. And right here something happened to me, the gravity of which I never dreamed for many a long year to come. 
I had had no intention of stopping at Benicia. The tide favored, the wind was fair and howling, glorious sailing for a sailor. Bullhead and army points showed ahead, marking the entrance to Susan Bay, which I knew was smoking. And yet, when I laid eyes on those fishing arks lying in the waterfront tools without debate, on the instance I put down my tiller, came in on the sheet, and headed for the shore. On the instant, out of the profound of my brain fag, I knew what I wanted. I wanted to drink. I wanted to get drunk. The call was imperative. There was no uncertainty about it. More than anything else in the world, my frayed and frazzled mind wanted surcease from weariness in the way it knew surcease would come. And right here is the point. For the first time in my life, I consciously deliberately desired to get drunk. It was a new, a totally different manifestation of John Barleycorn's power. It was not a body need for alcohol. It was a mental desire. My overworked and jaded mind wanted to forget. And here the point is drawn to its sharpest. Granted my prodigious brain fag, nevertheless, had I never drunk in the past, the thought would never have entered my mind to get drunk now. Beginning with physical intolerance for alcohol, for years drinking only for the sake of comradeship and because alcohol was everywhere on the adventure path, I had now reached the stage where my brain cried out, not merely for a drink, but for a drunk. And had I not been so long used to alcohol, my brain would not have so cried out. I should have sailed on past Bullhead, and in the smoking white of Susan Bay, and in the wine of wind that filled my sail and poured through me, I should have forgotten my weary brain and rested and refreshed it. So I sailed in to shore, made all fast, and hurried up along the arks. Charlie Legrant fell on my neck. His wife Lizzie folded me to her capacious breast. Billy Murphy and Joe Lloyd and all the survivors of the old guard got around me and their arms around me. Charlie seized the can and started for Jorgensen's saloon across the railroad tracks. That meant beer. I wanted whiskey, so I called after him to bring a flask. Many times that flask journeyed across the railroad tracks and back. More old friends of the old free and easy times dropped in. Fishermen, Greeks and Russians and French. They took turns in treating and treated all around in turn again. They came and went, but I stayed on and drank with all. I guzzled, I swilled, I ran the liquor down and joyed as the maggots in my brain. And Clam came in, Nelson's partner before me, handsome as ever, but more reckless, half insane, burning himself out with whiskey. He had just had a quarrel with his partner on the sloop, gazelle and knives had been drawn and blows struck and he was bent on maddening the fever of the memory with more whiskey and while we downed it 
we remembered Nelson and that he had stretched out his great shoulders for the last long sleep in this very town of Benicia. And we went over the memory of him and remembered only the good things of him and sent out the flask to be filled and drank again. They wanted me to stay over, but through the open door I could see the brave wind on the water, and my ears were filled with the roar of it. And while I forgot that I had plunged into the books nineteen hours a day for three solid months, Charlie LeGrant shifted my outfit into a big Columbia River salmon boat. He added charcoal and a fisherman's brazier, a coffee pot and frying pan, and the coffee and the meat, and a black bass fresh from the water that day. They had to help me down the rickety wharf and into the salmon boat. Likewise, they stretched my boom and sprit until the sail set like a board. Some feared to set the sprit but I insisted, and Charlie had no doubts. He knew me of old, and knew that I could sail as long as I could see. They cast off my painter. I put the tiller up, filled away before it, and with dizzy eyes checked and steadied the boat on her course and waved farewell. The tide had turned, and the fierce ebb running in the teeth of a fiercer wind, kicked up a stiff, upstanding sea. Susin Bay was white with wrath and sea lump, but a salmon boat can sail, and I knew how to sail a salmon boat. So I drove her into it, and through it, and across, and maundered loud, and chanted my disdain for all the books and schools cresting seas filled me a foot or so with water but i laughed at it sloshing about my feet and chanted my disdain for the wind and the water i hailed myself a master of life riding on the back of the unleashed elements and john barleycorn rode with me amid dissertations on mathematics and philosophy and spoutings and quotations, I sang all the old songs learned in the days when I went from the cannery to the oyster banks to be a pirate. Such songs as Black Lulu, Flying Cloud, Treat My Daughter Kindly, The Boston Burglar, Come All You Rambling Gambling Men, I wished I was a little bird, Shen and Doa, and Ranzo, boys, Ranzo. Hours afterward, in the fires of sunset, where the Sacramento and the San Joaquin tumble their mighty floods together, I took the New York cutoff skimmed across the smooth landlocked water past black diamond on into the san joaquin and on to antioch where somewhat sobered and magnificently hungry i laid alongside a big potato sloop that had a familiar rig here were old friends aboard who fried my black bass in olive oil then, too, there was a meaty fisherman stew, delicious with garlic and crusty Italian bread without butter, and all washed down with pint mugs of thick and heady claret. My salmon boat was a soap, but in the snug cabin of the sloop, dry blankets and a dry bunk were mine and we lay and smoked and yarned of old days, while overhead the wind screamed through the rigging and taut halyards drummed against the mast. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 
My cruise in the salmon boat lasted a week, and I returned ready to enter the university. During the week's cruise I did not drink again. To accomplish this I was compelled to avoid looking up old friends, for as ever the adventure path was beset with John Barleycorn. I had wanted the drink that first day, and in the days that followed I did not want it. My tired brain had recuperated. I had no moral scruples in the matter. I was not ashamed nor sorry because of that first day's orgy at Benicia, and I thought no more about it, returning gladly to my books and studies. Long years were to pass ere I looked back upon that day and realized its significance. At the time, and for a long time afterward, I was to think of it only as a frolic. But still later, in the slough of brain fag and intellectual weariness, I was to remember and know the craving for the anodyne that resides in alcohol. In the meantime, after this one relapse at Benicia, I went on with my abstemiousness, primarily because I didn't want to drink. And next, I was abstemious because my way led among books and students where no drinking was. Had I been out on the adventure path, I should, as a matter of course, have been drinking. For that is the pity of the adventure path, which is one of John Barleycorn's favorite stamping grounds. I completed the first half of my freshman year, and in January of 1897 took up my courses for the second half. But the pressure from lack of money plus a conviction that the university was not giving me all that I wanted in the time I could spare for it, forced me to leave. I was not very disappointed. For two years I had studied, and in those two years, what was far more valuable, I had done a prodigious amount of reading. Then, too, my grammar had improved. It is true I had not yet learned that I must say it is I, but I no longer was guilty of a double negative in writing, though still prone to that error in excited speech. I decided immediately to embark on my career. I had four preferences. First, music. Second, poetry. Third, the writing of philosophic, economic, and political essays, and fourth and last and least, fiction writing. I resolutely cut out music as impossible, settled down in my bedroom, and tackled my second, third, and fourth choices simultaneously. Heavens, how I wrote! Never was there a creative fever such as mine from which the patient escaped fatal results. The way I worked was enough to soften my brain and send me to a madhouse. I wrote, I wrote everything, ponderous essays, scientific and sociological short stories, humorous verse, Verse of all sorts, from triolets and sonnets to blank verse tragedy and elephantine epics in Spenserian stanzas. On occasion I composed steadily, day after day, for fifteen hours a day. At times I forgot to eat, or refused to tear myself away from my passionate outpouring in order to eat. And then there was the matter of typewriting. My brother-in-law owned a machine which he used in the daytime. In the night, I was free to use it. That machine was a wonder. I could weep now as I recollect my wrestlings with it. 
it must have been a first model in the year one of the typewriter error its alphabet was all capitals it was informed with an evil spirit it obeyed no known laws of physics and overthrew the hoary axiom that like things perform to like things produce like results i'll swear that machine never did the same thing in the same way twice again and again it demonstrated that unlike actions produce like results how my back used to ache with it prior to that experience my back had been good for every violent strain put upon it in a none too gentle career but that typewriter proved to me that i had a pipe stem for a back also it made me dult my shoulders they ached as with rheumatism after every bout the keys of that machine had to be hit so hard that to one outside the house it sounded like distant thunder or someone breaking up the furniture i had to hit the keys so hard that i strained my first fingers to the elbows while the ends of my fingers were blisters burst and blistered again had it been my machine i'd have operated it with a carpenter's hammer the worst of it was that i was actually typing my manuscripts at the same time i was trying to master that machine it was a feat of physical endurance and a brainstorm combined to type a thousand words and i was composing thousands of words every day which just had to be typed for the waiting editors oh between the writing and the typewriting i was well aweary i had brain and nerve fag and body fag as well and yet the thought of drink never suggested itself i was living too high to stand in need of an anodyne all my waking hours except those with that infernal typewriter were spent in a creative heaven and along with this i had no desire for drink because i still believed in many things in the love of all men and women in the matter of man and women love in fatherhood in human justice in art in the whole host of fond illusions that keep the world turning round but the waiting editors elected to keep on waiting my manuscripts made amazing round-trip records between the pacific and the atlantic it might have been the weirdness of the typewriting that prevented the editors from accepting at least one little offering of mine i don't know and goodness knows the stuff i wrote was as weird as its typing i sold my hard-bought school books for ridiculous sums to second-hand bookmen i borrowed small sums of money wherever i could and suffered my old father to feed me with the meagre returns of his failing strength it didn't last long only a few weeks when i had to surrender and go to work yet i was unaware of any need for the drink anodyne i was not disappointed my career was retarded that was all perhaps i did need further preparation i had learned enough from the books to realize that i had only touched the hem of knowledge's garment i still lived on the heights my waking hours and most of the hours i should have used for sleep were spent with the books chapter twenty four out in the country at the belmont academy i went to work in a small perfectly appointed steam laundry another fellow in myself did all the work from sorting and washing 
to ironing the white shirts, collars, and cuffs, and the fancy starch of the wives of the professors. We worked like tigers, especially as summer came on and the academy boys took to the wearing of duck trousers. It consumes a dreadful lot of time to iron one pair of duck trousers. And there were so many pairs of them. We sweated our way through long, sizzling weeks at a task that was never done. And many a night, while the students snored in bed, my partner and I toiled on under the electric light at steam mangle or ironing board. The hours were long, the work was arduous, despite the fact that we became past masters in the art of eliminating waste motion and I was receiving thirty dollars a month and board, a slight increase over my coal shoveling and cannery days, at least to the extent of board, which cost my employer little we ate in the kitchen, but which was to me the equivalent of twenty dollars a month. My robuster strength of added years, my increased skill, and in all I had learned from the books were responsible for this increase of twenty dollars. Judging by my rate of development, I might hope before I died to be a night watchman for sixty dollars a month, or a policeman actually receiving a hundred dollars with pickings. So relentlessly did my partner and I spring into our work throughout the week that by Saturday night we were frazzled wrecks. I found myself in the old familiar work-beast condition, toiling longer hours than the horses toiled, thinking scarcely more frequent thoughts than horses think. The books were closed to me. I had brought a trunkful to the laundry, but found myself unable to read them. I fell asleep the moment I tried to read, and if I did manage to keep my eyes open for several pages, I could not remember the contents of these pages. I gave over attempts on heavy study, such as jurisprudence, political economy, and biology, and tried lighter stuff, such as history. I fell asleep. I tried literature and fell asleep. And finally, when I fell asleep over lively novels, I gave up. I never succeeded in reading one book in all the time I spent in the laundry. And when Saturday night came and the week's work was over until Monday morning, I knew only one desire besides the desire to sleep, and that was to get drunk. This was the second time in my life that I had heard the unmistakable call of John Barleycorn. The first time it had been because of brain fag. But I had no overworked brain now. On the contrary, all I knew was the dull numbness of a brain that was not worked at all. That was the trouble. My brain had become so alert and eager, so quickened by the wonder of the new world the books had discovered to it, that it now suffered all the misery of stagnancy and inaction. And I, the long-time intimate of John Barleycorn, knew just what he promised me. Maggots of fancy, dreams of power, forgetfulness, anything and everything save whirling washers, revolving mangles, humming centrifugal ringers, and fancy starch and interminable processions of duck trousers moving in steam under my flying iron. And that's it. John Barleycorn makes his appeal to weakness and failure, to weariness and exhaustion. He is the easy way out. And he is lying all the time. 
he offers false strength to the body, false elevation to the spirit, making things seem what they are not and vastly fairer than what they are. But it must not be forgotten that John Barleycorn is protean. As well as to weakness and exhaustion does he appeal to too much strength, to superabundant vitality, to the ennui of idleness. He can tuck in his arm the arm of any man in any mood. He can throw the net of his lure over all men. He exchanges new lamps for old, the spangles of illusion for the drabs of reality, and in the end cheats all who traffic with him. I didn't get drunk, however, for the simple reason that it was a mile and a half to the nearest saloon, and this in turn was because the call to get drunk was not very loud in my ears. Had it been loud, I would have traveled ten times the distance to win to the saloon. On the other hand, had the saloon been just around the corner, I should have got drunk. As it was, I would sprawl out in the shade on my one day of rest and dally with the Sunday papers. But I was too weary even for their froth. The comic supplement might bring a pallid smile to my face, and then I would fall asleep. Although I did not yield to John Barleycorn while working in the laundry, a certain definite result was produced. I had heard the call, felt the gnaw of desire, yearned for the anodyne. I was being prepared for the stronger desire of later years. And the point is that this development of desire was entirely in my brain. My body did not cry out for alcohol. As always, alcohol was repulsive to my body. When I was bodily weary from shoveling coal, the thought of taking a drink had never flickered into my consciousness. When I was brain-wearied after taking the entrance examinations to the university, I promptly got drunk. At the laundry, I was suffering physical exhaustion again, and physical exhaustion that was not nearly so profound as that of the coal shoveling. But there was a difference. When I went coal shoveling, my mind had not yet awakened. Between that time and the laundry, my mind had found the kingdom of the mind. While shoveling coal, my mind was somnolent. While tolling in the laundry, my mind, informed and eager to do and be, was crucified. And whether I yielded to drink, as at Benicia, or whether I refrained, as at the laundry, in my brain the seeds of desire for alcohol were germinating. Chapter 25 After the laundry, my sister and her husband grub-staked me into the Klondike. It was the first gold rush into that region, the early fall rush of 1897. I was 21 years old and in splendid physical condition. I remember at the end of the 28-mile portage across Chilkoot, from Daya Beach to Lake Linderman, I was packing up with the Indians and out packing many an Indian. The last pack into Linderman was three miles. I back tripped it four times a day and on each forward trip carried 150 pounds. This means that over the worst trails, I daily traveled 24 miles, 12 of which were under a burden of 150 pounds. 
Yes, I had let career go hang, and was on the adventure path again in quest of fortune. And, of course, on the adventure path I met John Barleycorn. Here were the chesty men again, rovers and adventurers, and while they didn't mind a grub famine, whiskey they could not do without. Whiskey went over the trail while the flour lay cached and untouched by the trail side. As good fortune would have it, the three men in my party were not drinkers. Therefore I didn't drink save on rare occasions and disgracefully when with other men. In my personal medicine chest was a quart of whiskey. I never drew the cork till six months afterward in a lonely camp where without anesthetics a doctor was compelled to operate on a man the doctor and the patient emptied my bottle between them and then proceeded to the operation back in california a year later recovering from scurvy i found that my father was dead and that i was the head and the sole breadwinner of a household when I state that I had passed coal on a steamship from Bering Sea to British Columbia and traveled in the steerage from there to San Francisco, it will be understood that I brought nothing back from the Klondike but my scurvy. Times were hard. Work of any sort was difficult to get, and work of any sort was what I had to take, for I was still an unskilled laborer. I had no thought of career. That was over and done with. I had to find food for two mouths besides my own and keep a roof over our heads. Yes, and buy a winter suit, my one suit being decidedly summery. I had to get some sort of work immediately. After that, when I had caught my breath, I might think about my future. Unskilled labor is the first to feel the slackness of hard times, and I had no trades save those of sailor and laundryman. With my new responsibilities, I didn't care to go to sea, and I failed to find a job at laundrying. I failed to find a job at anything. I had my name down in five employment bureau. I advertised in three newspapers. I sought out the few friends I knew who might be able to get me work, but they were either uninterested or unable to find anything for me. The situation was desperate. I pawned my watch, my bicycle, and a Macintosh of which my father had been very proud and which he had left to me. It was and is my sole legacy in this world. It had cost fifteen dollars, and the pawnbroker let me have two dollars on it. And, oh yes, a waterfront comrade of earlier years drifted along one day with a dress suit wrapped in newspapers. He could give no adequate explanation of how he had come to possess it, nor did I press for an explanation. I wanted the suit myself. No, not to wear. I traded him a lot of rubbish, which, being unpawnable, was useless to me. He peddled the rubbish for several dollars, while I pledged the dress suit with my pawnbroker for five dollars and for all I knew, the pawnbroker still has the suit. I had never intended to redeem it. But I couldn't get any work. Yet I was a bargain in the labor market. I was twenty-two years old, weighed one hundred and sixty-five pounds stripped, every pound of which was excellent for toil, and the last traces of my scurvy were vanishing before a treatment of potatoes chewed raw. I tackled every opening for employment. 
I tried to become a studio model, but there were too many fine-bodied young fellows out of jobs. I answered advertisements of elderly invalids in need of companions. And I almost became a sewing machine agent on commission without salary. But poor people don't buy sewing machines in hard times, so I was forced to forgo that employment. Of course, it must be remembered that along with such frivolous occupations, I was trying to get work as wop, lumper, and roustabout. But winter was coming on, and the surplus labor army was pouring into the cities. Also I, who had romped along carelessly through the countries of the world and the kingdom of the mind, was not a member of any union. I sought odd jobs. I worked days and half days at anything I could get. I mowed lawns, trimmed hedges, took up carpets, beat them, and laid them again. Further, I took the civil service examinations for mail carrier and passed first. But alas, there was no vacancy and I must wait. And while I waited, and in between the odd jobs I managed to procure, I started to earn ten dollars by writing a newspaper account of a voyage I had made, in an open boat down the Yukon, of nineteen hundred miles in nineteen days. I didn't know the first thing about the newspaper game, but I was confident I'd get ten dollars for my article but i didn't the first san francisco newspaper to which i mailed it never acknowledged receipt of the manuscript but held on to it the longer it held on to it the more certain i was that the thing was accepted but here is the funny thing some are born to fortune and some have fortune thrust upon them but in my case I was clubbed into fortune, and bitter necessity wielded the club. I had long since abandoned all thought of writing as a career. My honest intention in writing that article was to earn ten dollars, and that was the limit of my intention. It would help to tide me along until I got steady employment. Had a vacancy occurred in the post office at that time, I should have jumped at it. But the vacancy did not occur, nor did a steady job, and I employed the time between odd jobs with writing a 21,000-word serial for the youth's companion. I turned it out and typed it in seven days. I fancy that was what was the matter with it, for it came back. It took some time for it to go and come, and in the meantime I tried my hand at short stories. I sold one to the Overland Monthly for five dollars. The Black Cat gave me forty dollars for another. The Overland Monthly offered me seven dollars and a half, pay on publication, for all the stories I should deliver. I got my bicycle, my watch, and my father's Macintosh out of pawn and rented a typewriter. Also, I paid up the bills I owed to the several groceries that allowed me a small credit. I recall the Portuguese grocery man who never permitted my bill to go beyond four dollars. Hopkins, another grocer, could not be budged beyond five dollars. And just then came the call from the post office to go to work. It placed me in a most trying predicament. The sixty-five dollars I could earn regularly every month was a terrible temptation. I couldn't decide what to do. And I'll never be able to forgive the postmaster of Oakland. I answered the call and I talked to him like a man. I frankly told him the situation. 
it looked as if I might win out at writing. The chance was good, but not certain. Now, if he would pass me by and select the next man on the eligible list and give me a call at the next vacancy, but he shut me off with, Then you don't want the position? But I do, I protested. Don't you see if you will pass me over this time? If you want it, you will take it, he said coldly. Happily for me, the cursed brutality of the man made me angry. Very well, I said, I won't take it. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Having burned my ship, I plunged into writing. I am afraid I always was an extremist. Early and late I was at it, writing, typing, studying grammar, studying, writing in all the forms of writing, and studying the writers who succeeded in order to find out how they succeeded. I managed on five hours sleep in the twenty-four, and came pretty close to working the nineteen waking hours left to me. My light burned till two and three in the morning, which led a good neighbor woman into a bit of sentimental Sherlock Holmes deduction. Never seeing me in the daytime, she concluded that I was a gambler, and that the light in my window was placed there by my mother to guide her erring son home. The trouble with the beginner at the writing game is the long dry spells, when there is never an editor's check and everything pawnable is pawned. I wore my summer suit pretty well through that winter, and the following summer experienced the longest, driest spell of all, in the period when salaried men are gone on vacation and manuscripts lie in editorial offices until vacation is over. My difficulty was that I had no one to advise me. I didn't know a soul who had written or who had ever tried to write. I didn't even know one reporter. Also, to succeed at the writing game, I found I had to unlearn about everything the teachers and professors of literature of the high school and university had taught me. I was very indignant about this at the time, though now I can understand it. They did not know the trick of successful writing in the years 1895 and 1896. They knew all about Snowbound and Sartore Sartis, but the American editors of 1899 did not want such truck. They wanted the 1899 truck and offered to pay so well for it that the teachers and professors of literature would have quit their jobs could they have supplied it. I struggled on, stood off the butcher and the grocer, pawned my watch and bicycle and my father's Macintosh, and I worked. I really did work, and went on short commons of sleep. Critics have complained about the swift education one of my characters, Martin Eden, achieved. In three years from a sailor with a common school education, I made a successful writer of him. The critics say this is impossible. Yet I was Martin Eden. At the end of three working years, two of which were spent in high school and the university, and one spent at writing, and all three in studying immensely and intensely, I was publishing stories in magazines such as the Atlantic Monthly, was correcting proofs of my first book, issued by Houghton Mifflin Company, was selling sociological articles to Cosmopolitan and McClure's, had declined an associate editorship proffered me by telegraph from New York City, and was getting ready to marry. 
Now the foregoing means work, especially the last year of it, when I was learning my trade as a writer. And in that year, running short on sleep and taking my brain to its limit, I neither drank nor cared to drink. So far as I was concerned, alcohol did not exist. I did suffer from brain fag on occasion, but alcohol never suggested itself as an ameliorative. Heavens! Editorial acceptances and checks were all the amelioratives I needed. A thin envelope from an editor in the morning's mail was more stimulating than half a dozen cocktails. And if a check of decent amount came out of the envelope, such incident in itself was a whole drunk. Furthermore, at that time in my life I did not know what a cocktail was. I remember, when my first book was published, several Alaskans, who were members of the Bohemian Club, entertained me one evening at the club in San Francisco. We sat in most wonderful leather chairs, and drinks were ordered. Never had I heard such an ordering of liqueurs and of highballs of particular brands of scotch. I didn't know what a liqueur or a highball was, and I didn't know that scotch meant whiskey. I knew only poor men's drinks, the drinks of the frontier and of sailor town, cheap beer and cheaper whiskey that was just called whiskey and nothing else. I was embarrassed to make a choice, and the steward nearly collapsed when I ordered claret as an after-dinner drink. Chapter 27 As I succeeded with my writing, my standard of living rose and my horizon broadened. I confined myself to writing and typing a thousand words a day, including Sundays and holidays. And I still studied hard, but not so hard as formerly. I allowed myself five and one hours of actual sleep. I added this half hour because I was compelled. Financial success permitted me more time for exercise. I rode my wheel more, chiefly because it was permanently out of pawn, and I boxed and fenced, walked on my hands, jumped high and broad, put the shot and tossed the caber, and went swimming. And I learned that more sleep is required for physical exercise than for mental exercise. There were tired nights bodily when I slept six hours and on occasion of very severe exercise I actually slept seven hours. But such sleep orgies were not frequent. There was so much to learn, so much to be done, that I felt wicked when I slept seven hours. And I blessed the man who invented alarm clocks. And still no desire to drink. I possessed too many fine faiths, was living at too keen a pitch. I was a socialist, intent on saving the world, and alcohol could not give me the fervors that were mine from my ideas and ideals. My voice, on account of my successful writing, had added weight, or so I thought. At any rate, my reputation as a writer drew me audiences that my reputation as a speaker never could have drawn. I was invited before clubs and organizations of all sorts to deliver my message. I fought the good fight and went on studying and writing and was very busy. Up to this time, I had had a very restricted circle of friends. But now I began to go about. I was invited out, especially to dinner, and I made many friends and acquaintances whose economic lives were easier than mine had been, and many of them drank. In their own houses they drank and offered me drink. They were not drunkards, any of them. They just drank temperately, 
and I drank temperately with them as an act of comradeship and accepted hospitality. I did not care for it, neither wanted it, nor did not want it, and so small was the impression made by it that I do not remember my first cocktail nor my first scotch highball. Well, I had a house. When one is asked into other houses, he naturally asks others into his house. Behold the rising standard of living. Having been given drink in other houses, I could expect nothing else of myself than to give drink in my own house. So I laid in a supply of beer and whiskey and table claret. Never since that has my house not been well equipped. And still, through all this period, I did not care in the slightest for John Barleycorn. I drank when others drank and with them as a social act, and I had so little choice in the matter that I drank whatever they drank. If they elected whiskey, then whiskey it was for me. If they drank root beer or sarsaparilla, I drank root beer or sarsaparilla with them. And when there were no friends in the house, why, I didn't drink anything. Whiskey decanters were always in the room where I wrote, and for months and years I never knew what it was when by myself to take a drink. When out at dinner I noticed the kindly genial glow of the preliminary cocktail. It seemed a very fitting and gracious thing. Yet so little did I stand in need of it, with my own high intensity and vitality, that I never thought it worth while to have a cocktail before my own meal when I ate alone. On the other hand, I well remember a very brilliant man, somewhat older than I, who occasionally visited me. He liked whiskey, and I recall sitting whole afternoons in my den, drinking steadily with him, drink for drink, until he was mildly lighted up, and I was slightly aware that I had drunk some whiskey. Now why did I do this? I don't know, save that the old schooling held, the training of the old days and nights glass in hand with men, the drinking ways of drink and drinkers. Besides, I no longer feared John Barleycorn. Mine was that most dangerous stage when a man believes himself John Barleycorn's master. I had proved it to my satisfaction in the long years of work and study. I could drink when I wanted, refrain when I wanted, drink without getting drunk, and to cap everything, I was thoroughly conscious that I had no liking for the stuff. During this period I drank precisely for the same reason I had drunk with Scotty and the Harpooner and with the Oyster Pirates, because it was an act that men performed with whom I wanted to behave as a man. These brilliant ones, these adventurers of the mind, drank. Very well, there was no reason I should not drink with them, I who knew so confidently that I had nothing to fear from John Barleycorn. And the foregoing was my attitude of mind for years. Occasionally I got well jingled, but such occasions were rare. It interfered with my work, and I permitted nothing to interfere with my work. I remember when spending several months in the east end of London, during which time I wrote a book, and adventured much amongst the worst of the slum classes, that I got drunk several times, and was mightily wroth with myself because it interfered with my writing. Yet these very times were because I was out on the adventure path where John Barleycorn is always to be found. Then, too, with the certitude of long training and unholy intimacy, there were occasions when I engaged in drinking hours with men. 
Of course, this was on the adventure path in various parts of the world, and it was a matter of pride. It is a queer man pride that leads one to drink with men in order to show as strong a head as they. But this queer man pride is not theory, it is fact. For instance, a wild band of young revolutionists invited me as the guest of honor to a beer bust. It is the only technical beer bust I ever attended. I did not know the true inwardness of the affair when I accepted. I imagined that the talk would be wild and high, that some of them might drink more than they might, and that I would drink discreetly but it seemed these beer busts were a diversion of these high-spirited young fellows whereby they whiled away the tedium of existence by making fools of their betters as i learned afterward they had got their previous guest of honor a brilliant young radical unskilled in drinking quite pipped when i found myself with them and the situation dawned on me up rose my queer man pride i'd show them the young rascals i'd show them who was husky and chesty who had the vitality and the constitution the stomach and the head who could make most of a swine of himself and show at least these unlicked cubs who thought they could outdrink me you see it was an endurance test and no man likes to give another best faugh it was steam beer i had learned more expensive brews not for years had i drunk steam beer but when i had i had drunk with men and i guessed i could show these youngsters some ability in beer guzzling and the drinking began and i had to drink with the best of them some of them might lag but the guest of honor was not permitted to lag and all my austere nights of midnight oil all the books i had read all the wisdom i had gathered went glimmering before the ape and tiger in me that crawled up from the abysm of my heredity atavistic competitive and brutal lustful with strength and desire to outswine the swine and when the session broke up i was still on my feet and i walked erect unswaying which was more than can be said of some of my hosts i recall one of them in indignant tears on the street corner weeping as he pointed out my sober condition little he dreamed the iron clutch born of old training with which i held to my consciousness in my swimming brain kept control of my muscles and my qualms kept my voice unbroken and easy and my thoughts consecutive and logical yes and mixed up with it all i was privily a grin they hadn't made a fool of me in that drinking bout and i was proud of myself for the achievement darn it i am still proud so strangely is man compounded but i didn't write my thousand words next morning i was sick poisoned it was a day of wretchedness in the afternoon i had to give a public speech i gave it and i am confident it was as bad as i felt some of my hosts were there in the front rows to mark any signs on me of the night before i don't know what signs they marked but i marked signs on them and took consolation in the knowledge that they were just as sick as i never again i swore and i have never been inveigled into another beer bust for that matter that was my last drinking bout of any sort oh i have drunk ever since 
but with more wisdom, more discretion, and never in a competitive spirit. It is thus that the seasoned drinker grows seasoned. To show that at this period in my life drinking was wholly a matter of companionship, I remember crossing the Atlantic in the old Teutonic. It chanced at the start that I chummed with an English cable operator and a younger member of a Spanish shipping firm. Now the only thing they drank was horse's neck, a long, soft, cool drink with an apple peel or an orange peel floating in it. And for that whole voyage, I drank horse's necks with my two companions. On the other hand, had they drunk whiskey, I should have drunk whiskey with them. From this it must not be concluded that I was merely weak. I didn't care. I had no morality in the matter. I was strong with youth and unafraid, and alcohol was an utterly negligible question as far as I was concerned. Chapter 28 not yet was I ready to tuck my arms in John Barleycorn's. The older I got, the greater my success, the more money I earned, the wider was the command of the world that became mine, and the more prominently did John Barleycorn bulk in my life. And still I maintained no more than a nodding acquaintance with him. I drank for the sake of sociability, and when alone I did not drink. Sometimes I got jingled, but I considered such jingles the mild price I paid for sociability. To show how unripe I was for John Barleycorn, when, at this time, I descended into my slough of despond, I never dreamed of turning to John Barleycorn for a helping hand. I had life troubles and heart troubles which are neither here nor there in this narrative, but combined with them were intellectual troubles which are indeed germane. Mine was no uncommon experience. I had read too much positive science and lived too much positive life. In the eagerness of youth, I had made the ancient mistake of pursuing truth too relentlessly. I had torn her veils from her, and the sight was too terrible for me to stand. In brief, I lost my fine faiths in pretty well everything except humanity, and the humanity I retained faith in was a very stark humanity indeed. This long sickness of pessimism is too well known to most of us to be detailed here. Let it suffice to state that I had it very bad. I meditated suicide coolly, as a Greek philosopher might. My regret was that there were too many dependent directly upon me for food and shelter for me to quit living. But that was sheer morality. What really saved me was the one remaining illusion, the people. The things I had fought for and burned my midnight oil for had failed me. Success, I despised it. Recognition, it was dead ashes. Society, men and women above the ruck and muck of the waterfront and the forecastle, I was appalled by their unlovely mental mediocrity. Love of woman, it was like all the rest. Money, I could sleep in only one bed at a time, and of what worth was an income of a hundred porterhouses a day when I could eat only one? Art? culture? In the face of the iron facts of biology, such things were ridiculous. The exponents of such things only the more ridiculous. From the foregoing, it can be seen how very sick I was. I was born a fighter. 
the things i had fought for had proved not worth the fight remained the people my fight was finished yet something was left still to fight for the people but while i was discovering this one last tie to bind me to life in my extremity in the depths of despond walking in the valley of the shadow my ears were deaf to john barleycorn never the remotest whisper arose in my consciousness that john barleycorn was the anodyne that he could lie me along to live one way only was uppermost in my thought my revolver the crashing eternal darkness of a bullet there was plenty of whiskey in the house for my guests i never touched it i grew afraid of my revolver afraid during the period in which the radiant flashing vision of the people was forming in my mind and will so obsessed was i with the desire to die that i feared i might commit the act in my sleep and i was compelled to give my revolver away to others who were to lose it for me where my subconscious hand might not find it but the people saved me by the people was i handcuffed to life there was still one fight left in me and here was the thing for which to fight i threw all precaution to the winds threw myself with fiercer zeal into the fight for socialism laughed at the editors and publishers who warned me and who were the sources of my hundred porterhouses a day and was brutally careless of whose feelings i hurt and of how savagely i hurt them as the well-balanced radicals charged at the time my efforts were so strenuous so unsafe and unsane so ultra-revolutionary that i retarded the socialist development in the united states by five years in passing i wish to remark at this late date that it is my fond belief that i accelerated the socialist development in the united states by at least five minutes it was the people and no thanks to john barleycorn who pulled me through my long sickness and when i was convalescent came the love of woman to complete the cure and lull my pessimism asleep for many a long day until john barleycorn again awoke it but in the meantime i pursued truth less relentlessly refraining from tearing her last veils aside even when i clutched them in my hand i no longer cared to look upon truth naked i refused to permit myself to see a second time what i had once seen and the memory of what i had that time seen i resolutely blotted from my mind and i was very happy life went well with me i took delight in little things the big things i declined to take too seriously i still read the books but not with the old eagerness i still read the books to-day but never again shall i read them with that old glory of youthful passion when i hacked to the call from over and beyond that whispered me on to win to the mystery at the back of life and behind the stars the point of this chapter is that in the long sickness that at some time comes to most of us i came through without any appeal for aid to john barleycorn love socialism the people healthy figments of man's mind were the things that cured and saved me if ever a man was not a born alcoholic i believe that i am that man and yet well 
let the succeeding chapters tell their tale for in them will be shown how i paid for my previous quarter of a century of contact with ever accessible john barleycorn end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine after my long sickness my drinking continued to be convivial i drank when others drank and i was with them but imperceptibly my need for alcohol took form and began to grow it was not a body need i boxed swam sailed rode horses lived in the open and errantly healthful life and passed life insurance examinations with flying colors in its inception now that i look back upon it this need for alcohol was a mental need a nerve need a good spirits need how can i explain it was something like this physiologically from the standpoint of palate and stomach alcohol was as it had always been repulsive it tasted no better than beer did when i was five than bitter claret did when i was seven when i was alone writing or studying i had no need for it but i was growing old or wise or both or senile as an alternative when i was in company i was less pleased less excited with the things said and done erstwhile worthwhile fun and stunts seemed no longer worthwhile and it was a torment to listen to the insipidities and stupidities of women to the pompous arrogant sayings of the little half-baked men it is the penalty one pays for reading the books too much or for being oneself a fool in my case it does not matter which was my trouble the trouble itself was the fact the condition of the fact was mine for me the life and light and sparkle of human intercourse were dwindling i had climbed too high among the stars or maybe i had slept too hard yet i was not hysterical nor in any way overwrought my pulse was normal my heart was an amazement of excellence to the insurance doctors my lungs threw the said doctors into ecstasies i wrote a thousand words every day i was punctiliously exact in dealing with all the affairs of life that fell to my lot i exercised in joy and gladness i slept at night like a babe but well as soon as i got out in the company of others i was driven to melancholy and spiritual tears i could neither laugh with nor at the solemn utterances of men i esteemed ponderous asses nor could i laugh nor engage in my old-time lightsome persiflage with the silly superficial chatterings of women who underneath all their silliness and softness were as primitive direct and deadly in their pursuit of biological destiny as the monkeys women were before they shed their furry coats and replaced them with the furs of other animals and i was not pessimistic i swear i was not pessimistic i was merely bored i had seen the same show too often listened too often to the same songs and the same jokes i knew too much about the box office receipts i knew the cogs of the machinery behind the scenes so well that the posing on the stage and the laughter and the song could not drown the creaking of the wheels behind it doesn't pay to go behind the scenes and see the angel-voiced tenor beat his wife well i'd been behind and i was paying for it or else i was a fool 
It is immaterial which was my situation. The situation is what counts, and the situation was that social intercourse for me was getting painful and difficult. On the other hand, it must be stated that on rare occasions, on very rare occasions, I did meet rare souls, or fools like me, with whom I could spend magnificent hours among the stars or in the paradise of fools. I was married to a rare soul, or a fool, who never bored me and who was always a source of new and unending surprise and delight. But I could not spend all my hours solely in her company, nor would it have been fair nor wise to compel her to spend all her hours in my company. Besides, I had written a string of successful books and society demands some portion of the recreative hours of a fellow that writes books. And any normal man, of himself and his needs, demands some hours of his fellow men. And now we begin to come to it. How to face the social intercourse game with the glamour gone. John Barleycorn the ever-patient one had waited a quarter of a century and more for me to reach my hand out in need of him. His thousand tricks had failed, thanks to my constitution and good luck, but he had more tricks in his bag. A cocktail or two, or several, I found, cheered me up for the foolishness of foolish people. A cocktail, or several, before dinner, enabled me to laugh wholeheartedly at things which had long since ceased being laughable. The cocktail was a prod, a spur, a kick, to my jaded mind and bored spirits. It recrudesced the laughter and the song, and put a lilt into my own imagination so that I could laugh and sing and say foolish things with the liveliest of them, or platitudes with verve and intensity to the satisfaction of the pompous, mediocre ones who knew no other way to talk. A poor companion without a cocktail, I became a very good companion with one. I achieved a false exhilaration, drugged myself to merriment, and the thing began so imperceptibly that I, old intimate of John Barleycorn, never dreamed whither it was leading me. I was beginning to call for music and wine. Soon I should be calling for madder music and more wine. It was at this time I became aware of waiting with expectancy for the pre-dinner cocktail. I wanted it, and I was conscious that I wanted it. I remember, while war corresponding in the Far East, of being irresistibly attracted to a certain home. Besides accepting all invitations to dinner, I made a point of dropping in almost every afternoon. Now, the hostess was a charming woman, but it was not for her sake that I was under her roof so frequently. It happened that she made by far the finest cocktail procurable in that large city where drink-mixing on the part of the foreign population was indeed an art. Up at the club, down at the hotels, and in other private houses, no such cocktails were created. Her cocktails were subtle. They were masterpieces. They were the least repulsive to the palate and carried the most kick. And yet I desired her cocktails only for sociability's sake to key myself to sociable moods. When I rode away from that city across hundreds of miles of rice fields and mountains, 
and through months of campaigning and on with the victorious japanese into manchuria i did not drink several bottles of whisky were always to be found on the backs of my pack horses yet i never broached a bottle for myself never took a drink by myself and never knew a desire to take such a drink oh if a white man came into my camp i opened a bottle and we drank together according to the way of men just as he would open a bottle and drink with me if i came into his camp i carried that whisky for social purposes and i so charged it up to my expense account to the newspaper for which i worked only in retrospect can i mark the almost imperceptible growth of my desire there were little hints then that i did not take little straws in the wind that i did not see little incidents the gravity of which i did not realize for instance for some years it had been my practice each winter to cruise for six or eight weeks on san francisco bay my stout sloop yacht the spray had a comfortable cabin and a coal stove a korean boy did the cooking and i usually took a friend or so along to share the joys of the cruise also i took my machine along and did my thousand words a day on the particular trip i have in mind cloudsley and toddy came along this was toddy's first trip on previous trips cloudsley had elected to drink beer so i had kept the yacht supplied with beer and had drunk beer with him but on this cruise the situation was different toddy was so nicknamed because of his diabolical cleverness in concocting toddies so i brought whiskey along a couple of gallons alas many another gallon i bought for cloudsley and i got into the habit of drinking a certain hot toddy that actually tasted delicious going down and that carried the most exhilarating kick imaginable i liked those toddies i grew to look forward to the making of them we drank them regularly one before breakfast one before dinner one before supper and a final one when we went to bed we never got drunk but i will say that four times a day we were very genial and when in the middle of the cruise toddy was called back to san francisco on business cloudsley and i saw to it that the korean boy mixed toddies regularly for us according to formula but that was only on the boat back on the land in my house i took no breakfast eye opener no bed going nightcap and i haven't drunk hot toddies since and that was many a year ago but the point is i liked those toddies the geniality of which they were provocative was marvellous they were eloquent proselytes for john barleycorn in their own small insidious way they were tickles of the something destined to grow into daily and deadly desire and i didn't know never dreamed i who had lived with john barleycorn for so many years and laughed at all his unavailing attempts to win me chapter thirty part of the process of recovering from my long sickness was to find delight in little things 
in things unconnected with books and problems, in play, in games of tag in the swimming pool, in flying kites, in fooling with horses, in working out mechanical puzzles. As a result, I grew tired of the city. On the ranch, in the valley of the moon, I found my paradise. I gave up living in cities. All the cities held for me were music, the theater, and Turkish baths. And all went well with me. I worked hard, played hard, and was very happy. I read more fiction and less fact. I did not study a tithe as much as I had studied in the past. I still took an interest in the fundamental problems of existence, but it was a very cautious interest, for I had burned my fingers that time I clutched at the veils of truth and wrestled them from her. There was a bit of lie in this attitude of mine, a bit of hypocrisy, but the lie and the hypocrisy were those of a man desiring to live. I deliberately blinded myself to what I took to be the savage interpretation of biological fact. After all, I was merely forswearing a bad habit, foregoing a bad frame of mind. And I repeat, I was very happy. And, I add, that in all my days, measuring them with cold, considerative judgment, this was, far and away beyond all other periods, the happiest period of my life. But the time was at hand, rhymeless and reasonless, so far as I can see, when I was to begin to pay for my score of years of dallying with John Barleycorn. Occasionally, guests journeyed to the ranch and remained a few days. Some did not drink. But to those who did drink, the absence of all alcohol on the ranch was a hardship. I could not violate my sense of hospitality by compelling them to endure this hardship. I ordered in a stock for my guests. I was never interested enough in cocktails to know how they were made. So I got a barkeeper in Oakland to make them in bulk and ship them to me. When I had no guests, I didn't drink. But I began to notice, when I finished my morning's work, that I was glad if there was a guest, for then I could drink a cocktail with him. Now I was so clean of alcohol that even a single cocktail was provocative of pitch. A single cocktail would glow the mind and tickle a laugh for the few minutes prior to sitting down to table and starting the delightful process of eating. On the other hand, such was the strength of my stomach, of my alcoholic resistance, that the single cocktail was only the glimmer of a glow, the faintest tickle of a laugh. One day, a friend frankly and shamelessly suggested a second cocktail. I drank the second with him. The glow was appreciably longer and warmer, the laughter deeper and more resonant. One does not forget such experiences. Sometime I almost think that it was because I was so very happy that I started on my real drinking. I remember one day Charmian and I took a long ride over the mountains on our horses. The servants had been dismissed for the day, and we returned late at night to a jolly, chafing dish supper oh it was good to be alive that night while the supper was preparing the two of us alone in the kitchen i personally was at the top of life such things as the books and ultimate truth did not exist 
My body was gloriously healthy and healthily tired from the long ride. It had been a splendid day. The night was splendid. I was with the woman who was my mate, picnicking in gleeful abandon. I had no troubles. The bills were all paid, and a surplus of money was rolling in on me. The future ever widened before me. And right there, in the kitchen, delicious things bubbled in the chafing dish, our laughter bubbled, and my stomach was keen with a most delicious edge of appetite. I felt so good that somehow, somewhere, in me arose an insatiable greed to feel better. I was so happy that I wanted to pitch my happiness even higher, and I knew the way. Ten thousand contacts with John Barleycorn had taught me. Several times I wandered out of the kitchen to the cocktail bottle, and each time I left it diminished by one man's size cocktail. The result was splendid. I wasn't jingled, I wasn't lighted up, but I was warmed. I glowed. My happiness was pyramided. Munificent as life was to me, I added to that munificence. It was a great hour, one of my greatest. But I paid for it long afterwards, as you will see. One does not forget such experiences, and in human stupidity cannot be brought to realize that there is no immutable law which decrees that same things shall produce same results. For they don't. Else would the thousandth pipe of opium be provocative of similar delights to the first. Else would one cocktail instead of several produce an equivalent glow after a year of cocktails. One day, just before I ate midday dinner, after my morning's writing was done, when I had no guest, I took a cocktail by myself. Thereafter, when there were no guests, I took this daily pre-dinner cocktail. And right there John Barleycorn had me. I was beginning to drink regularly. I was beginning to drink alone. And I was beginning to drink not for hospitality's sake, not for the sake of the taste, but for the effect of the drink. I wanted that daily pre-dinner cocktail and it never crossed my mind that there was any reason I should not have it. I paid for it. I could pay for a thousand cocktails each day if I wanted. And what was a cocktail? One cocktail. To me, who had on so many occasions, for so many years, had drunk inordinate quantities of stiffer stuff and been unharmed. The program of my ranch life was as follows. Each morning at 8.30, having been reading or correcting proofs in bed since 4 or 5, I went to my desk. Odds and ends of correspondence and notes occupied me till 9, and at 9 sharp, invariably, I began my writing. By eleven, sometimes a few minutes earlier or later, my thousand words were finished. Another half hour at cleaning up my desk, and my day's work was done, so that eleven thirty I got into a hammock under the trees with my mail bag and the morning newspaper. At twelve thirty I ate dinner, and in the afternoon I swam and rode. One morning, 
at eleven thirty before i got into the hammock i took a cocktail i repeated this on subsequent mornings of course taking another cocktail just before i ate at twelve thirty soon i found myself seated at my desk in the midst of my thousand words looking forward to that eleven thirty cocktail at last now i was thoroughly conscious that i desired alcohol but what of it i wasn't afraid of john barleycorn i had associated with him too long i was wise in the matter of drink i was discreet never again would i drink to excess i knew the dangers and the pitfalls of john barleycorn the various ways by which he had tried to kill me in the past but all that was past long past never again would i drink myself to stupefaction never again would i get drunk all i wanted and all i would take was just enough to glow and warm me to kick geniality alive in me and put laughter in my throat and stir the maggots of imagination slightly in my brain oh i was thoroughly master of myself and of john barleycorn end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one but the same stimulus to the human organism will not continue to produce the same response by and by i discovered there was no kick at all in one cocktail one cocktail left me dead there was no glow no laughter tickle two or three cocktails were required to produce the original effect of one and i wanted that effect i drank my first cocktail at eleven thirty when i took the morning's mail into the hammock and i drank my second cocktail an hour later just before i ate i got into the habit of crawling out of the hammock ten minutes earlier so as to find time and decency for two more cocktails ere i ate this became schedule three cocktails in the hour that intervened between my desk and dinner and these are two of the deadliest drinking habits regular drinking and solitary drinking i was always willing to drink when any one was around i drank by myself when no one was around then i made another step when i had for a guest a man of limited drinking caliber i took two drinks to his one one drink with him the other drink without him and of which he did not know i stole that other drink and worse than that i began the habit of drinking alone when there was a guest a man a comrade with whom i could have drunk but john barleycorn furnished the extenuation it was a wrong thing to trip a guest up with excess of hospitality and get him drunk if i persuaded him with his limited caliber into drinking up with me i'd surely get him drunk what could i do but steal that every second drink or else deny myself the kick equivalent to what he got out of half the number please remember as i recite this development of my drinking that i am no fool no weakling as the world measures such things i am a success i dare to say a success more conspicuous than the success of the average successful man and a success 
that required a pretty fair amount of brains and willpower. My body is a strong body. It has survived where weaklings died like flies. And yet these things which I am relating happened to my body and to me. I am a fact. My drinking is a fact. My drinking is a thing that has happened, and is not theory nor speculation. And as I see it, it but lays the emphasis on the power of John Barleycorn. A savagery that we still permit to exist, a deadly institution that lingers from the mad old brutal days, and that takes its heavy toll of youth and strength and high spirit, and of very much of all of the best we breed. To return, after a boisterous afternoon in the swimming pool, followed by a glorious ride on horseback over the mountains or up or down the valley of the moon, I found myself so keyed and splendid that I desired to be more highly keyed, to feel more splendid. I knew the way. A cocktail before supper was not the way. Two or three, at the very least, was what was needed. I took them. Why not? It was living. I had always dearly loved to live. This also became part of the daily schedule. Then, too, I was perpetually finding excuses for extra cocktails. It might be the assembling of a particularly jolly crowd, a touch of anger against my architect, or against a thieving stone mason working on my barn, the death of my favorite horse in a barbed wire fence, or news of good fortune in the morning mail from my dealings with editors and publishers. It was immaterial what the excuse might be, once the desire had germinated in me, the thing was, I wanted alcohol. At last, after a score and more of years of dallying and of not wanting, now I wanted it. And my strength was my weakness. I required two, three, or four drinks to get an effect commensurate with the effect the average man got out of one drink. One rule I observed. I never took a drink until my day's work of writing a thousand words was done. And, when done, the cocktails reared a wall of inhibition in my brain between the day's work done and the rest of the day of fun to come. My work ceased from my consciousness. No thought of it flickered in my brain till next morning at nine o'clock when I sat at my desk and began my next thousand words. This was a desirable condition of mind to achieve. I conserved my energy by means of this alcoholic inhibition. John Barleycorn was not so black as he was painted. He did a fellow many a good turn, and this was one of them. And I turned out work that was healthful and wholesome and sincere. It was never pessimistic. The way of life I had learned in my long sickness. I knew the illusions were right, and I exalted the illusions. Oh, I still turn out the same sort of work stuff that is clean, alive, optimistic, and that makes toward life. And I am always assured by the critics of my superabundant and abounding vitality, and of how thoroughly I am deluded by these very illusions I exploit. And while on this digression, let me repeat the question I have repeated to myself ten thousand times. Why did I drink? 
What need was there for it? I was happy. Was it because I was too happy? I was strong. Was it because I was too strong? Did I possess too much vitality? I don't know why I drank. I cannot answer, though I can voice the suspicion that ever grows in me. I had been in too familiar contact with John Barleycorn through too many years. A left-handed man, by long practice, can become a right-handed man. Had I, a non-alcoholic, by long practice, become an alcoholic? I was so happy. I had won through my long sickness to the satisfying love of woman. I earned more money with less endeavor. I glowed with health. I slept like a babe. I continued to write successful books, and in sociological controversy I saw my opponents confuted with the facts of the times that daily reared new buttresses to my intellectual position. From day's end to day's end I never knew sorrow, disappointment, nor regret. I was happy all the time. Life was one unending song. I begrudged the very hours of blessed sleep because by that much was I robbed of the joy that would have been mine had I remained awake. And yet I drank. And John Barleycorn, all unguessed by me, was setting the stage for a sickness all his own. The more I drank, the more I was required to drink to get an equivalent effect. When I left the Valley of the Moon and went to the city and dined out, a cocktail served at table was a wan and worthless thing. There was no pre-dinner kick in it. On my way to dinner, I was compelled to accumulate the kick two cocktails, three, and if I met some fellows, four or five, or six, it didn't matter within several. Once I was in a rush. I had no time decently to accumulate the several drinks. A brilliant idea came to me. I told the barkeeper to mix me a double cocktail. Thereafter, Whenever I was in a hurry, I ordered double cocktails. It saved time. One result of this regular heavy drinking was to jade me. My mind grew so accustomed to spring and liven by artificial means that without artificial means it refused to spring and liven. Alcohol became more and more imperative in order to meet people, in order to become sociably fit. I had to get the kick and the hit of the stuff, the crawl of the maggots, the genial brain glow, the laughter tickle, the touch of devilishness and sting, the smile over the face of things, ere I could join my fellows and make one with them. Another result was that John Barleycorn was beginning to trip me up. He was thrusting my long sickness back upon me, inveigling me into again pursuing truth and snatching her veils away from her, tricking me into looking reality stark in the face. But this came on gradually. My thoughts were growing harsh again, though they grew harsh slowly. Sometimes warning thoughts crossed my mind. 
Where was this steady drinking leading? But trust John Barleycorn to silence such questions. Come on and have a drink, and I'll tell you all about it, is his way. And it works. For instance, the following is a case in point, and one which John Barleycorn never wearied of reminding me. I had suffered an accident which required a ticklish operation. One morning, a week after I had come off the table, I lay on my hospital bed, weak and weary. The sunburn of my face, what little of it could be seen through a scraggly growth of beard, had faded to a sickly yellow. My doctor stood at my bedside on the verge of departure. He glared disapprovingly at the cigarette I was smoking. That's what you ought to quit, he lectured. It will get you in the end. Look at me. I looked. He was about my own age, broad-shouldered, deep-chested, eyes sparkling, and ruddy-cheeked with health. A finer specimen of manhood one would not ask. I used to smoke, he went on. Cigars, but I gave even them up, and look at me. The man was arrogant, and rightly arrogant, with conscious well-being, and within a month he was dead. It was no accident. Half a dozen different bugs of long scientific names had attacked and destroyed him. The complications were astonishing and painful, and for days before he died the screams of agony of that splendid manhood could be heard for a block around. He died screaming. You see, said John Barleycorn, he took care of himself. He even stopped smoking cigars. And that's what he got for it. Pretty rotten, eh? But the bugs will jump. There's no forfending them. Your magnificent doctor took every precaution, yet they got him. When the bug jumps, you can't tell where it will land. It may be you. Look what he missed. Will you miss all I can give you, only to have a bug jump on you and drag you down? There is no equity in life. It's all a lottery. But I put the lying smile on the face of life and laugh at the facts. Smile with me and laugh. You'll get yours in the end, but in the meantime, laugh. It's a pretty dark world. I illuminate it for you. It's a rotten world when things can happen such as happened to your doctor. There's only one thing to do. Take another drink and forget it. And, of course, I took another drink for the inhibition that accompanied it. I took another drink every time John Barleycorn reminded me of what had happened. Yet I drank rationally, intelligently. I saw to it that the quality of the stuff was of the best. I sought the kick and the inhibition, and avoided the penalties of poor quality and of drunkenness. It is to be remarked in passing that when a man begins to drink rationally and intelligently, that he betrays a grave symptom of how far along the road he has traveled. But I continued to observe my rule of never taking my first drink of the day until the last word of my thousand words was written. On occasion, however, I took a day's vacation from my writing. At such times, since it was no violation of my rule, I didn't mind how early in the day I took that first drink. 
and persons who have never been through the drinking game wonder how the drinking habit grows chapter thirty two when the snark sailed on her long cruise from san francisco there was nothing to drink on board or rather we were all of us unaware that there was anything to drink nor did we discover it for many a month this sailing with a dry boat was malice aforethought on my part i had played john barleycorn a trick and it showed that I was listening ever so slightly to the faint warnings that were beginning to arise in my consciousness. Of course, I veiled the situation to myself and excused myself to John Barleycorn. And I was very scientific about it. I said that I would drink only while in ports during the dry sea stretches my system would be cleansed of the alcohol that soaked it so that when i reached a port i should be in shape to enjoy john barleycorn more thoroughly his bite would be sharper his kick keener and more delicious we were twenty-seven days on the traverse between san francisco and honolulu after the first day out the thought of a drink never troubled me this i take to show how intrinsically i am not an alcoholic sometimes during the traverse looking ahead and anticipating the delightful lane luncheons and dinners of hawaii i had been there a couple of times before i thought naturally of the drinks that would precede those meals i did not think of those drinks with any yearning with any irk at the length of the voyage i merely thought they would be nice and jolly part of the atmosphere of a proper meal thus once again i proved to my complete satisfaction that i was john barleycorn's master I could drink when I wanted, refrain when I wanted. Therefore, I would continue to drink when I wanted. Some five months were spent in the various islands of the Hawaiian group. Being ashore, I drank. I even drank a bit more than I had been accustomed to drink in California prior to the voyage. The people of Hawaii seemed to drink a bit more, on the average, than the people in more temperate latitudes. I do not intend the pun, and can awkwardly revise the statement to latitudes more remote from the equator. Yet, Hawaii is only subtropical. The deeper I got into the tropics, the deeper I found men drank the deeper i drank myself from hawaii we sailed for the marquesas the traverse occupied sixty days for sixty days we never raised land a sail nor a steamer smoke but early in those sixty days the cook giving an overhauling to the galley made a find down in the bottom of a deep locker he found a dozen bottles of angelica and muscatel these had come down from the kitchen cellar of the ranch along with the home preserved fruits and jellies six months in the galley heat had effected some sort of a change in the thick sweet wine branded it i imagine i took a taste delicious and thereafter once each day at twelve o'clock after our observations were worked up and the snark's position charted i drank half a tumbler of the stuff it had a rare kick to it 
it warmed the cockles of my geniality and put a fairer face on the truly fair face of the sea. Each morning, below, sweating out my thousand words, I found myself looking forward to that twelve o'clock event of the day. The trouble was, I had to share the stuff, and the length of the traverse was doubtful. I regretted that there were not more than a dozen bottles, and when they were gone, I even regretted that I had shared any of it. I was thirsty for the alcohol, and eager to arrive in the Marquesas. So it was that I reached the Marquesas the possessor of a real man's size thirst. And in the Marquesas were several white men, a lot of sickly natives, much magnificent scenery, plenty of trade rum, and immense quantity of absinthe, but neither whiskey nor gin. The trade rum scorched the skin off one's mouth. I know, because I tried it. But I had ever been plastic, and I accepted the absinthe. The trouble with the stuff was that I had to take such inordinate quantities in order to feel the slightest effect. From the Marquesas I sailed with sufficient absinthe in ballast to last me to Tahiti, where I outfitted with Scotch and American whiskey, and thereafter there were no dry stretches between ports. But please do not misunderstand. There was no drunkenness, as drunkenness is ordinarily understood. No staggering and rolling around, no befuddlement of the senses. The skilled and seasoned drinker, with a strong constitution, never descends to anything like that. He drinks to feel good, to get a pleasant jingle, and no more than that. The things he carefully avoids are the nausea of over-drinking the after-effect of over-drinking, the helplessness and loss of pride of over-drinking. What the skilled and seasoned drinker achieves is a discreet and canny semi-intoxication, and he does it by the twelve-month around without any apparent penalty. There are hundreds of thousands of men of this sort in the United States today, in clubs, hotels, and in their own homes, men who are never drunk and who, though most of them will indignantly deny it, are rarely sober, and all of them fondly believe, as I fondly believed, that they are beating the game. On the sea stretches I was fairly abstemious, but ashore I drank more. I seemed to need more anyway in the tropics. This is a common experience, for the excessive consumption of alcohol in the tropics by white men is a notorious fact. The tropics is no place for white-skinned men. Their skin pigment does not protect them against the excessive white light of the sun. The alternate violet rays and other high velocity and invisible rays from the upper end of the spectrum rip and tear through their tissues, just as the X-ray ripped and tore through the tissues of so many experimenters before they learned the danger. White men in the tropics undergo radical changes of nature. They become savage, merciless. They commit monstrous acts of cruelty that they would never dream of committing in their original temperate climate. They become nervous, irritable, and less moral. 
and they drink as they never drank before drinking is one form of the many forms of degeneration that set in when white men are exposed too long to too much white light the increase of alcoholic consumption is automatic the tropics is no place for a long sojourn they seem doomed to die anyway and the heavy drinking expedites the progress they don't reason about it they just do it the sun sickness got me despite the fact that i had been in the tropics only a couple of years i drank heavily during this time but right here i wish to forestall misunderstanding the drinking was not the cause of the sickness nor of the abandonment of the voyage i was strong as a bull and for many months i fought the sun sickness that was ripping and tearing my surface and nervous tissues to pieces all through the new hebrides and the solomons and up among the atolls on the line during this period under a tropic sun rotten with malaria and suffering from a few minor afflictions such as biblical leprosy with the silvery skin i did the work of five men to navigate a vessel through the reefs and shoals and passages and unlighted coasts of the coral seas is a man's work in itself i was the only navigator on board there was no one to check me up on the working out of my observations nor with whom i could advise in the ticklish darkness among uncharted reefs and shoals and i stood all watches there was no seaman on board whom i could trust to stand a mate's watch i was mate as well as captain twenty-four hours a day were the watches i stood at sea catching catnaps when i might third i was doctor and let me say right here that the doctor's job in the snark at that time was a man's job all on board suffered from malaria the real tropical malaria that can kill in three months all on board suffered from perforating ulcers and from the maddening itch of ngari ngari a japanese cook went insane from his too numerous inflictions one of my polynesian sailors lay at death's door with black water fever oh yes it was a full man's job and i dosed and doctored and pulled teeth and dragged my patience through mild little things like tomaine poisoning fourth i was a writer i sweated out my thousand words a day every day except when the shock of fever smote me or a couple of nasty squalls smote the snark in the morning fifth i was a traveller and a writer eager to see things and to gather material into my notebooks and sixth i was master and owner of the craft that was visiting strange places where visitors are rare and where visitors are made much of so here i had to hold up the social end entertain on board be entertained ashore by planters traders governors captains of war vessels kinky-headed cannibal kings and prime ministers sometimes fortunate enough to be clad in cotton shifts of course i drank i drank with my guests and hosts also i drank by myself doing the work of five men i thought entitled me to drink alcohol was good for a man who overworked i noted its effect on my small crew when 
breaking their backs and hearts at heaving up anchor in forty fathoms they knocked off gasping and trembling at the end of half an hour and had new life put into them by stiff jolts of rum they caught their breaths wiped their mouths and went to it again with a will and when we careened the snark and had to work in the water to our necks between shocks of fever i noted how raw trade rum helped the work along and here again we come to another side of many-sided john barleycorn on the face of it he gives something for nothing where no strength remains he finds new strength the wearied one rises to greater effort for the time being there is an actual accession of strength i remember passing coal on an ocean steamer through eight days of hell during which time we coal passers were kept to the job by being fed with whiskey we toiled half drunk all the time and without the whiskey we could not have passed the coal this strength john barleycorn gives is not fictitious strength it is real strength but it is manufactured out of the sources of strength and it must ultimately be paid for and with interest but what weary human will look so far ahead he takes this apparently miraculous accession of strength at its face value and many an overworked business and professional man as well as a harried common laborer has travelled john barleycorn's death road because of this mistake End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 I went to Australia to go into hospital and get tinkered up, after which I planned to go on with the voyage. And during the long weeks I lay in hospital, from the first day I never missed alcohol. I never thought about it. I knew I should have it again when I was on my feet. But when I regained my feet, I was not cured of my major afflictions. Naaman's silvery skin was still mine. The mysterious sun-sickness, which the experts of Australia could not fathom, still ripped and tore my tissues. Malaria still festered in me and put me on my back in shivering delirium at the most unexpected moments compelling me to cancel a double lecture tour which had been arranged. So I abandoned the snark voyage and sought a cooler climate. The day I came out of hospital I took up drinking again as a matter of course. I drank wine at meals. I drank cocktails before meals. I drank scotch highballs when anybody I chanced to be with was drinking them. I was so thoroughly the master of John Barleycorn, I could take up with him or let go of him whenever I pleased, just as I had done all my life. After a time, for cooler climate, I went down to southernmost Tasmania in 43 South, and I found myself in a place where there was nothing to drink. It didn't mean anything. I didn't drink. It was no hardship. I soaked in the cool air, rode horseback, and did my thousand words a day, save when the fever shock came in the morning. And for fear that the idea may still lurk in some minds that my preceding years of drinking were the cause of my disabilities, I here point out that my Japanese cabin boy, Nakata, still with me, was rotten with fever, as was Charmian, who, in addition, was in the slough of a tropical neurasthenia 
that required several years of temperate climates to cure, and that neither she nor Nakata drank or ever had drunk. When I returned to Hobart Town, where drink was obtainable, I drank as of old. The same when I arrived back in Australia. On the contrary, when I sailed from Australia on a tramp steamer commanded by an abstemious captain, I took no drink along and had no drink for the forty-three days' passage. Arrived in Ecuador squarely under the equatorial sun where the humans were dying of yellow fever, smallpox, and the plague, I promptly drank again every drink of every sort that had a kick in it. I caught none of these diseases. Neither did Charmian nor Nakata, who did not drink. Enamored of the tropics, despite the damage done me, I stopped in various places, and was a long while getting back to the splendid, temperate climate of California. I did my thousand words a day, traveling or stopping over, suffered my last faint fever shock, saw my silvery skin vanish, and my sun-torn tissues healthily knit again, and drank as a broad-shouldered, chesty man may drink. Chapter 34 Back on the ranch, in the Valley of the Moon, I resumed my steady drinking. My program was no drink in the morning. First drink time came with the completion of my thousand words. Then, between that and the midday meal, were drinks numerous enough to develop a pleasant jingle. Again, in the hour preceding the evening meal, I developed another pleasant jingle. Nobody ever saw me drunk, for the simple reason that I never was drunk. But I did get a jingle twice each day, and the amount of alcohol I consumed every day, if loosed in the system of one unaccustomed to drink, would have put such a one on his back and out. It was the old proposition. The more I drank, the more I was compelled to drink in order to get an effect. The time came when cocktails were inadequate. I had neither the time in which to drink them, nor the space to accommodate them. Whiskey had a more powerful jolt. It gave quicker action with less quantity. Bourbon or rye or cunningly aged blends constituted the pre-midday drinking. In the afternoon, it was scotch and soda. My sleep, always excellent, now became not quite so excellent. I had been accustomed to read myself back asleep when I chanced to awake, but now this began to fail me. When I had read two or three of the small hours away and was as wide awake as ever, I found that a drink furnished the soporific effect. Sometimes two or three drinks were required. So short a period of sleep then intervened before early morning rising that my system did not have time to work off the alcohol. As a result, I awoke with mouth parched and dry, with a slight heaviness of head, and with a mild nervous palpitation in the stomach. In fact, I did not feel good. I was suffering from the morning sickness of the steady, heavy drinker. What I needed was a pick-me-up, a bracer. Trust John Barleycorn, once he has broken down a man's defenses. So it was a drink before breakfast to put me right for breakfast, the old poison of the snake that has bitten one. Another custom began at this time was that of the pitcher of water by the bedside to furnish relief to my scorched and sizzling membranes. 
I achieved a condition in which my body was never free from alcohol. Nor did I permit myself to be away from alcohol. If I traveled to out-of-the-way places, I declined to run the risk of finding them dry. I took a quart or several quarts along in my grip. In the past, I had been amazed by other men guilty of this practice. Now I did it myself unblushingly. And when I got out with the fellows, I cast all rules by the board. I drank when they drank, what they drank, and in the same way as they drank. I was carrying a beautiful alcoholic conflagration around with me. The thing fed on its own heat and flamed the fiercer. There was no time in all my waking time that I didn't want a drink. I began to anticipate the completion of my daily thousand words by taking a drink when only five hundred words were written. It was not long until I prefaced the beginning of the thousand words with a drink. The gravity of this I realized too well. I made new rules. Resolutely, I would refrain from drinking until my work was done. But a new and most diabolical complication arose. The work refused to be done without drinking. It just couldn't be done. I had to drink in order to do it. I was beginning to fight now. I had the craving at last, and it was mastering me. I would sit at my desk and dally with pad and pen, but words refused to flow. My brain could not think the proper thoughts, because continually it was obsessed with the one thought that across the room in the liquor cabinet stood John barleycorn. When, in despair, I took my drink, at once my brain loosened up and began to roll off the thousand words. In my townhouse in Oakland, I finished the stock of liquor and willfully refused to purchase more. It was no use, because Unfortunately, there remained in the bottom of the liquor cabinet a case of beer. In vain I tried to write. Now beer is a poor substitute for strong waters. Besides, I didn't like beer. Yet all I could think of was that beer so singularly accessible in the bottom of the cabinet. Not until I had drunk a pint of it did the words begin to reel off, and the thousand were reeled off to the tune of numerous pints. The worst of it was that the beer caused me severe heartburn, but despite the discomfort I soon finished off the case. The liquor cabinet was now bare. I did not replenish it. By truly heroic perseverance, I finally forced myself to write the daily thousand words without the spur of John Barleycorn. But all the time I wrote, I was keenly aware of the craving for a drink. And as soon as the morning's work was done, I was out of the house and away downtown to get my first drink. Merciful goodness! If John Barleycorn could get such sway over me, a non-alcoholic, what must be the sufferings of the true alcoholic, battling against the organic demands of his chemistry, while those closest to him sympathize little, understand less, and despise and deride him? Chapter 35 
But the freight has to be paid. John Barleycorn began to collect, and he collected not so much from the body as from the mind. The old long sickness, which had been purely an intellectual sickness, recrudesced. The old ghosts, long laid, lifted their heads again. But they were different and more deadly ghosts. The old ghosts, intellectual in their inception, had been laid by a sane and normal logic. But now they were raised by the white logic of John Barleycorn, and John Barleycorn never lays the ghosts of his raising. For this sickness of pessimism caused by drink, one must drink further in quest of the anodyne that John Barleycorn promises, but never delivers. How to describe this white logic to those who have never experienced it? It is perhaps better first to state how impossible such a description is. Take Hashish land, for instance, the land of enormous extensions of time and space. In past years I have made two memorable journeys into that far land. My adventures there are seared in sharpest detail on my brain. Yet I have tried vainly, with endless words, to describe any tiny particular phase to persons who have not traveled there. I use all the hyperbole of metaphor and tell what centuries to time and profounds of unthinkable agony and horror can obtain in each interval of all the intervals between the notes of a quick jig played quickly on the piano. I talk for an hour, elaborating that one phase of hashish land, and at the end I have told them nothing. And when I cannot tell them this one thing of all the vastness of terrible and wonderful things, I know I have failed to give them the slightest concept of hashish land. But let me talk with some other traveler in that weird region, and at once am I understood. A phrase, a word, conveys instantly to his mind what hours of words and phrases could not convey to the mind of the non-traveler. So it is with John Barleycorn's realm where the white logic reigns. To those untraveled there, the traveler's account must always seem unintelligible and fantastic. At the best, I may only beg of the untraveled ones to strive to take on faith the narrative I shall relate. For there are fatal intuitions of truth that reside in alcohol. Philip Sober vouches for Philip Drunk in this matter. There seem to be various orders of truth in this world. Some sorts of truth are truer than others. Some sorts of truth are lies, and these sorts are the very ones that have the greatest use value of life that desires to realize and live. At once, O oh, untraveled reader, you see how lunatic and blasphemous is the realm I am trying to describe to you in the language of John Barleycorn's tribe. It is not the language of your tribe, all of whose members resolutely shun the roads that lead to death and tread only the roads that lead to life. For there are roads and roads, and of truth there are orders and orders. But have patience, at least, through what seems no more than verbal yammerings, you may, perchance, glimpse faint far vistas of other lands and tribes.
alcohol tells truth but its truth is not normal what is normal is healthful what is healthful tends towards life normal truth is a different order and a lesser order of truth take a dray horse through all the vicissitudes of its life from first to last somehow in unguessably dim ways it must believe that life is good that the drudgery in harness is good that death no matter how blind instinctively apprehended is a dread giant that life is beneficent and worth while that in the end with fading life it will not be knocked about and beaten and urged beyond its sprained and spavined best that old age even is decent dignified and valuable though old age means a ribby scarecrow in a hawker's cart stumbling a step to every blow stumbling dizzily on through merciless servitude and slow disintegration to the end the end the apportionment of its parts of its subtle flesh its pink and springy bone its juices and ferments and all the sensateness that informed it to the chicken farm the hide house the glue rendering works and the bone meal fertilizer factory to the last stumble of its stumbling end this dray horse must abide by the mandates of the lesser truth that is the truth of life and that makes life possible to persist this dray horse like all other horses like all other animals including man is life blinded and sense struck it will live no matter what the price the game of life is good though all of life may be hurt and though all lives lose the game in the end this is the order of truth that obtains not for the universe but for the live things in it if they for a little space will endure ere they pass this order of truth no matter how erroneous it may be is the sane and normal order of truth the rational order of truth that life must believe in order to live to man alone among the animals has been given the awful privilege of reason man with his brain can penetrate the intoxicating show of things and look upon the universe brazen with indifference toward him and his dreams he can do this but it is not well for him to do it to live and live abundantly to sting with life to be alive which is to be what he is it is good that man be life blinded and sense struck what is good is true and this is the order of truth lesser though it be that man must know and guide his actions by with unswerving certitude that it is absolute truth and that in the universe no other order of truth can obtain it is good that man should accept at face value the cheats of sense and snares of flesh and through the fogs of sentiency pursue the lures and lies of passion it is good that he shall see neither shadows nor futilities nor be appalled by his lusts and rapacities and man does this countless men have glimpsed that other and truer order of truth and recoiled from it countless men have passed through the long sickness and lived to tell of it and deliberately to forget it to the end of their days 
They lived. They realized life, for life is what they were. They did right. And now comes John Barleycorn, with the curse he lays upon the imaginative man who is lusty with life and desire to live. John Barleycorn sends his white logic, the argent messenger of truth beyond truth, the antithesis of life, cruel and bleak as interstellar space, pulseless and frozen as absolute zero, dazzling with the frost of irrefragible logic and unforgettable fact. John Barleycorn will not let the dreamer dream, the liver live. He destroys birth and death, and dissipates to mist the paradox of being, until his victim cries out, as in the city of dreadful night, Our life's a cheat, our death a black abyss. And the feet of the victim of such dreadful intimacy take hold of the way of death. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 Back to personal experiences and the effects in the past of John Barleycorn's white logic on me. On my lovely ranch in the Valley of the Moon, brain-soaked with many months of alcohol, I am oppressed by the cosmic sadness that has always been the heritage of man. In vain do I ask myself why I should be sad. My nights are warm, my roof does not leak. I have food galore for all the caprices of appetite. Every creature comfort is mine. In my body are no aches nor pains. The good old flesh machine is running smoothly on. Neither brain nor muscle is overworked. I have land, money, power, recognition from the world, a consciousness that I do my meed of good in serving others, a mate whom I love, children that are of my own fond flesh. I have done and am doing what a good citizen of the world should do. I have built houses, many houses, and tilled many a hundred acres. And as for trees, have I not planted a hundred thousand? Everywhere, from any window of my house, I can gaze forth upon these trees of my planting, standing valiantly erect and aspiring toward the sun. My life had indeed fallen in pleasant places. Not a hundred men in a million have been so lucky as I. Yet with all this vast good fortune am I sad. And I am sad because John Barleycorn is with me. And John Barleycorn is with me because I was born in what future ages will call the dark ages before the ages of rational civilization. John Barleycorn is with me because in all the unwitting days of my youth John Barleycorn was accessible calling to me and inviting me on every corner and on every street between the corners. The pseudo-civilization into which I was born permitted everywhere licensed shops for the sale of soul poison. The system of life was so organized that I, and millions like me, was lured and drawn and driven to the poison shops. 
wander with me through one mood of the myriad moods of sadness into which one is plunged by john barleycorn i ride out over my beautiful ranch between my legs is a beautiful horse the air is wine the grapes on a score of rolling hills are red with autumn flame across sonoma mountains wisps of sea fog are stealing the afternoon sun smoulders in the drowsy sky i have everything to make me glad i am alive i am filled with dreams and mysteries i am all sun and air and sparkle i am vitalized organic i move i have the power of movement i command movement of the live thing i bestride i am possessed with the pomps of being and no proud passions and inspirations i have ten thousand august connotations i am a king in the kingdom of sense and trample the face of the uncomplaining dust and yet with jaundiced eye i gaze upon all the beauty and wonder about me and with jaundiced brain consider the pitiful figure i cut in this world that endured so long without me and that will again endure without me i remember the men who broke their hearts and their backs over this stubborn soil that now belongs to me as if anything imperishable could belong to the perishable these men passed i too shall pass these men toiled and cleared and planted gazed with aching eyes while they rested their labor stiffened bodies on these same sunrises and sunsets at the autumn glory of the grape and at the fog wisps stealing across the mountain and they are gone and i know that i too shall some day and soon be gone gone i am going now in my jaw are cunning artifices of the dentists which replace the parts of me already gone never again will i have the thumbs of my youth old fights and wrestlings have injured them irreparably that punch on the head of a man whose very name is forgotten settled this thumb finally and forever a slip grip at catch as catch can did for the other my lean runner's stomach has passed into the limbo of memory the joints of the legs that bear me up are not so adequate as they once were when in wild nights and days of toil and frolic i strained and snapped and ruptured them never again can i swing dizzily aloft and trust all the proud quick that is i to a single rope clutch in the driving blackness of storm never again can i run with sled dogs along the endless miles of arctic trail i am aware that within the disintegrating body which has been dying since i was born i carry a skeleton that under the rind of flesh which is called my face is a bony noseless death's head all of which does not shudder me to be afraid is to be healthy fear of death makes for life but the curse of the white logic is that it does not make one afraid the world sickness of the white logic makes one grin jocosely into the face of the noseless one and to sneer at all the phantasmagoria of living i look about me as i ride 
and on every hand I see the merciless and infinite waste of natural selection. The white logic insists upon opening the long-closed books, and by paragraph and chapter states the beauty and wonder I behold in terms of futility and dust. About me is murmur and hum, and I know it for the gnat swarm of the living, piping for a little space its thin plaint of troubled air. I return across the ranch. Twilight is on, and the hunting animals are out. I watch the piteous tragic play of life feeding on life. Here is no morality. Only in man is morality, and man created it. A code of action that makes toward living, and that is of the lesser order of truth. Yet all this I knew before in the weary days of my long sickness. These were the greater truths that I so successfully schooled myself to forget. The truths that were so serious that I refused to take them seriously and played with gently, oh, so gently, as sleeping dogs at the back of consciousness which I did not care to waken. I did but stir them and let them lie. I was too wise, too wicked wise, to wake them. But now white logic willy-nilly wakes them for me, for white logic, most valiant, is unafraid of all the monsters of the earthly dream. Let the doctors of all the schools condemn me, white logic whispers as I ride along. What of it? I am truth. You know it. You cannot combat me. They say I make for death. What of it? It is truth. Life lies in order to live. Life is a perpetual lie-telling process. Life is a mad dance in the domain of flux, wherein appearances in mighty tides ebb and flow, chained to the wheels of moons beyond our ken. Appearances are ghosts. Life is ghostland, where appearances change, transfuse, permeate each the other and all the others that are, that are not, that always flicker, fade, and pass, only to come again as new appearances, as other appearances. You are such an appearance, composed of countless appearances out of the past, all an appearance can know is mirage. You know mirages of desire. These very mirages are the unthinkable and incalculable conjuries of appearances that crowd in upon you and form you out of the past, and that sweep you on into dissemination into other unthinkable and incalculable conjuries of appearances to people the ghost land of the future. Life is apparitional and passes. You are an apparition. Through all the apparitions that preceded you and that composed the parts of you, you rose gibbering from the evolutionary mire, and gibbering you will pass on, interfusing, permeating the procession of apparitions that will succeed you. And, of course, it is all unanswerable. And as I ride along through the evening shadows, I sneer at that great fetish which Kant called the world. And I remember that another pessimist of sentiency has uttered, Transient are all. They, being born, must die, and being dead, are glad to be at rest. 
but here through the dusk comes one who is not glad to be at rest he is a workman on the ranch an old man an immigrant italian he takes his hat off to me in all civility because forsooth i am to him a lord of life i am food to him and shelter and existence he has toiled like a beast all his days and lived less comfortably than my horses in their deep strawed stalls he is labor crippled he shambles as he walks one shoulder is twisted higher than the other his hands are gnarled claws repulsive horrible as an apparition he is a pretty miserable specimen his brain is as stupid as his body is ugly his brain is so stupid that he does not know that he is an apparition the white logic chuckles to me he is sense drunk he is the slave of the dream of life his brain is filled with superrational sanctions and obsessions he believes in a transcendent overworld he has listened to the vagaries of the prophets who have given to him the sumptuous bubble of paradise he feels inarticulate self-affinities with self-conjured non-realities he sees penumbral visions of himself titubating fantastically through days and nights of space and stars beyond the shadow of any doubt he is convinced that the universe was made for him and that it is his destiny to live forever in the immaterial and supersensuous realms he and his kind have builded of the stuff of semblance and deception. But you, who have opened the books and who share my awful confidence, you know him for what he is, brother to you and the dust, a cosmic joke a sort of chemistry a garmented beast that arose out of the ruck of screaming beastliness by virtue and accident of two opposable great toes he is brother as well to the gorilla and the chimpanzee he thumps his chest in anger and roars and quivers with cataleptic ferocity he knows monstrous atavistic promptings and he is composed of all manner of shreds of abysmal and forgotten instincts yet he dreams he is immortal i argue feebly it is vastly wonderful for so stupid a clod to bestride the shoulders of time and ride the eternities pa is the retort would you then shut the books and exchange places with this thing that is only an appetite and a desire a marionette of the belly and the loins to be stupid is to be happy i contend then your ideal of happiness is a jelly-like organism floating in a tideless tepid twilight sea eh oh the victim cannot combat john barleycorn one step removed from the annihilating bliss of buddha's nirvana the white logic adds oh well here's the house cheer up and take a drink we know we illuminated you and i all the folly and the farce and in my book walled den the mausoleum of the thoughts of men i take my drink and other drinks and roust out the sleeping dogs from the recesses of my brain and hallow them on over the walls of prejudice and law and through all the cunning labyrinths of superstition and belief drink says the white logic 
the greeks believed that the gods gave them wine so that they might forget the miserableness of existence and remember what hein said well do i remember that flaming jews with the last breath all is done joy love sorrow macaroni the theatre lime trees raspberry drops the power of human relations gossip the barking of dogs champagne your clear white light is sickness i tell the white logic you lie by telling too strong a truth he quips back alas yes so topsy-turvy is existence i acknowledge sadly ah well liu ling was wiser than you the white logic girds you remember him i nod my head liu ling a hard drinker one of the group of bibulous poets who called themselves the seven sages of the bamboo grove and who lived in china many an ancient century ago it was liu ling prompts the white logic who declared that to a drunken man the affairs of this world appear but as much duckweed on a river very well have another scotch and let semblance and deception become duckweed on a river and while i pour and sip my scotch i remember another chinese philosopher shuang Tzu, who four centuries before christ challenged this dreamland of the world saying how then do i know but that the dead repent of having previously clung to life those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt while they dream they do not know that they dream some will even interpret the very dream they are dreaming and only when they awake do they know it was a dream fools think they are awake now and flatter themselves they know if they are really princes or peasants confucius and you are both dreams and i who say you are dreams i am but a dream myself once upon a time i shuang Tzu, dreamt i was a butterfly fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly i was conscious only of following my fancies as a butterfly and was unconscious of my individuality as a man suddenly i awaked and there i lay myself again now i do not know whether i was then a man dreaming i was a butterfly or whether i am now a butterfly dreaming i am a man End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Come, says the white logic, and forget those Asian dreamers of old time. Fill your glass, and let us look at the parchments of the dreamers of yesterday who dreamed their dreams on your own warm hills. I pour over the abstract of title of the vineyard called Toque on the rancho called Petaluma. It is a sad long list of the names of men beginning with Manuel Michel Torreno, one-time Mexican governor, commander-in-chief, 
and inspector of the Department of the Californias, who deeded ten square leagues of stolen Indian land to Colonel Don Mariano Guadalupe Valhejo for services rendered his country and for monies paid by him for ten years to his soldiers. Immediately this musty record of man's land lust assumes the formidableness of a battle, the quick struggling with the dust. There are deeds of trust, mortgages, certificates of release, transfers, judgments, foreclosures, writ of attachment, orders of sale, tax liens, petitions for letters of administration, and decrees of distribution. It is like a monster ever unsubdued, this stubborn land that drowses in this Indian summer weather and that survives them all, the men who scratched its surface and passed. Who was this James King of William, so curiously named? the oldest surviving settler in the Valley of the Moon knows him not. Yet only sixty years ago he loaned Mariano G. Vallejo eighteen thousand dollars on security of certain lands, including the vineyard yet to be and to be called Toque. Whence came Peter O'Connor, and whither vanished, after writing his little name of a day on the woodland that was to become a vineyard, appears Louis Somociane, a name to conjure with. He lasts through several pages of this record of the enduring soil. Comes old American stock, thirsting across the great american desert mule backing across the isthmus wind jamming around the horn to write brief and forgotten names where ten thousand generations of wild indians are equally forgotten names like halleck hastings sweat tate denman tracy grimwood carlton temple there are no names like those today in the valley of the moon the names begin to appear fast and furiously flashing from legal page to legal page and in a flash vanishing but ever the persistent soil remains for others to scrawl themselves across come the names of men of whom i have vaguely heard but whom i have never known kohler and froling who built the great stone winery on the vineyard called Tokay, but who built upon a hill up which other vineyardists refused to haul their grapes so kohler and froling lost the land the earthquake of nineteen hundred and six threw down the winery and i now live in its ruins la motte he broke the soil planted vines and orchards instituted commercial fish culture built a mansion renowned in its day was defeated by the soil and passed and my name of a day appears on the site of his orchards and vineyards of his proud mansion of his very fish ponds i have scrawled myself with half a hundred thousand eucalyptus trees cooper and greenlaw on what is called the hill ranch they left two of their dead little lily and little david who rest today inside a tiny square of hand-hewn palings also 
Cooper and Greenlaw, in their time, cleared the virgin forest from three fields of forty acres. Today I have those three fields sown with Canada peas, and in the spring they shall be ploughed under for green manure. Haska, a dim, legendary figure of a generation ago, who went back up the mountains and cleared six acres of brush in the tiny valley that took his name. He broke the soil, reared stone walls and a house, and planted apple trees. And already the site of the house is undiscoverable. The location of the stone walls may be deduced from the configuration of the landscape, and I am renewing the battle, putting in angora goats to browse away the brush that has overrun Haska's clearing and choked Haska's apple trees to death. So I, too, scratch the land with my brief endeavor and flash my name across a page of legal script ere i pass and the page grows musty dreamers and ghosts the white logic chuckles but surely the striving was not altogether vain i contend it was based on illusion and is a lie a vital lie i retort and pray what is a vital lie but a lie the white logic challenges come fill your glass and let us examine these vital liars who crowd your bookshelves let us dabble in william james a bit a man of health i say from him we may expect no philosopher's stone, but at least we will find a few robust tonic things to which to tie. Rationality gelded to sentiment, the white logic grins. At the end of all his thinking, he still clung to the sentiment of immortality. Facts transmuted in the alembic of hope into terms of faith the ripest fruit of reason the stultification of reason from the topmost peak of reason james teaches to cease reasoning and to have faith that all is well and will be well the old oh ancient old acrobatic flip of the metaphysicians whereby they reasoned reason quite away in order to escape the pessimism consequent upon the grim and honest exercise of reason is this flesh of yours you or is it an extraneous something possessed by you your body what is it a machine for converting stimuli into reactions stimuli and reactions are remembered they constitute experience then you are in your consciousness these experiences you are at any moment what you are thinking at that moment your eye is both subject and object it predicates things of itself and is the things predicated the thinker is the thought the knower is what is known the possessor is the things possessed after all as you know well man is a flux of states of consciousness a flow of passing thoughts each thought of self another self a myriad thoughts a myriad selves a continual becoming but never being a will-o'-the-wisp flitting of ghosts in ghostland but this man will not accept of himself he refuses to accept his own passing he will not pass 
he will live again if he has to die to do it he shuffles atoms and jets of light remotest nebulae drips of water prick points of sensation slime oozings and cosmic bulks all mixed with pearls of faith love of woman imagined dignities frightened surmises and pompous arrogances and of the stuff builds himself an immortality to startle the heavens and baffle the immensities he squirms on his dunghill and like a child lost in the dark among goblins calls to the gods that he is their younger brother a prisoner of the quick that is destined to be as free as they monuments of egotism reared by the epiphenomena dreams and the dust of dreams that vanish when the dreamer vanishes and are no more when he is not it is nothing new these vital lies men tell themselves muttering and mumbling them like charms and incantations against the powers of night the voodoos and medicine men and the devil devil doctors were the fathers of metaphysics night and the noseless one were ogres that beset the way of light and life and the metaphysicians would win by if they had to tell lies to do it they were vexed by the brazen law of the ecclesiast that men die like the beasts of the field and their end is the same their creeds were their schemes their religions their nostrums their philosophies their devices by which they half believed they would outwit the noseless one and the night bog lights vapors of mysticism psychic overtones soul orgies wailings among the shadows weird gnosticisms veils and tissues of words gibbering subjectivisms gropings and maunderings ontological fantasies pan-psychic hallucinations this is the stuff the phantasms of hope that fills your bookshelves look at them all the sad wraiths of sad mad men and passionate rebels your schopenhauers your strindbergs your tolstoys and nietzsches come your glass is empty fill and forget i obey for my brain is now well a-crawl with the maggots of alcohol and as i drink to the sad thinkers on my shelves i quote richard hovey abstain not life and love like night and day offer themselves to us on their own terms not ours accept their bounty while ye may before we be accepted by the worms i will cap you cries the white logic no i answer while the maggots madden me i know you for what you are and i am unafraid under your mask of hedonism you are yourself the noseless one and your way leads to the night hedonism has no meaning it too is a lie at best the coward's smug compromise now i will cap you the white logic breaks in but if you would not this poor life fulfil lo you are free to end it when you will without the fear of waking after death and i laugh my defiance 
for now and for the moment i know the white logic to be the arch impostor of them all whispering his whispers of death and he is guilty of his own unmasking with his own genial chemistry turning the tables on himself with his own maggots biting alive the old illusions resurrecting and making to sound again the old voice from beyond of my youth telling me again that still are mine the possibilities and powers which life and the books had taught me did not exist and the dinner gong sounds to the reversed bottom of my glass jeering at the white logic i go out to join my guests at table and with assumed seriousness to discuss the current magazines and the silly doings of the world's day, whipping every trick and ruse of controversy through all the paces of paradox and persiflage. And when the whim changes, it is most easy and delightfully disconcerting to play with the respectable and cowardly bourgeois fetishes and to laugh and epigram at the flitting god ghosts and the debaucheries and follies of wisdom. The clown's the thing, the clown. If one must be a philosopher, let him be Aristophanes. And no one at the table thinks I am jingle. I am in fine fettle, that is all. I tire of the labor of thinking, and when the table is finished, start practical jokes and set all playing at games which we carry on with bucolic boisterousness. And when the evening is over and good night said, I go back through my book-walled den to my sleeping porch and to myself and to the white logic which, undefeated, has never left me. And as I fall to fuddled sleep, I hear youth crying, as Harry Kemp heard it. I heard youth calling in the night, Gone is my former world delight, For there is not my feet may stay, The morn suffuses into day, It dare not stand a moment still, But must the world with light fulfill. More evanescent than the rose, My sudden rainbow comes and goes, Plunging bright ends across the sky, Yea, I am youth, because I die. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 The foregoing is a sample roaming with the white logic through the dusk of my soul. To the best of my power, I have striven to give the reader a glimpse of a man's secret dwelling when it is shared with John Barleycorn. And the reader must remember that this mood, which he has read in a quarter of an hour, is but one mood of the myriad moods of John Barleycorn, and that the procession of such moods may well last the clock around through many a day and week and month. My alcoholic reminiscences draw to a close. I can say, as any strong, chesty drinker can say, that all that leaves me alive today on the planet is my unmerited luck, the luck of chest and shoulders and constitution. I dare to say that a not large percentage of use in the formative stage of fifteen to seventeen, could have survived the stress of heavy drinking that I survived between my fifteenth and seventeenth years. That a not large percentage of men 
could have punished the alcohol I have punished in my manhood years and lived to tell the tale. I survived through no personal virtue but because I did not have the chemistry of a dipsomaniac and because I possessed an organism unusually resistant to the ravages of John Barleycorn. And, surviving, I have watched the others die, not so lucky, down all the long sad road. It was my unmitigated and absolute good fortune, good luck, chance, call it what you will, that brought me through the fires of John Barleycorn. My life, my career, my joy in living have not been destroyed. They have been scorched, it is true, like the survivors of forlorn hopes. They have, by unthinkably miraculous ways, come through the fight to marvel at the tally of the slain. And like such a survivor of old red war who cries out, Let there be no more war, so I cry out, Let there be no more poison fighting by our youths. The way to stop war is to stop it. The way to stop drinking is to stop it. The way China stopped the general use of opium was by stopping the cultivation and importation of opium. The philosophers, priests, and doctors of China could have preached themselves breathless against opium for a thousand years, and the use of opium, so long as opium was ever accessible and obtainable, would have continued unabated. We are so made, that is all. We have, with great success, made a practice of not leaving arsenic and strychnine and typhoid and tuberculosis germs lying around for our children to be destroyed by. Treat John Barleycorn the same way. Stop him. Don't let him lie around, licensed and legal, to pounce upon our youth. Not of alcoholics, nor for alcoholics, do I write, but for our youths, for those who possess no more than the adventure stings and the genial predispositions, the social man impulses, which are twisted all awry by our barbarian civilization which feeds them poison on all the corners. It is the healthy, normal boys, now born or being born, for whom I write. It was for this reason, more than any other, and more ardently than any other, that I rode down into the valley of the moon, all a jingle, and voted for equal suffrage. I voted that women might vote, because I knew that they, the wives and mothers of the race, would vote John Barleycorn out of existence and back into the historical limbo of our vanished customs of savagery. If I thus seem to cry out as one hurt, please remember that I have been sorely bruised and that I do dislike the thought that any son or daughter of mine or yours should be similarly bruised. The women are the true conservators of the race. The men are the wastrels, the adventure lovers and gamblers, and in the end it is by their women that they are saved. About man's first experiment in chemistry was the making of alcohol, 
and down all the generations to this day man has continued to manufacture and drink it and there has never been a day when the women have not resented man's use of alcohol though they have never had the power to give weight to their resentment the moment women get the vote in any community the first thing they proceed to do is to close the saloons in a thousand generations to come men of themselves will not close the saloons as well expect the morphine victims to legislate the sale of morphine out of existence the women know they have paid an incalculable price of sweat and tears for man's use of alcohol ever jealous for the race they will legislate for the babes of boys yet to be born and for the babes of girls too for they must be the mothers wives and sisters of these boys and it will be easy the only ones that will be hurt will be the topers and seasoned drinkers of a single generation i am one of these and i make solemn assurance based upon long traffic with john barleycorn that it won't hurt me very much to stop drinking when no one else drinks and when no drink is obtainable on the other hand the overwhelming proportion of young men are so normally non-alcoholic that never having had access to alcohol they will never miss it they will know of the saloon only in the pages of history and they will think of the saloon as a quaint old custom similar to bull-baiting and the burning of witches chapter thirty nine of course no personal tale is complete without bringing the narrative of the person down to the last moment but mine is no tale of a reformed drunkard i was never a drunkard and i have not reformed it chanced some time ago that I made a voyage of 148 days in a windjammer around the horn. I took no private supply of alcohol along, and though there was no day of those 148 days that I could not have got a drink from the captain, I did not take a drink. I did not take a drink because I did not desire a drink. No one else drank on board the atmosphere for drinking was not present and in my system there was no organic need for alcohol my chemistry did not demand alcohol so there arose before me a problem a clear and simple problem this is so easy why not keep it up when you get back on land i weighed this problem carefully I waited for five months in a state of absolute non-contact with alcohol. And out of the data of past experience, I reached certain conclusions. In the first place, I am convinced that not one man in 10,000 or in a 100,000 is a genuine chemical dipsomaniac. Drinking, as I deem it, is practically entirely a habit of mind. It is unlike tobacco or cocaine or morphine or all the rest of the long list of drugs. The desire for alcohol is quite peculiarly mental in its origin. It is a matter of mental training and growth and it is cultivated in social soil not one drinker in a million began drinking alone 
all drinkers began socially, and this drinking is accompanied by a thousand social connotations, such as I have described out of my own experience in the first part of this narrative. These social connotations are the stuff of which the drink habit is largely composed. The part that alcohol itself plays is inconsiderable when compared with the part played by the social atmosphere in which it is drunk. The human is rarely born these days who, without long training in the social associations of drinking, feels the irresistible chemical propulsion of his system toward alcohol. I do assume that such rare individuals are born, but I have never encountered one. On this long five months voyage, I found that among all my bodily needs, not the slightest shred of a bodily need for alcohol existed. But this I did find. My need was mental and social. When I thought of alcohol, the connotation was fellowship. When I thought of fellowship, the connotation was alcohol. Fellowship and alcohol were Siamese twins. They always occurred linked together. Thus, when reading in my deck chair or when talking with others, practically any mention of any part of the world I knew instantly aroused the connotation of drinking and good fellows. Big nights and days and moments, all purple passages and freedoms thronged my memory. Venice stares at me from the printed page, and I remember the cafe tables on the sidewalks. The Battle of Santiago, someone says, and I answer, Yes, I've been over the ground. But I do not see the ground, nor Kettle Hill, nor the Peace Tree. What I see is the Café Venus, on the Plaza of Santiago, where one hot night I drank and talked with a dying consumptive. The East End of London, I read, or someone says. And first of all, under my eyelids, leap the visions of the shining pubs. And in my ears, echo the calls for two of bitter and three of scotch. The Latin Quarter, at once I am in the student cabarets, bright faces and keen spirits around me, sipping cool, well-dripped absinthe, while our voices mount and soar in Latin fashion as we settle God and art and democracy and the rest of the simple problems of existence. In a pampero off the river plot we speculate, if we are disabled, of running into Buenos Aires, the Paris of America, and I have visions of bright congregating places of men, of the jollity of raised glasses, and of song and cheer and the hum of genial voices. When we have picked up the northeast trades in the Pacific, we try to persuade our dying captain to run for Honolulu, and while I persuade, I see myself again drinking cocktails on the cool lane and fizzes out at Waikiki where the surf rolls in. Someone mentions the way wild ducks are cooked in the restaurants of San Francisco, and at once I am transported to the light and clatter of many tables, where I gaze at old friends across the golden brims of long-stemmed Rhine wine glasses. And so I pondered my problem. I should not care to revisit 
all those fair places of the world except in the fashion I visited them before, glass in hand. There is a magic in the phrase. It means more than all the words in the dictionary can be made to mean. It is a habit of mind to which I have been trained all my life. It is now part of the stuff that composes me. I like the bubbling play of wit, the chesty laughs, the resonant voices of men when, glass in hand, they shut the gray world outside and prod their brains with the fun and folly of an accelerated pulse. No, I decided, I shall take my drink on occasion. With all the books on my shelves, with all the thoughts of the thinkers shaded by my particular temperament, I decided coolly and deliberately that I should continue to do what I had been trained to want to do. I would drink but, oh, more skillfully, more discreetly than ever before. Never again would I be a peripatetic conflagration. Never again would I invoke the white logic. I had learned how not to invoke him. The white logic now lies decently buried alongside the long sickness neither will afflict me again. It is many a year since I laid the long sickness away. His sleep is sound. And just as sound is the sleep of the white logic. And yet, in conclusion, I can well say that I wish my forefathers had banished John Barleycorn before my time. I regret that John Barleycorn flourished everywhere in the system of society in which I was born, else I should not have made his acquaintance, and I was long trained in his acquaintance. End of chapter 39 Recorded by Peter Kelleher Eastport Medway, Nova Scotia. End of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London.